Good morning to all. We are about to start. Just a couple of minutes to allow to all people that are online to connect and then we start. Thank you for your patience. Good morning to all and welcome to the second day of our workshop uh, on uh, alternative fuels and uh, energy solutions for shipping. Uh, yesterday we had a full day focused on uh, hydrogen, uh, starting from uh, our study and moving with a lot of uh, sharing experience uh, uh, presentations. It was a quite uh, dense day full of information, but at the same time uh, uh, we were expecting that. We knew it was going to be like this. Today we have uh, a different focus. We are going to focus on uh, wind-assisted propulsion. So, again, uh, the study was uh, just uh, published the day before of the workshop, so probably not many of you had the possibility already to, to, to download and dig into it. Uh, but the purpose of this workshop is, is exactly also to, to raise awareness, as I said uh, yesterday, so that then all of you are uh, better placed uh, to, 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 to assess uh, where the different uh, technologies uh, stand. Uh, this will be the, the morning session. Then in the afternoon, we will uh, look uh, to uh, alternative fuels and power solutions uh, with a bit of a different uh, focus. Um, we will have uh, the guidance that we just uh, published uh, on uh, um, safe storage of batteries. Uh, and uh, again, yesterday it was clear that electrification uh, is going to accompany the green transition that shipping is facing and uh, cannot be delayed. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, you will get uh, a bit of an update on the next generation of EMSA studies <clears throat> that are still focusing uh, on uh, alternative fuels, but in a bit of a different uh, perspective, uh, more uh, operational perspective, so uh, how we can ensure a safe use of these uh, fuels and above all also focus on uh, bunkering for biofuels. So again a full day, so uh, be with us and uh, continue to participate uh, as actively as you did uh, yesterday because the purpose of this uh, workshop is exactly to, 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 to brainstorm, to clarify questions if we are in a position to do so and for us is to offer you a platform where, of course, you can uh, interact and, uh, and share. 
So, without further ado, we will uh, kick off uh, our discussions uh, on the uh, wind assisted uh, propulsion. And uh, as usual, we have uh, a first presentation where we will give you a bit of a, an overview of the different uh, systems uh, that to date are there. Here we have a bit of a variety of, of technologies and therefore we have also a variety of possible uses. Uh, all of us are aware uh, that um, there is not one solution for all. So the more we know about the options are available, the more there will be successful stories as the one that, for instance, Norled presented yesterday uh, in the workshop. So, without further ado, I give the floor to uh, Carlos, uh, who is um, a senior project officer in the sustainability unit at EMSA, who will provide uh, just to a bit do a kind of uh, set the scene, an introduction on the different systems that then were analyzed in the study. Carlos, the floor is yours. Thank you, Manuela. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, for those that are in-house and also for those that are following us uh, remotely. Um, this uh, first presentation aims to provide a general, very brief overview of the wind-assisted propulsion technologies, which will be further um, discussed during, uh, during the day. So, what are wind-assisted propulsion systems? Uh, we are talking about systems that are designed to transform wind energy into uh, ship propulsion power, additional thrust to, to put ships moving. Uh, of course, depending on uh, their specific type of technologies, and we have different technologies, difficult physical properties will, uh, will be used in order to um, make sure that there is this energy conversion from, uh, from wind to ship propulsion power. Um, these technologies, some of them are quite, uh, quite distinct in their, in their approach, <clears throat> not only in relation to, 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 to design, but also in relation to its use, so operational performance based. And of course, this clearly uh, implicates uh, a full assessment in terms of the design, installation and uh, onboard use. Uh, currently, we have um, main um, five to six uh, main categories that can be can be distinguished. We have uh, the rotor sails, uh, traditionally um, known also or commonly known as uh, flattener rotors. Um, we have the hard sails, suction wings, kites, soft sails. And uh, more recently, um, in relation to, um, to new technologies, emerging technologies that sooner or later could also um, appear uh, as part of this, uh, of this basket of, of, uh, of, of systems, are uh, those that could be related to the, the whole technology, so the, the whole uh, shape uh, of the ships. and. Uh, and the wind turbine uh, generation uh, for electricity. Um, the main focus of the study that uh, is going to be presented to you today um, was decided, of course, after a, a very thorough literature overview. So not only um, published uh, scientific articles, um, in both uh, European and uh, international fora, uh, particularly at the IMO. At the IMO internationally, these technologies have also been uh, being presented uh, for quite some time. Um, most, of the, most of the more technical um, inputs and, uh, and uh, also inputs related to the cost uh, to the costs, not only to the to the to the operational costs, but also to the to the installations costs, 
came also from the from the Wind International Wind Association, uh, which of course is uh, one of the main contributors for this uh, for this information to be to be publicly available, and and of course uh, internet internet uh, um, search uh, a long one. And um, of course, also some uh, some um, feedback from uh, from uh, from articles that we that from from the last decade have been uh, been published um, internationally. So um, just for you, some of you, of course, are aware uh, of these technologies. Uh, we have um, the rotor sails, the flatter rotors, as I was uh, um, mentioning, which are spinning rotors driven by small electrical engines that are vertically mounted on the deck of the ship. And of course, the active rotation together with the wind creates a pressure difference uh, in the cylinder, uh, orthogonal to the wind direction, which provides uh, an additional thrust to the to the ship, uh, we have as well uh, the hard sails. Um, it's they are functioning like uh, traditional soft sails, but of course then we have the aerodynamic uh, into the into the hydrodynamic uh, equation uh, from the wind, uh, from the wind uh, um, and the, and the, and the pressure between the. Um, the aerodynamic uh, aerodynamic uh, lifts. Uh, we have also this uh, this additional additional thrust. We have then the the suction wings, which are also wing shaped vertical structures that are, of course, most of these technologies are mounted directly on the on the on the main deck, which, uh, contrary to the rotor sails, uh, they do not rotate. Uh, but they generate thrust, uh, although the wings are also orientable in order to make use of the, of the best available strength and direction uh, from wherever the ship is sailing uh, at geographically. We have one of the first ideas that came and I, I still remember the, this solution being um, being um, promoted like more than a decade ago. The kites, uh, which uh, are attached or to the bow of uh, to the bow structure of the ship, to generate an additional lift um, and uh, and um, and trust, respectively. Finally, uh, we have the soft sails. On the on the on the right down corner uh, of the of the of the pictures, uh, which are flexible sails, very similar to the traditional sails, but they are modern soft sails, wing shaped to maximize the force of the thrust, always with the aim to provide additional additional power and additional thrust to the to the ship movements. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, the two uh, from from the the available uh, information that uh, were 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 possible together, uh, two emerging technologies um, are those that uh, that uh, that are in the in the in the last two bullet points. The hull of a vessel that can be shaped like a symmetrical aerofoil which can therefore generate lift and pull the ship into the, the forward direction. This technology, uh, according to the, to, the, to the literature, can be applied only to new built ships, of course, uh, retrofitting some of these technologies on the, on the existing fleet uh, uh, will, be, um, will be challenging can always be made, but it will be challenging, not only in relation to, to the costs, but also in relation to the, to the period for the, for the layoff that will be necessary to, to fit some of these technologies on board the ship without, uh, without uh, uh, going through the, without, without having the, the commercial operations 
So it will be a, a certain moment that uh, will be needed for these ships to stop their commercial activity, put it on dry dock, and, and, uh, and start the whole preparations for the installations of, this, of these systems. But in, in relation to the whole technologies, it might, this might be uh, very, very challenging, particularly for, new, for, uh, for existing ships. So this should be only considered for the, for the new builds. Um, in relation to the um, wind turbines, very similar to the ones that we, we, we are familiar with on the, on the land-based um, production for electricity, um, this might be considered for uh, additional production of electricity, then can be stored, distributed, and used on board the ships, mainly for auxiliary power, but of course, depending on the power demand that uh, a certain ship type of a certain ship size would need, this of course could be used uh, as, as deem appropriate on, uh, on, uh, on board. So, um, in relation to the, the implementation into the, um, to the uptake of these technologies, the information that you see uh, on the screen tends to be the best available that we have at the moment. So this uh, came from, um, from, the, from the International Wind Assisted Propulsion Systems Association. And, uh, and of course, they are the most suitable institution to, to, to let us know. And again, thanks for the input that they have been given so far, not only for this study, but also uh, at the European Sustainable Shipping Forum where the Wind Assisted uh, um, Propulsion Association participates quite uh, actively on both the subgroup for uh, alternative power, alternative sources of power, but also on the energy efficiency. Uh, so as we see, starting from 2010 uh, to 2023, where we are today, and of course, according to the order books, that uh, we are familiar with, or was brought to our, um, to, our, um, to our attention, we have a gradual increase on the uptake of, this, uh, of these technologies. Again, one of the good, one of the good uh, insights that we are, uh, we are, um, we are seeing uh, from this graphic is that there will be, of course, challenges always associated with the installation of these systems on existing ships. But as we see, and as you can see, the dark blue provides um, a very, um, a very um, positive uptake of these technologies also on the existing fleet, which uh, is uh, quite, uh, quite relevant uh, for the for the entire fleet uh, greenhouse gas reduction and and uh, uh, enhancement in in energy efficiency and uh, in relation to the to the dark red we have the new builds which of course are following the a very similar gradual increase uptake um, which is um, very positive when we look at the absolute when we look at the absolute numbers. Um, we started in 2010 with uh, one or two pilot projects, and uh, in the last decade, these have been involved to more than 40 installations uh, of these systems on board ships, which are currently being tested. Some of these systems have been, uh, and you can you can have the opportunity to 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 confirm it in the in the overview uh, that the study provides some of these technologies have been uh, financed uh, by the European European Union projects uh, which uh, provides of course a very good incentive for shipping companies to 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 test and to to experiment these uh, these technologies um, in relation to the as I said in relation to the if we start splitting, um, the number of, uh, of these installations uh, and the planned installations per systems and technologies, you will find 
that um, currently we have almost 50%, 40, 40, uh, 45% of the whole installations are hotter sales. We have uh, two concurring technologies which are basically um, being installed with the, with, the, with the exact same numbers, uh, suction winds and the hard sails. And then we have the kite, which still um, are being uh, are being one of the one of the one of the technologies being uh, being being placed uh, and tested on board the ships. We have six, and we have one soft sail. This is the overview that we have uh, um, until now. And when you look at the two columns, vertical columns in the in the graphic. There's um, there's a twenty percent uh, there's a twenty percent uh, increase uh, in the installations um, between two thousand and twenty three and two thousand and twenty six between forty two to fifty two so which is uh, something that hopefully it will it will continue to gradually increase. Uh, that's it for the for the time being. Uh, hope I didn't uh, I didn't mention anything that is not correct incorrect, uh, and uh, I leave it up to the to the experts now uh, and for the audience to 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 further discuss these uh, these technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos, for this um, overview where the different systems uh, were, were presented and uh, a bit also figures uh, on, on the uptake of these technologies, of course, uh, with, with different degrees, uh, depending uh, also on uh, existing new ships and so on. Um, this was just an introduction to kick off uh, uh, the focus on uh, the study that was just published. And uh, I will therefore now give the floor uh, to our contractor uh, that is uh, uh, starting uh, to provide, as I said yesterday, the structure of the studies uh, is very similar. So the first uh, presentation will be on sustainability, susta uh, suitability, regulatory gaps, and uh, certification. And we have Daphne with us to provide this first overview of the outcome of the study. Daphne, please, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, I am Daphne Sofiadi. I'm a principal engineer at the American Bureau of Shipping, and I had the honor to coordinate this study on uh, wind-assisted propulsion. Um, I will present you the main findings related to the sustainability, suitability, and regulations. Uh, but before I start, I would like to thank uh, the team that actually carried out this, uh, th this part of the study. It was uh, Dagmar Nellison and Dan Van Setters from CEDEL, uh, Rui Zhu from ABS, uh, and uh, we also got some very valuable feedback from Edwin Punk from Arxilia. Um, so, uh, the wind, uh, of course, as you all know, uh, is an ample source of energy, is renewable, is sustainable, and it's uh, free of charge. Uh, so wind-assisted propulsion systems can actually exploit uh, this wind energy, convert it to thrust, and supplement the main engine power. Uh, ultimately, and under favorable uh, wind conditions, this can result in less fuel consumption, lesser emissions, and uh, uh, in most cases, less under-radiated noise since uh, less load is uh, on the engine. Um, regarding the savings, uh, it would be great if we could uh, just attribute a specific amount of savings to a specific technology, uh, but uh, this issue is a bit more complex uh, than that. Um, this is because there are numerous factors that are affecting the WAPS performance. Um, uh, so we have tried in this study to split those into WAPS-related, SIP-related SIP factors and environmental factors. And uh, during this process, we also realized that uh, these factors are also rather interrelated to each other. So starting with the type of technology itself, uh, of course, different WAPS uh, technologies have different potential under different conditions. And uh, generally speaking, by increasing the number of units and their size, uh, more wind energy can be uh, exploited. 
Um, however, in some cases, if the units end up to be too close to each other, maybe, uh, for example, uh, for rotor sales, uh, some aerodynamic interference among them may reduce their effectiveness. Uh, the number and size of units that can be installed uh, depends uh, on some extent to the zip type and size. And of course, the environmental factors are uh, crucial. Uh, so the environmental uh, effect is captured in, uh, in diagrams like the one you, saw, you see here. This is a polar diagram. Um, so I will try to explain what we see here. It's the propulsion power savings. This is an example for a tanker. Uh, which has two rotors installed and is, it's sailing at a constant speed of uh, 12 knots. Uh, so uh, clockwise we have the, the wind direction. So at the top we have the headwinds, the bottom we have tailwinds and on the sides we have beam winds. And the different colors uh, show the propulsion savings for different wind speeds. So uh, the blue uh, line uh, is showing the, the propulsion power savings for six meters per second wind speed. Uh, and the red shows uh, the same for 10 meters per second. So you can see that um, uh, for beam winds, the savings are uh, maximized. So it can reach, uh, in this case, 25% for 10 meters per second wind speed while for headwinds and tailwinds, the savings are uh, almost uh, zero. Uh, what I want to say that with this is that uh, the savings are very sensitive to the environmental conditions. So uh, this means that the crew training is very important. Uh, the automation of the system is also very important and the route optimization uh, is considered crucial. And by route optimization, of course, I mean uh, change uh, the, the initial uh, route of the vessel in order to meet more favorable conditions. And of course, a balance should be found and the voyage should not be elongated too much in order to avoid adverse uh, effects. Um, regarding uh, the savings, these are calculated uh, either on numeric, based on numerical simulations uh, or they can be uh, measured through sea trials or uh, by analysis of the of voyage data, or a combination of those. Um, I have not uh, included in my presentation the savings we have found, but uh, we have looked into the literature, so based on research and uh, many announcements we found, uh, we have included uh, savings for the several uh, technologies that are available. Um, but what we have observed is that, there, is that there is a big variation in the savings reported. Uh, and we believe this is, of course, because of the factors that are determining the WAP's performance, as already mentioned, uh, but also uh, because the assumptions uh, on which the savings are, based on which the savings are presented, are uh, of major importance. So it's very different to present the savings uh, based on the most favorable condition, and it's different to present the savings based uh, on the entire voyage. So representing the average savings uh, during the, the whole voyage. Um, also, by evalu evaluating the savings, it's important to understand whether the, the consumption of the system itself is uh, captured, so if the net savings are presented, because some systems do consume energy in order to generate thrust. Uh, and of course, whether the savings are presented um, based uh, or on a relative basis or absolute basis, or if they are on uh, savings on the power, on the fuel consumption, on the emissions, on the thrust. Uh, so some attention is uh, needed. Uh, despite the variations, uh, we do see that um, under favorable conditions, there can be significant savings uh, from the wind assist propulsion systems. Uh, and uh, in order uh, for investment decisions to be made, uh, we suggest that the SIP specific assessments should be done, taking into account SIPs and WAPs uh, specific characteristics, uh, hydrodynamic and aerodynamic, and also the intended trade routes and the expected weather conditions. Um, going into the suitability now, um, of course, there is no single solution that fits all the vessels. Um, however, there is a variety of solutions available, so there are choices uh, for almost uh, every ship uh, type, I would say. Uh, a detrimental factor uh, is, of course, the deck space. Um, 
which is to some extent dependent on the ship type. Uh, for example, on tankers and bulk carriers, um, it is expected that uh, there is enough space available on the deck. And this might be the reason why we have um, uh, already seen some installations on these uh, vessels. On the other hand, on traditional container ship designs, um, we consider that uh, less space might be available, so maybe the kite solution could be more um, uh, suitable. Uh, however, there are also containerized solutions, and uh, also recently we have seen some uh, new container ship designs that uh, take into account uh, uh, sales from the early design stage, so this is also uh, possible. Uh, also, the bigger uh, the vessel, more deck space uh, is expected to be available. <clears throat> and also, uh, big vessels are typically trading in open seas where more favorable conditions can be found. Uh, the weight increase uh, due to the installation of the wind assist propulsion systems uh, is not considered very significant in terms of cargo loss because the additional weight is uh, relatively small. However, uh, due to the weight increase, uh, there could be some st stability uh, issues or uh, also some reinforcement of ship structure uh, should be uh, done uh, because there are forces uh, generated uh, uh, due to the wind. Um, the visibility is also very important, of course. Uh, so uh, the placement should be considered carefully, especially for, uh, for cargo ships where the bridge is at the aft. Um, so we have seen uh, installations on the one side of the vessel or in the center line in a series, so only one direction uh, is uh, blinded. Um, and I will go through uh, the regula regulations uh, later about this. Um, the potential interference with cargo handling equipment and land infrastructure should be taken into account, and uh, there are also foldable or buildable solutions for, uh, for this, so providing some flexibility. And finally, the deployment of the vessel is, uh, is important. Uh, so, for example, liner vessels selecting the right WAPs and maximizing the potential benefit uh, would be easier for them. Uh, moving to Ajax, uh, most of the major classification societies have already published rules and guidelines related to, to the wind-assisted propulsion uh, systems. Um, <laughs> So they have recognized the need, um, and they are covering materials mainly related to, to they are covering topics mainly related to materials, fire safety, structural loads, and electrical systems, uh, etc. So uh, we believe IX is moving to, towards the right direction. Um, of course, IMO updates should be followed. Um, any technological developments and also experience gathered from uh, previous installations. Uh, we then looked into safety and air pollution uh, regulations. Um, so we have tried to identify some gaps, and I will go through the main ones. Uh, starting from maneuverability, uh, the existing standard on maneuverability uh, is considering calm weather conditions. However, for vessels with wind-assisted propulsion, uh, the wind uh, and the waves, of course, are expected to have a significant impact on the maneuverability performance of the vessels. Also, the port and starboard performance may be different. Uh, so this means that uh, uh, there should be specified conditions, uh, preferably representing the typical operation conditions of the vessel, uh, under which the assessment uh, needs to be done. Uh, however, if, even if we pre-specify the wind conditions for this assessment, uh, there are some practical issues because these tests are typically done uh, in, uh, in sea trials, so uh, it's difficult to find and maintain the wind conditions. Uh, so uh, delays could be expected and other administrative issues. So uh, we believe that other alternative verification methods should be considered. Uh, for example, models calibrated by some sea trial results uh, could be uh, an option. Um, of course, for systems that cannot be switched off or folded during adverse conditions, um, such conditions may need to be assessed for uh, safety considerations. 
regarding uh, ship stability, um, of course, uh, the additional weight, including uh, ice accretion, that it's possible, um, may cause some uh, changes in the vertical center of gravity. So uh, this means that uh, some loading conditions may need to be uh, adjusted. Uh, the lateral uh, area that is added on the on the vessel due to the, the uh, wind assist propulsion systems uh, is also an issue and can possibly create some uh, stability uh, issues. This can be uh, tackled by less uh, WAPS area uh, on board, which of course uh, leads to less uh, potential savings or with uh, design, designing suboptimal hulls, uh, which again will lead to uh, more uh, fuel consumption of the vessel. Uh, so again, uh, here alternative methods uh, can be found, such as model tests, uh, instead of uh, directly calculating the wind healing moment uh, as prescribed by the regulations. And this is a practice which uh, uh, is already followed for some uh, segments, such as cruise ships, which uh, have uh, large wind uh, areas. And this is because the, the formula and the regulation is considered to be quite uh, conservative. Uh, the intact stability um, assumes that the ship is upright, meaning a zero healing angle. Uh, a vessel with uh, wind-assisted propulsion may be expected to sail with some uh, healing angle, and this may have an impact on the writing level criteria. And also, uh, only static effects are captured, so dynamic effects um, uh, are not considered, and which can be uh, uh, created, for example, by the rotors uh, which are spinning, uh, and can create some additional healing moments. Uh, also, looking into the damage stability, uh, the WAPs may cause an adverse healing moment for passenger ships. For example, there is a factor already used in the calculation to evaluate the effect of uh, healing moments on damage survivability. Therefore, it may be uh, straightforward to add the additional effect of uh, the WAPs in the calculation. However, this is not the case for cargo ships uh, for which uh, the wind moments are not assessed at all uh, based on the current uh, uh, formula and the regulation. So this may be a prerequisite for cargo vessels. Uh, finally, the heel angle may increase uh, the time for equalization of uh, passive cross flooding devices. And overall, we believe that uh, studies need to be done to investigate um, if the effect of the WAPs uh, and all the particularities that are induced are captured by the existing regulatory framework. And also a consistent approach by flag administration would help the uh, adoption. Uh, the large areas of the WAPs, uh, uh, of course, create some obstructions to the navigation lights, to the radar, to the visibility. Uh, the straightforward solution would be to reduce uh, this uh, WAPS area, but of course, uh, this will lead to less savings again. So uh, we try to see what the regulations are currently uh, uh, saying. So for the lights, for example, uh, there is an alternative uh, solution to include an additional all-round all light. Uh, for the visibility, for unconventional des designs, uh, they are allowed to achieve a level of bridge visibility that is as near as practical to that prescribed by the regulation. And for the radar, depending on the interpretation, there might be some uh, room for exceptions and equivalents. <coughs> Overall, there are no specific guidelines for the inclusion of uh, the wind assist propulsion systems and interpretation uh, by the flag administration is to be done on a case by case, which may create some uncertainty, uh, uncertainties and maybe a uh, barrier to the adoption. And also we noticed that the alternative design arrangement is not clear under SOLAS chapter five. So this may be a prerequisite prior to developing specific uh, guidelines. Um, going to the IMO and air pollution, uh, IMO, of course, adopted the revised GAG strategy in MPC 8 in July. Um, I will not go through the levels of, ambitions, uh, of ambition, but um, I, will, I want to highlight some words that we see uh, that are very much related to the wind assist propulsion technologies. So energy efficiency, reduction of CO2 emissions, carbon intensity, near, near zero GAG emission technologies uh, or energy sources. So uh, you can see that uh, uh, WAPs 
can be very much related to, to these terms. Um, IMO has implemented already some measures, uh, namely the EDI, EXI, and CII. Uh, I will start with the CII, which is the newest uh, measure. Um, it's a carbon intensity indicator, and uh, the inclusion of WAPs is considered to be rather straightforward. Um, so, based on the reported fuel consumption and distance sailed, um, while for the EDI, the Energy Efficiency Design Index for new buildings, and the EXI, which is the same index for new building vessels, uh, the inclusion is a bit more uh, complicated. Um, despite the fact that IMO has published uh, guidelines for the inclusion of the energy efficiency technologies, and particularly um, mentioning the wind assist propulsion and having specific guidelines for this, uh, we see uh, some issues. Uh, first of all, uh, the WAPS, if the WAPS is, in, is installed, it will have a positive effect on the EDI independent of whether it is used or not. Uh, second, the global uh, wind probability matrix is used, uh, which is not representative of, um, of the vessel's intended routes. So the specific uh, trade areas of the vessel are disregarded, and this can be important because uh, this route, uh, these vessels are expected to sail in more favorable routes in terms of wind. And uh, the VREF, the, um, the speed that goes into the EDI calculation, uh, is supposed to be under calm sea conditions, while, of course, the savings from the wind assist propulsion systems are realized under windy conditions. Uh, also, the wind uh, create uh, waves. Uh, this means additional wave resistance, uh, which is not taken into account at all uh, in these guidelines. Uh, lastly, uh, the verification in the trial is not uh, required, and this has been the main concept in the EDI framework. Uh, and a reason for that is that there is no agreed standard or methodology for full-scale uh, verification. Uh, but industry is making efforts to improve uh, the whole uh, methodology. Um, so the easiest way to comply with the EDI requirement is the reduction of the installed main engine power. Uh, SIPs with uh, WAPs could uh, potentially supplement the main engine power and, and reduce the installed um, uh, main engine power on board and reduce uh, the capex and have a positive impact, a further positive impact on the EDI. However, there are safety considerations and the minimum propulsion power guidelines issued by, the, by IMO, which uh, give a minimum uh, installed power that uh, should be on the vessel. Um, also, the increase in SIPS windage area uh, due to the technology on the deck may increase the need for installed power based on this assessment, and uh, this would also have a negative impact on the EDI. Uh, the minimum propulsion power assessment is applicable to tankers, bulkers, uh, and combination carriers. However, it's not applicable to SIPS with non-conventional propulsion systems, and this leads uh, to the next uh, slide. Uh, so the question is, what is considered non-conventional propulsion? Um, the, if the vessels with WAPs uh, can be considered as having non-conventional propulsion, then they could potentially be excluded from EDI, EXI, and minimum propulsion power regulations, as per Regulation 19 of uh, Annex 6 of MARPOL. Um, so, the definition under MARPOL currently is that non-conventional propulsion systems include uh, the hybrid propulsion systems. So, the question is, what is considered a hybrid propulsion system? And uh, if the vessels with WAPs can be considered to, to comply with this term, and under which uh, criteria and conditions. And this is my last slide. This is about the EU framework. Uh, we have the emission trading scheme, and similarly to CII, uh, the inclusion of WAPs is rather straightforward. So less fuel means uh, less uh, EU allowances and practically less cost for the operators and the owners. Um, and the fuel EU maritime uh, includes some reward factors uh, for substitute sources of energy. Uh, we have the um, F-wind uh, factor for the wind propulsion, uh, which ra is ranging from 0 0.95 to 0 0.99, depending on the installed effect effective power and the total propulsion power of the vessel. 
Uh, however, uh, this, uh, in, this factor is calculated based on the EDI principles, so same considerations uh, apply here as well. Um, and this F wind is calculated by the JG intensity of the, in, of, uh, of the vessel, uh, so having an effect on the compliance balance. And of course, uh, since the WAPS is expected to have some positive effect on the fuel consumption of the vessel, this is another uh, positive uh, contribution to the fuel EU uh, uh, calculation. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daphne, for uh, this uh, comprehensive overview where it comes out, of course, that there is uh, a lot of variety and, uh, of course, also the, uh, the, the assessment uh, depends a lot uh, on, on a lot of factors uh, and conditions. In the meantime, the chat has been quite active in parallel. Uh, uh, so I think it would make sense that also the audience that is uh, here and is not online uh, is uh, made aware. Uh, there was uh, discussions about, of course, uh, the speed um, and uh, there is a specific question uh, on safety. From the safety standpoint, is vortex shedding an issue that had to be checked to avoid the resonance? This is for cylindrical structures primarily. As usual, we have very specific questions which means that we have uh, the right audience for this, uh, this workshop that are really uh, very familiar with what's going on uh, with uh, this technology. Who would like to take the question, Carlos or Daphne? Or uh, who would like to take this question? Daphne, you? Uh, so we have not considered this in our uh, study. Uh, of course, it's a very interesting question. Uh, I don't know if uh, Edwin Pank from Marxilia can... Uh, I, can uh, I can help, no problem. Input. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, yes. loud and clear. Good, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, yes, so one of the recommendations in a lot of the hazard analysis was to carry out some vibration studies because there is the risk both Actually, it's not just limited to rotors, but as you th if you think about a mast uh, with sail on, there was also a kind of whipping effect that, uh, or any some kind of vibration or resonance that could, resonance that could take place. So, um, it is a recommendation to do some vibration studies as mitigation against this sort of thing. Uh, we understand that actually for the rotor sail, um, some uh, some vibration study work is done um, to avoid that. And of course, depending on where you attach the the rotor sail. Um, some it's on the kind of the weather deck, which is sort of reasonably well strengthened, but on some passenger vessels, it's it's up on the superstructure. So there is some, um, there needs to be some special consideration of how it how it's all at, uh, attached and what the effect of uh, it will be on the surrounding structure and on crew and passenger comfort. Thank you very much. Carlos, you want to... Thanks, Manuel. Uh, I, I think that... For those that uh, that haven't fully understood um, the issue, whenever we have whenever we have an amic flow around the hollow structure around the cylinder, there's the the creation of vortexes, and the the frequency of the the um, the production of these vortices could, in a certain situation, be equal to the natural frequency of the structure itself. When these are equal, we have what we call the resonance parameter, which will, of course, bring additional sources, uh, additional forces to the to the whole structural um, um, assessment uh, in the in the um, uh, on board the ship. So it's a, it's a it's a very very interesting question. Uh, we have we have these vortex shedding um, situations also um, below the waterline when we have hull appendages uh, fitted on, uh, on, the, on the bottom of the, of, of the ship. And then, of course, uh, a specific, uh, a specific uh, uh, structural, uh, structural and frequency reliability study needs to be conducted. Thank you. 
thank you very much. Um, Edwin, uh, I think it's, it's good to share also with the, the um, audience uh, the exchange that was about uh, uh, if these technologies have been adequately incorporated in the attained EDI and the EXI indexes and if there is the possibility of uh, improvements there because I think this is a very uh, pertinent question. Uh, Daphne already touched upon uh, but I think the audience needs also a bit to understand the context. Thank you. Uh, indeed, thank you, Chair. Um, so those of you who are aware of the development of wind uh, calculation in the EDI and EXI will know that the original way of doing the calculation was contained in circular 815 and uh, we uh, there was some there was a group that was working on improvements to the methodology and that group um, actually spent a lot of time with different manufacturers and different stakeholders talking about how it could be improved uh, and there were, uh, ABS was also heavily involved, as was Marin, and there were lots of different proposals for alternatives to how uh, this should be done. However, in the end, um, we didn't get enough consensus for any of these alternative methods, also because they had not been tried and tested. So in the end, even in the update to 896, we went more or less back to the original one that was proposed with some tweaks. Um and then also to use uh, the upper half of the wind uh, matrix, the, the global wind matrix. Um, that was the state of the art, say, two years ago. That was as far as we could get in terms of consensus amongst the, the industry stakeholders. Could we update this further in the future? Yes. And as you are aware, there are various projects ongoing about trying to standardize how we assess uh, the performance of wind-assisted propulsion and primary wind. Uh, and the outcomes of these would need to be consolidated and proved, and then we can see if we can update this into the um, in, in, into the guidelines. Of course, as Daphne suggested, if if you have quite a lot of wind propulsion, uh, then this is a case for be for the ship being con considered a hybrid vessel and therefore not include or exempted from EDI and EXI uh, compliance, because ultimately you will see. Uh, the effect of that in CII and and some and any future um, uh, regulatory measures. Thank you, Edwin. And can you please also share with the audience the exchange about uh, the expected speed of wind-assisted ships? Because again, there was a quite an interesting exchange in the chat about that. Yes. Yeah, so um, I think the question was about uh, it's the question was suggesting that wind assisted ships used to be quite slow. And uh, John Kokorakis helpfully pointed out that the old wind ships were actually quite fast, reasonably fast. Um, what we have today is we have some uh, rotor sails installed in some row rows and row packs where the speed is about 20 knots. Uh, but then increasingly you're seeing um, wind assisted devices uh, on slower vessels or so bulk carriers tankers typically the operating speed is the 11 to 14 knot range um, and of course there you also have seen other studies recently about um, weather routing and uh, of course the slower you you operate the ship the more the the, the, the wind propulsion is likely to contribute so you, you have to take it as a whole um, you know what what is the kind of optimal point and that may change for each ship type and each operating route Thank you very much. I take the Netherlands in the floor, so we mix a bit the chat and floor, the Netherlands. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Daphne, for the, for the very interesting presentation, and also um, uh, thanks, Edwin, for, the, uh, for updating us on how um, wind is, is, let's say, um, incorporated in the EDI and EXI uh, calculations. Um, in Daphne's presentation, there was also an example of how wind was uh, included in um, an operational measure like Fulio Maritime, um, where basically at the conceptual level, uh, the, the, um, the more, a more design approach was followed huh, with, with a, a, a rebate factor. Now that, that from a regulatory point of view and also uh, philosophically, I, I would 
say that that doesn't fit well in, a, in an operational uh, regulation. Eh? And, and certainly, if we're going to develop a greenhouse gas fuel standard at the, at the IMO, ideally, you would like to include uh, the energy provided by uh, wind-assisted propulsion to the ship uh, in a quantified way um, in the regulation. And that leads me to the question, is it possible um, to accurately measure the amount of energy uh, um, in a, on an operational basis that a ship uh, gets from its uh, wind system? Um, are, there, are there systems available that do that? Uh, or, or do we have to rely on um, uh, the kind of polar diagrams that Daphne showed and then make assumptions on, on uh, 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 average winds uh, on certain routes, et cetera, et cetera? So is it, is it possible to, to measure um, accurately the, the amount of, of um, power delivered by the, the wind to the ship? Who would like to take this question? Edwin, is still you, or? Uh... Maybe I can make a start. I don't know, Daphne, or if there is, wants to say something after that. Um, there has been, there is still ongoing quite a lot of work on this. And yes, I agree with you, Jasper, that, uh, I mean, <laughs> what we have in few EU is, um, let's say, what what we could agree because we didn't have the the technical solution to um to to get a proper estimation of wind and without any monitoring in in effect and no verification then we could not credit wind i don't think it would be fair to credit wind because there was always be always be the possibility of it not being used but of course it, it doesn't sit well because it's not a it's not a design measure but a, but an operational um where we're going with this is uh there are there is some work ongoing. I think RISE are involved, I believe, um, and and also Marin in trying to figure out if there is a way to standardize this. Uh, also, I think with um, ITTC, um, the results are not yet. I don't think they're finalized. Um, whether all this will be finalized in time to be used in the global fuel standard, uh, and with a high degree of certainty, um, I don't really know yet. But I don't know, um, ABS colleagues, if you want to jump in on anything. Yes, if there is, come and save me. Hi. Uh, good morning, everybody. So what uh, what the situation is is that uh, from the from an EU, let's say, perspective, uh, the good news is the EU is uh, is very much into what's happened on the vessel. You know, what are the actual emissions on the vessel? So this will continue to, to be reported and uh, essentially the verifiers will have to, to do a little bit of more homework on this because we have to establish methodologies. Uh, I would call it even transparent methodologies of how we make such assessments. That is, that is, uh, that is a hurdle and that is, it has quite a, a high technical background and it, it obviously needs a different fora for this. Uh, as ABS, we've made the start through through the EMSA project as well as through the the WISP projects at the, with Marin, and we've made the start and we have proposed uh, methodologies uh, to be transparent. Uh, let's say the mathematical model and all that stuff. And now this depends on how at what level we will take them. I would not like to to confuse uh, the topic and bring the so-called EDI methodology in the picture, uh, because this is a completely different aspect. Uh, it's just a, a design index. Uh, we do not really agree with the, me the entire methodology uh, expressed uh, in, the, in that document. It is a good attempt, but we believe that it needs to be uh, improved, let's say. Uh, we are aware of the other uh, efforts currently in the industry. Uh, everybody is trying to come up with methodologies, but the focus appears to be on how to estimate savings. And I think that uh, we need to understand that that is a different focus. 
One thing is, yes, we can have methodologies to come up with savings and all that stuff, but at the same time, we need methodologies, transparent methodologies for verification purposes of such systems, because these systems, for sure, in the, in the near future, there is going to be an uptake, and at the same time, both the vendors, both the regulators, they will be looking, the owners, the operators will be in the middle and will be saying, how do we verify such savings? And you don't want to have uh, a kind of a, a very open approach with different verifiers coming up with uh, different numbers. I think we need uh, technical methodologies, transparent and perhaps a different form for this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Daphne, please. Um, I just wanted to clarify, maybe uh, some of you are not so familiar with this framework, that uh, the wind actually has two uh, positive effects on the fuel EU. The first one is the, with the F-wind factor, which is uh, just an improvement of the compliance uh, of, of the GNG intensity of the vessels. And the other one, as I said earlier, is uh, based on the actual fuel consumption reported. So with the WAPs uh, operating, uh, under uh, favorable conditions and uh, based on good operation, you are supposed to have savings on the fuel consumption. So this is a second positive effect that is coming into the regulation. Thank you. Carlos, you want to add anything? No? So uh, there is, uh, again, I think uh, because there is a question uh, that in a way it was touched upon, but which is the life cycle analysis of uh, WAPs uh, taking into account uh, the recycling ability of the composite? Uh, yes, indeed, we have not uh, taken this into account in our analysis because uh, it's a very complex issue and there were no uh, enough data to, to take the LCA into, into account. May I add to that yeah. also? Um, I mean, there are many different types of WAPs, so only some are composite, many are not. Um, and so the ones that are not composite are steel or whatever, so it's not really very different from recycling the ship. Um, and if you think on the embedded embedded carbon, and, and I think, Stanatis, you might know this because you've done some of the studies, um, typically across the life cycle of a vessel, 10% is embodied. Uh, I mean, the CO2 emissions that are in the... Um, uh, in the production of the vessel, and then 90% of the, the carbon emissions really come from the use of the fuel through the entire lifespan of the vessel. Now, with with a lot of these WAPs, the, there is no fuel, um, not all of them. It, there's so, it is only the embodied carbon in there. So the entire life cycle of it in from a GHG point of view is really quite small. On the recyclability, then, of course, some even some of the composites can be recyclable and some not. Um, it is one of those things where... Um, we also have this, I don't know, we have this perspective that things like uh, wind turbine blades are not recyclable, but the total amount of volume or mass that they take, if you have to put them in landfill, is actually not very large. So it's it's one of those things in that if you look at the cost benefit of trying to do an LCA, um, what you will find out from it, um, it's not entirely clear, but um, we don't think at this point it would be a massive problem overall. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, uh, so we have also a final uh, exchange uh, in relation to the vortex shedding frequ frequency. So Carlos, uh, if you can also share with the audience. Thank you. Uh, and thanks, John, for your, uh, for your question and, and input. Yes, indeed, I was ex actually trying to, to, to draw a design um, to help understanding, but you are you are absolutely right. So, whenever we would have one of these modes of vibration um, that would coincide with a, with a, with a structure of frequency um, that is calculated for the for the struts for the for the pillars, uh, we have um, the resonance um, parameter, and there is the most the most used solution is to avoid having um, the same the same vibrational mode so we need to according to the formulas of the of the of the natural frequency we have two options we either we increase the mass of the cantilever beam 
or we, which is a little bit more challenging, or we, we start to, to change the, the, the material rigidity um, of, the, of, the, of the entire system. But the most common is, is actually to, to, to change the mass of the, of the cantilever beam in order to divert it from the same mode of, uh, mode of uh, from the, one of the modes of vibration, because you can have more than one, you can have two to three, uh, and we need to disalign them uh, in order to avoid the, the resonance parameter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a lot of expertise around uh, this table and online, which is uh, very good for the quality of the information shared. Um, if we don't have any more questions, uh, in the room or in the chat. We move to the second presentation, uh, again stemming from the study, and uh, we refer on the cost analysis. Of course, uh, uh, always bear in mind the, 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 the assumptions and so on eh, when we speak about cost analysis. So I give the floor to Julius, who is with us. Please. Thank you, Manuela. Good morning. So I will give you an overview of the economic analysis which we did for the uh, study on winter system propulsion. And um, I'm representing here because I was less involved in this topic, but my colleagues Dagmar Nelissen and Dan van Seters were heavily involved in the construction of this analysis uh, alongside my colleagues of uh, ABS. <clears throat> Similar as yesterday on the hydrogen uh, cost analysis, now I will give you an overview of the scope and uh, the method which we applied, which is slightly different or completely different from the one yesterday. Um, and I will share some indicative results, which are, I already say now, indicative because um, there's way less data available to base, uh, to base our analysis on because this is um, a more recent development and there are not as much uh, producers as well of these systems yet. But still the aim is to give you a, a comprehensive overview um, of what the potential could be um, if installing uh, winter system propulsion on the ship. So the approach um, for the analysis here, which we took, is a cost coverage analysis of the application of winter system propulsion systems. Um, and this could give an insight on the investment cost and the operational cost at the ship level. And why we took this uh, scope, this method for the analysis here is because there are no specific performance uh, figures of uh, winter system propulsion systems for uh, ship types or in general for certain ships. Because there are many, factor, many factors in play uh, determining the actual um, power thrust which can uh, which which can which one which which a ship can get from a uh, wind system, so there is no one size fits all percentage of um, power saving that we can apply here. We looked at uh, the application of wind systems at new builds and um, at a retrofitting, um, so installing at existing ships. And because wind is um, primarily available in, in um, enough quantity, so to say, at sea, um, we only consider ocean-going ships, so no coastal vessels. And what we finally aim to, to get a result in is the relative fuel savings needed to cover the annual cost related to the application of the wind assisted propulsion system. That is the annual cost for the investment and the operational cost, which uh, come with the use of 
the winter system propulsion system, and for the years 2030 and 50. So to give an insight what this could be in the future. Here the overview of the analysis. Um, the first row in blue, the blocks in blue, represent the input data for the capex, for the capital expenditure, the investment costs. That is, of course, the cost for the winter system propulsion system and the installation cost, which is um, a one-time cost as well. Then the operational cost, um, depending on the system type, there are some adjustments needed um, for the wind direction. There are some adjustments need, adjustment needed when there are harsh weather conditions, for example. So there are some operational costs there. Um, and of course, there's some maintenance costs um, which, which come with the use of, uh, of such systems. And we had to make some assumptions on the number of winter assistant, uh, winter assistance systems on ships. So, and I will, I will uh, give you uh, a number on the, the next slides as well. Um, smaller ships can, can only have so much, uh, so many of these systems installed compared to larger ships. Um, so there can be, from, from, this, from uh, the industry experts, we received information that larger ships can have uh, installed a higher number of, of these systems. And we looked at the yearly main engine fuel consumption of ships because um, the thrust power is only um, contributing to the propulsion, so to say. So the main engine uh, fuel consumption can be reduced, but the other, the auxiliary engine, um, there are no savings there from the use of uh, winter system propulsion. And then, of course, the fuel cost, um, which which, um, which are an underlying figure for the um, cost savings needed. Uh, and the main engine fuel consumption is, um, we looked only at the main engine fuel consumption at sea. So not in ports at birth, um, maneuvering in birth, that is, that is not considered because of course we only um, consider that the winter system propulsion systems can only um, provide some extra thrust in uh, at seas. And then we finally arrived at um, what, what percentage of fuel saving is needed to uh, cover the investment, uh, the, the yearly capex and the yearly opex for a certain ship. As I already said, there is um, quite some uncertainty about the exact figures on the system costs. Um, this is because of, um, because of the lack of uh, enough data on it. So um, we only have a few data points on which we can base our analysis on, which is great, but we also uh, want to stress that um, this is maybe not enough to, to be 100% um, certain about um, the cost but it gives, it gives an indication of the range of cost there. There are also differences in the cost uh, related to applying these systems on new build ships and on retrofit ships. Um, with retrofitting the application of the systems at existing ships, um, there might be additional cost for, um, for um, upgrading the, the whole structure. Um, and enforcing so, the, so the, the, the whole structure of the ship can bear extra power from, uh, from, the, the wind, um, from the wind system it gets. The number of units applied on a ship varies with ship size. In the table on the right side, uh, the above, um, is indicated what number of uh, units we assume to be applied at um, at the ships, and we divided the size categories of the IMO fleet in small, medium, and large, um, large size vessels. Based on um, 
on ex uh, industry expert input, we um, have assumptions on the yearly operational cost and the installation cost. Um, the system costs are to be declined over time, but um, due to the fact that uh, operational cost and installation cost are not declining over time, we assume that the cost in the current year, in 2023, are uh, for these two cost items, operational cost and installation cost, constant over time, while the system costs are decreasing. To give you um, uh, a sense of the, of the extent of the system costs, very dependent on the type of system, rotor, sails, a kite, um, it can be from half a million for one unit up to four to five uh, million euros. But it varies um, very much on the number of units installed, the type of ship, um, and also the configuration, the number of um, units, and perhaps even a combination of, uh, of these systems. So here we have um, uh, a snapshot of some results. We took uh, bell carrier as an example here. On the, um, we, we see for the four main um, WAPT types, rotor sails, hard sails, suction wings, and kites, the results. And uh, in, for every, for every WAPT type, we see the ship size, in uh, dead weight tonnage, so from small to large. And the first two size categories are considered small, then in the middle, the third one is uh, the medium ship, and then the, the two ones on the, on the right side are the large ships. We see that, um, to take uh, rotor sails as the first example, we see that um, the required man engine fuel saving uh, varies uh, significantly by the ship size. So these are all bulk carriers, but if we take a uh, relatively small bulk carrier, the required fuel savings are um, several percentage points lower than the um, medium sized bulk carriers. And the decline, there is a decline in um, the fuel savings needed over time. And this is due to, um, on one side, the uh, reduction in the system cost of the winter system propulsion systems. But on the other side as well, for the year 2023, the fuel uh, applied is uh, very low sulfur fuel oil. In 2030, in light blue, you can see um, the assumption there is a 5% uh, bio, biofuel with very low sulfur fuel oil and carbon cost. And in, in the year 2050, um, the fuel is here ammonia. So that is also a pointing why there is less fuel savings needed in 2050, because the fuel costs are higher. So you need to save less to recover the cost for the uh, winter system propulsion system. Um, to look on, the, uh, we can see on the right side the, the hard sail and the kite. Um, they have a slightly lower required uh, fuel savings. That is because the, these systems have a slightly lower um, investment cost. But we cannot we cannot state anything about their performance, which may be higher or lower, um, depending on the route, depending on the environment, depending on the um, operation, whether a, it also depends on whether the crew is trained well, whether they can capture the most, um, the most beneficial wind direction. Um, so these are all factors in play. To conclude, very shortly, um, as I said, the cost effectiveness of a winter system propulsion system depends highly on 
the ship type, the configurations, the number of units applied on a ship, um, and the wind potential very much. Um, it is very much route dependent. And of course, the underlying fuel cost. So if you already um, have a higher fuel cost because you're sailing on, um, on, for example, biodiesel or in the future on ammonia or hydrogen, then you need less fuel savings to recover the investment and operational cost of, of the WAPs. And as you can see, comparison is difficult here. Um, one needs to consider this uh, case by case um, because it depends um, very much whether you have a large ship, a small ship, and the number of um, units applied. Uh, wind assist propulsion systems are probably less attractive for ships with a high share of uh, auxiliary engine fuel consumption and also ships without um, less fixed routes. So if a ship is uh, sailing a majority of the time on a certain route, um, you as a ship owner or oper operator can um, make quite firm um, estimations on the wind potential on the specific route. But if, you, um, if you're operating on a charter base, uh, sailing in, in very different oceans, then it might be um, a more uncertainty about um, the extra uh, thrust you get from, from the wind. And the return on investment of the WAP system uh, will probably drop over time due to uh, lower system costs and the use of renewable fuels. Thank you. Thank you, Yulusa, for, for, for sharing with us uh, the, the conclusions uh, related to this uh, cost analysis. And as I said, uh, uh, the, 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 what already Daphne started uh, sketching in her first uh, presentation as an impact uh, on the cost analysis, obviously. Um, at uh, this stage, uh, I don't see for the time being questions uh, on the chat. I don't know if uh, uh, on, in the room we have anything. Uh, there is uh, something that happened in the chat that was uh, about uh, also the impact on the port infrastructure that I didn't uh, pick up uh, uh, in the, uh, following the, the first presentation. And uh, there was also a string of comments uh, saying uh, if this technology, of course, could generate also some limitations where to be used in relation of the kind of port infrastructure that should interact uh, with the ship. Is there anything that anybody could, uh, could uh, provide a comment uh, under this? Again, more and more we see that with uh, uh, all these alternative solutions, you really need to have an integrated approach. So you need uh, all stakeholders on board. Yesterday there was uh, the reference uh, by Ricardo Battista to a fuel supply contract. So you can't have uh, any more the idea of uh, uh, on the spot bunkering, but you really need to have a structured approach uh, in order to support the use of these new uh, fuels and technologies. Uh, so is there anybody? Edwin, you, you can take it. Thank you. Sure. Um, what I suggested was that um, you, when you install WAPS, you will need to update some information on the, about the ship, including the uh, air draft information on the bridge. And so then you need to take into account in passage planning and your port calls. So what you then see is um, for the ships where this is a problem, you have these tiltable uh, units or stowable units. And then for those where cargo operation uh, is an issue, then you have them either offset to one side or you have them on rails so that they can move around to allow for um, all the cargo operations to take place. So all, all of this, uh, as you were saying, Chair, that uh, it needs to be taken into account at the design stage as to what the where the ship is intended to go uh, or, or um, whether new build or retrofitting. Um, and yeah, we, we do see all kinds of different solutions being uh, found to, to these issues. And then on top of that, actually, uh, some ports may then require you to do 
additional navigational risk asse risk assessment um because it's something that is sort of new and there there as Daphne has highlighted there could be some issues in, in maneuvering thank you very much uh, we have uh, here oh the fourth one please yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, maybe to state that uh, a couple of years back, we got the information or the inquiry of uh, which ships can come to our ports, uh, having uh, wind assistance. And we had to check all the uh, electricity cables uh, crossing the, the river Skelt to actually get uh, to enter. So we were, uh, yeah, we were investigating all these things. At this moment, we don't see any problems, but at least the uh, information uh, is there now because of the, the question we got. Thank you again. Some sharing of hands-on experience that is, is very important uh, when we can do a bit of a touch base on, on reality when, when we speak uh, about uh, uh, a future that is uh, more and more reality uh, and we have, of course, the first movers uh, a bit everywhere and then uh, uh, we need to know how things are handled. Ah, I have a, a, a BS from the chat that would like also to to, to complement, please. Yes. I, I, I believe uh, that the, the next uh, session uh, where you have for the hazard scenarios, the overview, I think the topic will be also uh, addressed over there. Because with any system, when we talk about integration, essentially we don't just talk about design related integration we talk about design and operational integration and any everything else the results will be reflected also in the vessels uh, safety management system and procedures so i don't want to take any more of this i think has it has uh, should be uh, should become a mandatory uh, perhaps uh, we could have uh, from the many has it has that are carried out in the industry uh, we should have a, a kind of a common, for talking about wind-assisted propulsion, of course, a kind of a common fi common findings. But then, what we see is that depending on the system uh, deployed, there are also additional findings which need to be reflected uh, from the safety perspective. So I'll stop at that. Thank you very much. Thank you also for anticipating that there is more to come that will also give the, 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 the further, let's say, uh, possibility to elaborate on some things that were already touched upon uh, in the different presentations. If we don't have any more interventions or comments from the chat or the floor, I would like now to give um, the floor to, again, a bit of a um, touch-based reality uh, uh, with the, the perspective of a wind equipment manufacturer. We have here with us uh, Renz Groot from EconoWind. And uh, if he can uh, uh, take the floor and uh, tell us a bit of the perspective from uh, a manufacturer. Uh, uh, again, uh, uh, as Carlos said at the very beginning, uh, we have experience now for some years uh, of some technologies. So we, we will again uh, touch base with the reality with this perspective. So Renz, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to <clears throat> present our, uh, our experience today as an equipment manufacturer. I represent uh, EconoWind. We're a Dutch company. We manufacture, engineer, and design wing seals, suction wing seals, to be exact. And, uh, and my background is, uh, is a naval architect and a project manager for Maersk before, and after that, uh, innovation and performance manager for Berger Balk. So when I was involved in, uh, in the assessment of the wind assisted ship propulsion, I jumped on the opportunity to work for EconoWind. Um, what you see here is on the background, our first ship. She was fitted uh, some years back already. She's the Anki by Jan van Dam. Um, and she is also one that has just concluded the first two year subsidy project by the EU called uh, WASP uh, and you see a savings, in, uh, if you can read it, actually, uh, about three and a half percent, which is quite moderate, uh, modest, I mean. Um, but that is, of course, if you take it over the whole year, right? So typically what you have is that 
you have a year of sailing, half the time a ship like that is, is lying in port. Of course, you don't have any savings there. Um, and then from that point on, you have, uh, of that half, you have half the time she has favorable winds. And then after that, you get utilization. So we also had in this ship uh, savings for up to 20% uh, proven in, of course, very favorable conditions. So also for us, uh, basically the premise is that you, if you convert wind energy, as you see here, into a fuel, you typically lose a lot by conversions. Uh, what, we tr what we strive for is, of course, that you can use the wind directly. Yeah? And thereby, you don't have all these conversions into, into fuels, e-fuels, uh, and then, then have to bring it back to the ship you know, after storage and, uh, and to use it. Uh, we, we can use 100% of the wind energy. So that's what we set out to do. Of course, we are talking about wind-assisted ship propulsion, and I will dive into that a little bit because we see that it's small, small beginnings, but you can really scale it up. And that's what we've been doing so far. So a little bit of the agenda. Uh, first of all, talk about the safety, obviously, for, for EMSA. Then the impact of regulations, as we have seen it over the couple of years. Uh, we, I'll touch upon some drivers for alternative power solutions, industry barriers, and some key takeaways. And on the left here, you see uh, Marfred Niolon. It's another pioneer in the industry. Uh, it's a Roro ship that, that that seals to the Caribbean by a French owner, shipping company Marfred. And they decided to put some containers on their ship with, with in this case, Fenty foils. And they can be deployed up and they generate savings. And they just uh, concluded um, a prediction of, of 7.3 overall over the whole uh, round trip. So safety first, of course. We had zero uh, safety accidents so far. Uh, I mentioned there the 34 unit years. That means we have a lot of, uh, or a lot of, we have a number of uh, systems installed, and so far we had zero accidents. Um, that's something we're very proud of, but also it's, it's ingrained in what we do, as we, our systems are quite basic, simple, and we take a lot of care not to interfere with, with uh, crew operations, cargo operations, as just was mentioned, uh, in port. It's very important. I'll get back to that. Uh, and one of the things also, we have a durable materials, and that also lowers risk. Because if you have to replace a material, then of course that, that inherently poses a threat to the crew. But also if you're in a strong wind that something breaks down, then you have to go out and, and repair it. So that's, these are very practical considerations that we've experienced so far. And therefore, what you see here, uh, our wings are made of aluminium. It's a metal. Uh, of course, if you look at the LCA, you can arguably say that there's something to say about that. But on that subject, I would say you also have green metals now. So I think in the future we'll be using that as well. Anyway, aluminium, they're very lightweight uh, and durable. So over time, that also has a positive effect on the business case. But for now, just focusing on safety, it means that, yeah, you, you, have, you have lesser breakdowns, lower risk, and risk is what it is about in the shipping community, of course. Um, we focus a lot on human element centered technology. Uh, the, the, if, if you come to our uh, factory, you will see that everything that is there is already known by, by the crew. We've got hydraulics, that's just the same hydraulics as they can use in a crane, a deck crane. They know how to use it, they so know how to operate it, thereby lowering risk, lowering the hazards, and thereby also improving safety. And that's the same with the suction wing seal principle. We have ventilators inside the seal, and that are, that's just a ventilator. Basically, right? it's the same ventilator as you have in the engine room, different locations of the ship, and thereby we also focus on, uh, on, on, yeah, that the crew can really adopt it quickly. And I've put in a picture there below of the Sunanvik, of a shipping company SMT. Uh, this is a, it's, it's a very special ship. She has icebreaker capabilities, and she carries cement, also not that green. So with some sails on it. Uh, the, the, the whole footprint is improved. You see two 16 meter aluminum wings. They can also be deployed back into a container. It's a slightly enlarged container, there's two of them. And I put this picture here because you can quickly see it fits in the environment. You see a big deck crane next to it. Actually, there are two deck cranes, one is less visible. Um, but it works the same way. And therefore the crew on this ship have really adopted it and, uh, and they're, they're as high as far now on the maiden voyage with uh, more than 70% utilization. That means that this system will stay upright 
fully automated in day and night, and it will just work. It automatically senses via an anemometer, wind meter, the direction and the speed of the wind, and thereby adjusts itself automatically. And, uh, and at the press of the button uh, on the bridge, if they don't like it for whatever reasons, they can put it down, for instance, going into port. And also, uh, this, of course, I'm the sales and service manager, so uh, we, we delivered this project in time within the dry docking. And that's very important because you don't want to you don't want to take off higher to fit a system like that. That's ne very negatively on the on the business case. So to continue on the safety, uh, we make very sure we make uh, sure that we don't obstruct the cargo operations. Therefore, they are tiltable. All of them. We we can also offer a fixed one. There's no problem. But we've seen so far that they want them tilted, and basically when they're in port, they want them away. It's not only for the safety but it's also for the ports as already mentioned by the port of antwerp it's no problem but if you have a crane operator and they damage for some reason they hit the the, the seal of course you get a lot of legal issues into what has changed so we try to get them away um, and our technology is, is very uh, it has a high power density i'll get back to that but it's also a very small footprint and and, and for visibility as well it's very uh, slim so we've done, done the hazard with, uh, with the ABS, very uh, positive, and uh, I think it said no unresolved risks identified. Of course, there's a lot of recommendations, and if you want to know what we're doing, basically look at the report, and we have point by point a lot of issues. Nothing critical, but just an improvement of the structure. Right? So, so we continue to prove and to make it more safe. Um, the visibility also mentioned, of course, is very important. I have to note here that compared to a geared ship, a ship with deck cranes, of course, the visibility is, is a lot less uh, damaged. But, uh, but it's very important, so we focus on it, and, and with our sales, we have, we have very little impact. That's a positive effect of being a, a power sail, if you might. Right? You, can, you can switch it on and off, as mentioned in the next point, and thereby you can depower the sail. In other words, if you Put the power on effectively you increase the lift coefficient and you increase the performance of the the seal and if you don't like it anymore you can switch it off it put it in a weather vane condition which is also automatically done and then you can just uh, uh, rest assured uh, the stability and the maneuverability is impacted we are still on the ship that we have here it's not impacted that much simply because there's not a lot of uh, not a lot of uh, con concerns we do calculate that we do, of course, uh, follow the IMO and the class rules. And since we don't do that in-house, it's typically a design house or a design bureau that does that. And I might say also, if you put in the sails in a balanced way, you can actually improve the maneuverability as well in a sort of way. And as a comment to the, to, to the study done, uh, you also have to know that on the stability, the dynamic stability, as was mentioned, in the old days, you had a storm sail just to stabilize the roll motions. Well, there's a very good side effect of these sales as well. And we have requests from, from shipping companies that say our ship is very harsh in roll. Can we put a sail on it for crew welfare that they don't being tossed around the whole time? Yeah, so that's that. And I think you should really look into that as a positive way. How that works out as a dynamic stability, I don't know. But, but I mean, that's been proven over the long years. There's a little movie here to keep it to make it real. Yeah. Uh, this, is the sh this is a ship in moderate sailing condition. This is again the Anki. You see here that this, this goes on uh, a lot of the time. So our equipment has to be really reliable. There are fans in there. So uh, you can imagine over the past years we've been working very hard. And it's working. So from our point of view, the impact of regulations of course, it is crucial to have a level playing field, right? I've been working at shipping companies before, and one of the first questions is also, how is our competitor, our neighbor, going to avoid these rules? Well, basically, let's be honest, they, they haven't, right? There's a, there is a very much confidence in the enforcement of the rules so far, and I think that's great, because that means that, you know, if it's PSPC, the EDI, the NOx and the SOx, everything basically was followed up and enforced which gives a lot of uh, confidence. And the confidence is what we need in the future to, to apply these uh, systems. And, and the one I love best is basically energy efficiency became a commercial driver. 
have to imagine that before, if you want to charter a ship, it's only about what is the dead weight and what is the location. It's similar as you rent a, a car somewhere at an airport. I mean, you, you don't check if the, if the ship is energy efficient. You just say, I need to, to transport five persons and I need it to be there. And then obviously the price is, is something you weigh out. But now energy efficiency has become a commercial driver. And that's very important for, for the chartering. And therefore also we've seen some of the big charters already moving into the space and going to ship owners and telling them, that's the ship that I don't want because it's not energy efficient. And this is, this is I think you, you have to realize it's a big shock for everybody in the shipping company. And to the commercial people, maybe also a little bit of a headache because now they have to consider that as well. And then also, what can they do about it? Well, we are here to help them uh, to improve their asset, of course. What does it mean for, for the, that's the effect of regulation? What does it mean for new ships? So obviously the shipyard and designers, they, they consider the alternative power now. You have been for some time, but also on the other side, the request is coming as well from the ship owners. Uh, and, and, and what it brings then, it's simply worth the risk. Yeah. I always say that uh, uh, if you want to make a revolution, you have to understand that shipping is an evolution. You can only do that by understanding it. And, and the risk is something that you basically don't, don't want. Uh, but now they do. The existing ships, we can extend the lifetime. And, and as you know, the, the ships, the older ships are typically the cash cows of a shipping company. So they want to sail as long as they can with the ship. But of course, if the ship is, is not energy efficient, she should be removed. Uh, with, with placing a vento foil, a wing sail on the ship, you can extend the lifetime. I think it's worthwhile to figure out, you know, that ship that is not performing that well, but still you consider to extend the lifetime. I think it's a form of reduce or reuse maybe. But, uh, but, but, but this is a possibility. Um, and I think that also adds on top of the old water ballast coating rule way back when actually the ships were improved by that coating whereby the ships can remain older. And if you can sail along longer with an existing ship, you don't have to have the carbon footprint of, of creating a new one. So what are the drivers for alternative power solution? Uh, of course, we had the business case of uh, CE Delft. And and obviously, I've, put, I've tried to rank them a little bit in, in importance, where you would expect that the price of our unit is very important. Obviously, it's the big one, but it's the one that's kind of fixed. What you can do with it, what the shipping company can do with it, is, of course, the financing. And, and, and you see that they are a little bit holding back, like, okay, this is basically an older ship for the retrofit. Is it worth the investment? And therefore, we see from our side, it's very attractive to take the wing sail off again. So, and reuse it on another ship. So you can sail for let's five years and then you take it off, you put it on another ship and you can continue to sail. Uh, we call it a ticket to sail. Uh, the other thing is, of course, they're very interested in lease and, and we do provide that. And then the, the other thing, as uh, the, the Netherlands uh, delegation mentioned, the performance guarantee. This is very important and we see already and we are doing that between the uh, ship owner and the charter that there's a back to back agreement because the charter pays the fuel and the owner makes the investment. So they've kind of tied up the performance and we're fitting, to answer your question, strain gauges on our system so we can actively measure on the system itself how much it, uh, it is saving. Of course, it's kind of complicated because the strain gauges uh, for the technical uh, student people here, of course, they do measure, but there's also a lot of roll motions. And the roll motions you have to filter out, basically, inertia. So we're working on that. We already have uh, strain gauges installed on all our, all our units. Uh, but we, uh, and we're working to get a, a real crisp performance management system out of it. And that can then be used as a performance guarantee of sorts, or maybe for the IMO uh, to, to use that as a, as a validation. Um, there's off hire, of course, to fit it. We try to reduce it so far. We've been very successful. You, you, you do it in a dry docking. If you can be on the key side, you can have a very rapid installation. We really focus on that on the design. Uh, yard works, of course, is a big uh, cost. I think it could be easily higher than the 15% that was mentioned, unfortunately. Uh, and, and, and what you see is that the shipping company, they don't always have the capabilities in-house to do that kind of assessment, right? Not everybody has a big technology team or innovation team. Uh, and then again, of course, there's the crew adoption and the utility, which for a simpler system is, is better. This is on the cost side. On the benefit, of course, it's the fuel price that is dominating. And you see an increase in fuel price, probably, you never know but that makes it more attractive. And as also mentioned, the route. Yeah, we've seen on the first ship, for instance, if you really look at it, 
the route might not be the most uh, beneficial and therefore also your overall savings go down, obviously. Uh, there is something on the carbon cost, so I really look forward to the ETS to see that in play. It's not the most important driver, but certainly adds on to the fuel price as a benefit. And then obviously there's the performance of the water. And I think the, the C Delft study didn't mention it because it's really difficult to compare these systems on the performance. Uh, I think Marin of the Netherlands already went a long way in the WISP project to quantify that. And as we say now, as our performance is about the same as a rotor on the, on the span, if we call it, the height of it. And that includes the energy that we need to feed into it. So that, that's, of course, uh, <laughs> for me, you might not believe it, but for Marin, you might be more credible. Uh, and we, we say then on, on that same span, basically, the performance, then our system is a little bit lighter. Uh, it has a little bit of a, a better visibility. So where will this go? Well, we've, we've, we've got, we found a company that uh, bought uh, wing sales from us. They're called Tank Tank. Uh, and this is a, a company that's already been pushing the boundaries for a long time. And basically, if you want to see where it's going, I suggest you follow these, uh, these guys. They've uh, for some time back already invested in a very slender hull design. Uh, lowering speed but lowering propulsion power a lot and after that they've continued on that route uh, for instance with hybridization yeah, it's installing a shaft generator motor whereby you kind of hybridize the whole ship and now it's the point that they say they need to go to not only an alternative fuel like methanol but also add zeals on it they've worked very hard with kongsberg and also on the, the shipyard jingling shipyard in china what we're working with now to to, to really make use fully of the sails. So they will lower speed uh, when, when, the, when, when it's uh, on attractive. They will raise speed tremendously and they get huge savings. So what are the barriers to wind? I already mentioned that owners cannot afford downtime. Basically, if you want to know how efficient a ship is, a large commercial ship in my previous company, uh, some people say, yeah, but we can save some downtime. You have less downtime. We were at 99.8% uptime, right? So you can focus a lot on the 0.2% that you want to improve it. But basically these ships, they go back and forth, very reliable, and there's little breakdown. That also means that they cannot afford any more breakdown. So this thing has to work and it has to, you know, you don't have to deviate to do a repair or something like that. Uh, the, the, what you always see is the first movers have little benefit. Uh, you can better be the second one. And what I also mentioned already is the supply chain vertical differentiation. If the fuel consumers, the shipping companies, the ship managers, they don't, they don't pay the fuel bill. And the charters, of course, they have no need to invest in the ship because it's not theirs. But as mentioned, we, we see tremendous changes and in initiatives already there between huge companies. And then there's projects. There's an adversity to mod modify ships, of course. We all think that the ship owner is... Uh, uh, Basically, what they also are is they are just a transporter, right? So they don't, they don't want to modify their asset so much. One thing is because of the second-hand value of the asset itself, but also because there's a risk, again, in doing these conversions or retrofits. So my key takeaways here, uh, and I hope they, they could trigger some, some discussion maybe. Uh, we, have, we have matured to TRL 9. That means it's the highest level, so we're basically there. Doesn't mean we stop developing, but, but we have a safe and a cost-effective solution. And some of our competitors uh, are also there already. The crew adoptability is, is very high, we see, with simple high-tech. Yeah, that, and that's where the differentiator lies, probably. We focus a lot on it. We get some good success, but I can imagine that some systems are also more complicated to operate. Um, and as the good news is you can really scale it up. You, you can imagine that with weather routing, finding the optimal wind, uh, speed up and down compared to the wind. There's an enormous amount of energy in wind. And if you fully use that, you can really scale it up and you will not achieve 100%. You will always need some kind of a safe, safe way to get into a port, but you can certainly scale it up. Uh, and the regulations mentioned, they make the ship efficiency a commercial marker, which is very important. That's what the game is going to be about in the coming years. And, and now you see contracts between charter and ship owners, and they are based on performance. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, I would say, this very honest presentation. So where uh, there was really 
a full overview uh, with a lot of sharing also of direct experience that you had in, in the field, also the, the difficulties that you have faced and the advantages that, uh, that are there. Um, I open the floor if you have any questions for uh, our uh, speaker, since it was quite comprehensive on the technology they have uh, proposed as a solution. So let's see if we have anything here. No, but in the, in the chat. So, Frederic, can you take it because I have a different screen? Okay, so we had a question by Mr. Kokarakis. Further to Mr. Groot's comment, the optimum wind for flatner rotors is the beam wind. Are the ensuing roll motion significant? <clears throat> Yeah, the rotor is, 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 is great because it does stabilize the ship, of course, and in beam winds especially. Um, we have the same effect, but we don't have the gyroscopic effect. The gyroscopic effect, of course, makes sure that the roll is even more reduced. Um, the beam winds are the most optimum, absolutely. Uh, we, we, we have a high angle of attack because we, we resemble a little bit more of a wing shape. So, so for a rotor, of course, there's less, less opportunity to trim it. They trim by speeding up and speeding down, but we can actually physically rotate the sail a little bit, and therefore we can get a little bit closer, sailing close to the wind, so a little bit more into the wind. And that brings uh, fascinating uh, studies, because if you look at the America's Cup ships, uh, the faster they go, the more forward wind they have, and at some point they go faster than the wind. Uh, so so that's, that's what you focus on, the lift. Um, but as also in the polar plot, uh, we were advised as well that there, of course, is also a benefit from, from wind from behind. It's not in the polar plot, also not in our polar plot, but we're going to revise that because wind from the back, you will have drag and that also benefits. The thing is, of course, if you sail forward, you have less wind from the back. Yeah, it's kind of logical. I hope that answers the question. May I ask a question? Because you, you made the reference also is a kind of technology where in terms of, of crew, it's, uh, it's uh, the uptake of whatever is needed is, uh, is, uh, is there. Uh, how do you handle this? You have also, I don't know, training packages that you offer for, for the crew. Do you have a concept of an integrated product where uh, you also but this is a bit, uh, no, uh, with all this innovation, uh, how producers support uh, uh, the upskilling uh, of uh, the personnel that is involved. If you can uh, just elaborate a bit on that, uh, thank you. Yeah, it's very important, of course, that they, that they feel it's really their system. And we officially say you can, you can pick up the wing at our factory and you put it on your ship. That's the official way, but it doesn't work that way. It's very important that you, that you train and, and that you do commissioning properly as well. It is automated fully, so it is a press of the button. And, 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 and it basically is, but before they press the button, they want to be sure that nothing happens when they press that button. So what we do is we send along a, uh, an installation uh, engineer or a commissioning engineering team, basically. There's a couple of people that, that make sure that it's working on the ship. And after that, we typically sail along for, for one or two we weeks. Um, and thereby we do the training. Training, so we sail along, we have a, we have a few upcoming. We have a lot of sails in production now, so, so we are, have to hire another one probably because uh, we have a lot of uh, training to do. And then they typically sail along a uh, stretch one or two weeks for the ship you saw, the Sunanvik. Uh, we were on board, I think, even three weeks. It's also practical because we want to stay on board longer. Uh, after that, we have close contact with the crew, really on a, on, a, on a very close basis because we get to know them by then. And they come back with feedback, uh, solutions also on how do we measure it, how do we use it. And, uh, and that's, yeah, that's also very rewarding because you see that they really appreciate it. Everybody is pretty enthusiastic about the sales, but it's the risk that you have to overcome. Um, after that, of course, comes the service. So we can log in remotely in port. 
and check if, uh, if, if all the sensors are working, if everything is working okay to help them. Uh, and often, of course, also we have a lot of ships in, in, in this area and then we travel to the ship and, and we sail along again or, or something like that. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. Um, if, uh, yes, please. Yeah, I have a question to, to Renzi. You mentioned that um, uh, in the future you can imagine that uh, there will be a more uh, efficient system. How do you see the development uh, taking place? I think yeah, now you have a, a winter foil with a height of uh, 30 meters. Uh, do you expect that those is going to be uh, double in size or, or how do you see them developing? Yeah, we have so far our largest sail is uh, 16 meters uh, made of aluminium and we're moving into a 30 meter market where our competitors like, like uh, well, Norse Power, Anamoy, they are already having that. Um, we wanted to start small but we're ready to scale up. We're making those uh, bigger 30 meters wing sails in steel, first also in the Netherlands, and then maybe later we might think about licensed production. But it is about scale, and that's basically what you see. If you put a 16 meter on a large ship like that, which we are doing, by the way, you see it is, yeah, it's just very small compared. Um, but what you see from the shipping companies is they, they want to test one unit, and if they tested it sufficiently and they know the crew is there, then they can easily scale it up in, in, in this sense of, the, uh, of, of a container ship, for instance, which we will we'll see very soon. We will have a container on board and it's one container on board a ship of, I think it is 1700 containers. So it's not, it doesn't have a big impact, but for them, they want to test that it's working. And after that, the scaling up is not that difficult. And that's what the shipping industry has been doing so far anyway, right? We have a small ship. And look at where we are today. The scaling up is relatively, uh, is relatively easy. Thank you very much. It seems uh, that uh, your presentation was, was quite exhaustive because we, we don't have uh, questions. It means that we can uh, uh, break perfectly on time for some uh, refueling with coffee here and um, we will see you at uh, 11.30 Lisbon time. 11.30 Lisbon time. Thank you.
Welcome back to all of you. And we continue our focus uh, on uh, wind-assisted uh, propulsion. It's now the moment of... Uh, ah, we have still uh, a question. Okay. Um, I think uh, the, the best place is you. Uh, is there a limitation for the ship uh, with WAPs to go against the wind and under what angle? Traditional sailing ships can't go at less than about 60 degrees against the wind and by using only jib sails instead of square. It is necessary to make a crisscross by changing wind on port to starboard side to make advance against wind. Our ship with the WAP will make a propulsion under force majeure conditions. Yeah. Of course, that's, uh, that's one of the big performance uh, criteria. How close to the wind can you sail? How much against the wind you can sail? Uh, of course, the closer you sail to the wind, your, your benefits reduces. And that's what you saw in the polar plot, that uh, beam winds are most favorable and it reduces as, as closer. And around 20 degrees, I think, we, 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 it's, it's, not, uh, it's not doing anything anymore. Also, in respect to when you're sailing that close to the wind, you have a lot of side force. So, so the closer to the wind, you have less of a forward vector, basically, and more of a transverse vector. So at some point, you want to close them down. And I think I recall that it's sort of 20, 20 degrees on each side. And that's typically, we have one of the highest uh, angle of, of, how do you say, factor against the, the angle of against the wind sailing. Um, yeah, what can I say more about it? Uh, it, 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 it's the whole, the whole technology principle basically is based on it, that the angle of attack of the wind, normally for an airplane it's like 10 to 12 degrees, um, and, and if, you, if you have more than that, the angle of attack, you will have this stalling effect. If we can go up to 30, 30 degrees, and we will still have a lift. And that's also the beauty of this uh, power seal uh, concept, if you switch it off, then the lift is gone. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of uh, in, in, inside, but... Thank you very much. Uh, then let's move to the presentation on the ASID, since there were already some references uh, um, during the, the, the past uh, moments. And um, I pass the floor to ABS Online. It's online? Uh, he, he had some issues to, to join, uh, so maybe you can uh, accept him again in the Zoom meeting. Uh, ah, okay, let's check if we have uh, anybody. Normally this is not with acceptance, it's open, but uh, isn't he there, uh, ABS uh, Lefteris? No, no, it's uh, Edwin Pang from our Ar Ah, Edwin, okay. I don't see, so it's Arxilea. And Edwin is just now in, so Edwin, you are just in, so the floor is yours for the ACID-related presentation. I see you in, so... Yes, please. thank you. Thank you. Um, let me share my screen. Can I hear you loud and clear? Will you manage the presentation from your side? Yes, I will do that. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen now. We are in uh, business. Great, excellent. Um, so thank you and sorry for the short delay. Um, I will present an overview of the hazard scenarios that we went through. Um, as uh, Rene mentioned yesterday, uh, our colleague uh, Harish was the one who had, um, sort of led all of these hazard scenarios. He's not able to join us today, I don't think. Um, so I'm sort of deputizing. Um, and of course, it, it also needs to be said that um, a lot of... Um, uh, ship owners and manufacturers were very kind in providing us a lot of information on which we could do these studies. Um, so uh, with uh, thanks to uh, Econowin, who are in the room, to RENS uh, for organizing all the um, documentation and assistance that we received from them, um, also to um, to Norse Power and Scanlines, uh, and then to the VIA Group, uh, which has the container ship with the three soft sails, as we can see. So uh, the hazard covered three uh, broadly three technologies and on three vessel different vessel types. So we have here a rotor sail on the uh, on uh, Scanlines hybrid ferry going between Denmark and Germany. 
we have a general cargo vessel which has the Econo Wind um, system uh, on board uh, with the tilting option um, situated forward. And then we have the Veer Group, which is a concept um, study with approval in principle of a small um, container feeder vessel uh, with three uh, soft sails. These are rigs that are that were developed and are in place on uh, a couple of large yachts. Uh, and this has now been um, has approval in principle from ABS uh, to be installed on a small cargo vessel. Now, um, the format of this presentation follows very much what um, what Renee did yesterday. So, with the wind hazards, there are also some general assumptions, um, and these are that the vessels are, of course, designed and built to class statutory regulations. Um, the wind assisted propulsion system will not be in use during cargo operations. And of course, structural integration of this uh, of these pieces of equipment within the ship will be designed and tested according to class rules. And that's just the class rules, the standard structural rules, and any additional rules that are um, applied to uh, wind assisted propulsion systems. And of course, the materials will likewise comply with the relevant class uh, rules uh, and so much requirements. Um, the electrical equipment, if any, will meet the appropriate requirements if installed in hazardous areas. Uh, this is for warps with uh, control systems, motors, electrical systems, etc. And then software uh, for control of the systems will have undergone some sort of functional testing and certification by the vendor. What's important to note is that we have not considered scaling up or multiple units. So where uh, we have just looked at the vessels where these systems have been installed, uh, there, we are, of course, aware that there are other vessels where there are more rotors or yeah, more yeah. Um, suction wings installed, um, but this is not considered. It's not necessarily very um, critical for the hazard uh, in this instance. Um, it's really the type of system that has some inherent hazards as well as the location of these things um, uh, as well as what else is on the vessel. Um, okay, so... We will start with some general findings, which are common across most of uh, all of all three of the the systems considered. Um, and some of this, uh, Daphne has already uh, introduced when she talked about the regulations. So the first is that um, wind assisted propulsion systems may impact vessel maneuverability and controllability, and this is both in terms of um, when the system is operational as well as when the system is not operational. So in the case, the, um, you, you have uh, versions where you can't stow them away, you can't tilt them, or if there is accidental use of them uh, when they are supposed to be uh, inactive. Um, so, um, so an example would be if a rotor sail uh, is still running in port because it was not able to be turned off or somebody forgot to turn it off, um, you have then some uh, some risks associated with that. So further work needs to be done in this area to quantify the impact and identify suitable mitigations. And some mitigations are already in place uh, with some of these systems, uh, particularly the active ones. And of course, this may be subject to further navigational risk assessment from individual ports, and there would be involvement and interest from pilots about uh, how uh, the control of the vessel may be um, changed uh, as a result of this. In the picture here is an example of a of a bulk carrier with a with a hard sail up forward, which uh, of course um, can't be stowed. And this being um, uh, installed in the forward part of the vessel will uh, necessitate perhaps some differences in how you how you maneuver the vessel uh, and in terms of rudder angles and so on. Um, a second issue that we that we find that is quite common, and this one is has many facets to it, is around equipment number. As and as many of you know, the equipment number of the vessel is one of these things where you calculate and it then defines uh, a whole host of different things on the vessels, primarily um, the mooring equipment that should be on board and the anchor chain that should be on board. And quite crucially, the equipment number calculation is uh, has been around for a very, very long time. And one of the provisions in there says that if you have a uh, superstructure or erections uh, that are um, less than B over four, you don't take it into account in the overall area, uh, lateral lateral area of the vessel. So only 
wind-assisted propulsion systems over B uh, over four. That means wider or um, wider than um, a quarter of the of the breadth of the vessel will be taken into account in the equipment number calculation. And then if that happens, it leads to an upgrade of mooring lines and anchor chains. Now you will notice, of course, that many of these rotors and the and the and the suction wings are less than B over four. So there is technically uh, this is technically doesn't affect the equipment number calculation and therefore does not lead to an um, any changes to the mooring lines or anchor chains. But, of course, there is actually an increase in the windage area. And, of course, for the active ones that we have, uh, then the effect of, the, um, uh, of, of this is more than just the area, because either from the rotation of the cylinder or the suction of the motor or the fan, um, you have a thrust that is greater than just the area that is represented. So you, you have two issues here. One is, um, should you always take the um, the wind assist propulsion system into account in the equipment number, regardless of whether it's B over 4 or, um, or not? And then if you do, which area do you take into account? The actual area? Or is it some augmented area that takes into account the, the kind of the, the effect of the rotor? Um, and and that's a open question. There's no obvious answer yet, and we need to agree as as an industry uh, what we actually need to do with that. Um, okay. Then we have uh, stability type issues, uh, which again uh, Daphne hinted at in the regulatory side of things. Um, there is obviously with uh, with the fitting of these, there would be a change in stability and a change in windage area. Um, and so in the regulatory side of things, when you're looking at stability approvals, do you add any healing moments because of the wind? Yes, because of, and it's a similar problem to the equipment number calculation. Is it the static um, surface area or is it the, the total healing moment if the equipment was actually active for those where they are active? Um, and do you add this to intact stability calculations? Do you also add this to damage stability calculations? And of course, in, in damage stability, we, we currently only have healing moments uh, when uh, it's a passenger ship, uh, and there is no provision at the moment to include this for cargo ships. So again, the, these are things that would be get missed in the regula regulatory side of things, but which actually are quite real issues uh, also in operation. There's the issue of icing which would add weight sort of high up this, um, with a higher center of gravity than the ship. And this also crosses into dropped object potential. So you have sails up on the deck and or, or some other equipment up on the deck and you have crew or passengers walking around uh, and there is the dropped object potential from the icing. And all of these would lead to poor or insufficient stability. Uh, so there, we, some further analysis is required at the moment. It's a little bit bespoke. Uh, on each individual item uh, uh, of equipment, what you what rules you apply, how you might perform the analysis, and, and whether this is actually sufficient to deal with the hazards that we have uh, sort of introduced by by adding these um, these pieces of equipment. Um, a fourth area is about motions and weather conditions beyond either the design limits of the wind assisted propulsion system itself or the vessel, uh, which has been enhanced, let's say, by the use of the, the wind-assisted propulsion system. So we might be talking about speed uh, or excessive speed or a vessel operating uh, in a particular, but outside its sort of design envelope or the, or the wind-assisted propulsion system itself um, experiencing very, very high wind loads by which then it should be uh, either stowed or it, sh it should be adjusted so that the loads are reduced. And these, of course, lead to performance issues. Excessive vibration we talked about, uh, which could be just um, whether it's just resonance or kind of other um, other issues, and um, which there's also a kind of fatigue component to that, and then which then in in the extreme case leads to damage. Um, and so, vessel the mitigation for this is that vessel operating parameters and limits need to be developed, need to be very clear, and then there would need to be procedures when these are exceeded. Um, and then a fifth issue is fire. Now you might be wondering what, what why is there a fire issue uh, with having um, watts on deck? First of all, there's an increase in fire load. Uh, so uh, some of the composites or some of the, particularly the soft sails are flammable, combustible, 
and depending on how much of this you put on board, uh, an example is is here actually in this picture. Just to give this is very extreme and this is AI generated. This gives you an idea of what if you went to the extreme, how much extra fire load you might have. And this is also a bridge visit uh, bridge visibility problem. But um, so this needs to be considered. Um, and of course, the provision of adequate firefighting equipment where you may not actually have had very much firefighting equipment on deck. Uh, and this needs to consider the number of uh, warps that you have, the coverage, and then the reach to the extremities. And this is a function of having long enough hoses to reach the top or the sides of uh, of of any uh, what uh, wind assisted propulsion systems we install, and then water pressure, uh, because the, the pressure at the hydrant or pre the, the pressure from the fire pump may not be enough to reach the very, very top. If you have a fire or you have a lightning strike or something at the very top of a system, we need to ensure that whatever a firefighting equipment we have on board is able to deal with, is able to reach uh, the extremities of the systems. Uh, and of course, then, added or allied to that is fire detection. Uh, we would hope that it's visually obvious, but you would need to ensure that fire detection can take place early. And then um, after that, it would be looking at adequate drainage for firefighting water if this is maybe not provided, depending on where some of this is located. So this is um, scuppers or uh, drainage holes and, and so on. We, we of course, we have learned from the past where this has been an issue where we have not been able to drain firefighting water quick enough in certain circumstances and that has led to um, some um, unwelcome circumstances. There are of course further impacts on escape routes and LSA, which are sort of fire related on the evacuation side of things. So if there is damage to uh, any of this uh, wind assisted propulsion equipment, will it fall on an escape route? Uh, will it block an escape route or will it damage uh, life-saving appliance launching equipment or let's if you have an MES where there, you have these tracks for the bowsing lines and so on will it damage uh, some of these uh, these things and then render parts of the LSA unusable or that you're not able to launch it so locate um, sort of positioning and, um, and and location of of the warps relative to escape routes and LSA needs to be considered um, we, we spoke um, earlier today about structural issues, so there is a vibration, uh, and this need, does need to be studied uh, for fatigue to the structure. Um, this is constant sort of load, as well as crew and passenger comfort. Um, in cases where uh, particularly the, the equipment is stored uh, or installed forward, as in the um, econoship, uh, the um, Econo wind, sorry, um, um, examples, then green water uh, and other more extreme environmental loads need to be considered. And then, of course, local structural details designed to avoid affecting sort of critical areas like hatch combings and so on. Um, we had, uh, I think, in some cases, there is the possibility for interference with deck operations i.e. mooring operations if uh, if you if the equipment is located close to um, uh, mooring um, mooring winches and so on uh, forward and aft of the vessel or cargo operations so if you have cranes on board or if you uh, as was discussed earlier if in the terminal um, they they need to reach uh, to 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 um, access cargo to access hatches and so on so there that of course needs to be checked and uh, even if it is designed properly, there's an operational component to this, and therefore procedures. Um, when is uh, the WAPS stowed? Where is it stowed? Uh, and, and so on, uh, need to be developed. Um, a common finding is about obstruction. So this obstruction uh, can be to do with um, bridge visibility is the most obvious one. There is radar visibility as well. Um, there's navigation light uh, visibility. This is more for cold regs and for other people to see your navigation lights. Um, cargo handling equipment, uh, helicopter winching areas, all of these need to be checked. And of course, appropriate mitigations introduced as necessary. And of course, particularly for helicopter winching areas uh, um, and also for um, uh, cargo handling equipment, the terminals and the helicopters or whatever, the information needs to be provided to them. Uh, so they don't have a surprise when when the vessel turns up. 
Um, as you have seen, in most cases, there is a significant change in air draft. Uh, so doc onboard documentation needs to be updated um, and crew awareness uh, needs to uh, be, um, the crew needs to be made aware and trained that this, and to remember that there is a change in air draft. Um, and this affects passage planning and, and things like that. Um, with the, uh, when you then now have all these objects which are quite tall on deck, uh, where there previously was a, an effectively open deck, then uh, there needs to be an evaluation for dropped object potential impact. So this is pieces of equipment or parts of the watts coming, uh, un, uh, coming loose and perhaps dropping onto the deck. Um, and prevention and mitigation, sorry, uh, to be introduced uh, as necessary. Um, then there is finally a common issue is about maintenance, where this is maybe required by crew. So then there is a working at height issue. So the, there, are, there are some working at height risks in the event that this is required and inspection and maintenance procedures to be developed, accounting for operators working at height. Um, now, we go to the specific, um, let's say, to the specific findings of each of the technology types. The For the row, row, uh, row, the rural passenger ferry, uh, it's a 156 meter vessel uh, with about 4,800 dead weight, um, sort of mid-sized, I guess. And it's a fixed installation of a single rotor sail on the center line at midships. And to avoid bearing damage, the rotor is generally always kept running at three to five RPM when not in use, rather than being completely static. And drainage is provided in the base and foundation, and the vessel has a second mast with navigation lights to compensate for blind spots. System and components are designed for a 25 year service life. And the table here is the summary of uh, the risk ranking of hazards identified. Um, and uh, you have most of them in the kind of moderate category, some low and less in the high. And so the specific findings is there is an, in there is an impact on stability. Um, those of you who are familiar with rural passenger ships, stability is quite an issue with Stockholm Agreement. And um, and so having a having a rotor sail so high up has some um, has has some uh, impact on that, and this needs to be considered in both the intact and damage stability calculations. But as we said before, it's unclear which healing moment should be used uh, in this evaluation, and that needs to be uh, made clear, and then also to be standardized, I, I guess, across all the requirements. There is uh, this hazard of accidental use of rotor alongside. So we heard later, earlier on, of course, that um, you can have, if this is is working or accidentally working on, alongside, either during maneuvering or when it's already moored, then there will be an additional, let's say, um, force potentially pulling the vessel uh, against the mooring lines or uh, away from the mooring lines. Um, and this is a risk that needs to be considered. Um, with the with this with the rotor, and to I guess to a lesser extent the suction wing, there is an enclosed space issue. Uh, if you need to go in for maintenance, there is an enclosed space issue. It is somewhat it is open, as in water can drain through the unit, but it is somewhat enclosed. And uh, there were reports of uh, that it does get very hot inside. And so again, it's about procedures um, about entry into what is effectively an enclosed space. Uh, it's not just um, something on deck. Um, with motors, um, there is uh, the possibility of electrical harmonics. Um, and so it's the same, I guess, for the, the VFDs on the on the suction wing, and this needs to be checked. Specific to, to this, there is the possibility of delamination of the composite rotor. So this is mitigated with inspection routines and detection equipment. Um, we move then quickly to the Conowind um, example. It's an 85 meter, four and a half thousand deadweight general cargo ship. Um, as as Renz pointed out, it's a suction wing concept. The rigid wing sail that rotates with the wind has some internal ventilation fans to increase lift. And on this vessel, there were two suction wing installations in the forward part of the vessel, port and starboard. Other configurations we were discussed, but they were not analyzed in detail in, in this hazard exercise. These 
suction wings may be tilted and folded as needed, but only the major risks with the folding systems were analyzed. We didn't look at that in too much detail. Um, and uh, an additional navigation mass uh, was installed forward of the suction wings. And then, of course, operation in ice or low temperature requires some special consideration because of the hydraulics involved in raising and lowering it. And also, um, yeah, there is this green water issue because it's very far forward. Again, it's kind of um, the uh, the distribution is you have some low, uh, some more moderate, and a few more in the high. The high is not necessarily to do with the more the technology, but more with the placement of it. So the forward position increases success, susceptibility to green water and increased acceleration, slamming a lot of stress, fatigue on structural and mechanical components. Um, so the mitigation is that to to have some load monitoring on the foundation. Um, some additional fatigue analysis for the structural design and thinking about selection of components, bearings and dampers to deal with water and um, acceleration and vibration. The forward position may also result in increased rudder use and forces with some consequential effects on maneuverability. So this is about getting the crew um, to be aware and trained in, in how this actually affects their maneuvering. And of course, also to let the pilots know if they if they need to to use um, to pilot the vessel when these things are in operation. Um, the arrangement of the suction wings uh, can limit forward visibility, and so while submittability remains, but then yeah, the crew needs to be um, fully trained on uh, to to look at both look out and look at whatever if it's a if it's a video camera and stuff to also look at that. Um, there are some risks from raising and lowering of the um, of the suction wing and uh, other simultaneous activities that may be happening in the area, mooring lines, anchoring. And so there, there are some operational procedures that need to be developed. And then finally, we come to uh, the Veer uh, vessel. This is a sort of, is an approval in principle for a concept. It has hydrogen fuel cells. Um, so this is a 152 TU primary wind propulsion vessel for unrestricted service. It has cargo cranes, it's not very, it's not clear in this in this profile picture. Um, it has three thousand two hundred square meters of soft sails with automatic automated sail handling, which can be unfurled in six minutes. Electrical rotation of the mast and rig uh, unit plus minus ninety degrees. It has a lightning protection system. This is something actually also common across all of the the systems that has to be considered. It has a mass load monitoring system and a permanent. It's permanently installed man aloft system for maintenance and inspection, but normal operations don't require work aloft because it's all automated. The sail design is not new necessarily. It's validated over 25 years of use on two large yachts and all the stress strain data, sail handling sequences, maintenance, etc., uh, do exist. But yes, there is, because the vessel also has a fuel cell and of course a hydrogen fuel system located aft, as well as batteries, um, for electrical power and backup propulsion. There was a hazard carried out for these, but it's not included as part of this report. However, um, because a, a hydrogen fuel ha means having some sort of um, hazardous area, as was kind of dealt with yesterday, both in the ABS presentation and also in in uh, uh, yeah, Ivan's pre presentation for Norled, um, this the location of the sails then encroaches into some of this, this hazardous area. So these are the specific findings at least for this one so the combustible soft sail presents challenges for adequate coverage by firefighting equipment and it is actually a significant fire load this requires some careful consideration of fire safety and of course the extent of the sail encroaches on the crane so cargo handling but this this hydrogen hazardous area um it needs to be carefully considered also in any sort of dispersion or explosion analysis so, and then the design mitigations need to be complemented by some HAZOP work and um, development of appropriate procedures. Um, failure of the control system, sort of mal either malfunction or loss of power for sales can lead to some significant risks when operating or maneuvering. And so it's recommended that a um, FMECA study is, is performed or carried out. Um, because the crane is installed on the sail mast, I think it's the forward sail mast, special attention needs to be paid to structural design, particularly fatigue analysis. And that is the 
um, is the kind of overview of the risk ranking of hazards. Now, my last slide is something that um, I debated whether or not to do. This is a comparison across all of the hazards. Now, before we go into that, the, the main conclusions for the wind hazard, there are no unresolvable, unresolvable risks identified that would prevent further uptake of wasps, uh, of wind assisted propulsion systems. There are many common issues, but there are some issues that are specific to placement and to technology type. And safeguards were identified, and some of them are regulatory requirements, but there are also stuff, um, some which are not covered by the regulations, either because they're just not part of the regulation at all, uh, it, or um, it could be part of the regulations, but there's some clarification that's required. Now, the reason what we what I tried to do here was to look at all the four studies that we have done for EMSA so far. Uh, so that's the biofuel, the ammonia, the hydrogen, and the wind. And to and to compare in, in the proportion of the hazard um, hazards in all the four categories, extreme, high, moderate, and low. Um, you don't see people doing this, uh, at least not very often, because each hazard is an exercise in and of itself. And you're looking at different things and they're not necessarily done to the same level of detail. And so a, a comparison like this is only indicative. And because what I didn't want also to to end up thinking about is that you know that the risk level of all four of these um, alternative power solutions was the same because they're not um so broadly um we see that the, the biofuels obviously have the lowest um, sort of risk broadly um and that is because it's very similar to the fuels we use today and we're very comfortable um, as an industry with them uh, and then uh with wind um or rather uh, so ammonia, sorry, let's start with ammonia. Ammonia sits in the opposite end. You see quite a lot of red, quite a lot of extreme uh, high uh, risks um, relative to, let's say, the, you know, the biofuel. So those those kind of stand in the two two extremes. Uh, interestingly, then we the wind and the hydrogen are somewhat similar in terms of proportion. You might argue that wind is potentially slightly lower. Um, because you don't see very much of the high uh, extremes, but in in some cases there is quite a lot of high. But so then, so wind is maybe slight, on a, on an overall risk level maybe slightly better than hydrogen. And so then the ranking is roughly ammonia is the most generally the most risky, hydrogen wind a little bit below that, and then uh, we get down to um, to biofuels. Over time, this perception might change, um, and as we become more comfortable, particularly with wind. Um, but that's just something to bear in mind. I didn't want to come away with people thinking that wind is very dangerous because it, that, that isn't really borne out by the results. So thank you very much. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much for having gone into depth with the, the assessments that have been performed on, on different ship designs and different uh, technologies. Uh, uh, tested in this exercise. Um, let's see if we have uh, questions at this stage. Of course, there is a lot of information to digest. Eh? That's, uh, as I said yesterday, uh, the studies are going to be available uh, on our website. This uh, workshop is going to be available uh, on our YouTube channel, so you can go back uh, and uh, go through it uh, at your own pace uh, after also you, you have read the, the studies where there is a wealth of information. But let's see if there are uh, first reactions around the table or comments or in the chat about these different scenarios that were uh, analyzed in the study. Edwin, too much information. It was. Uh, <laughs> we, we it was already done. summarized. It was already summarized. This, this we should have and... dosed differently, probably. Uh, <laughs> but it was uh, it was very interesting, and of course uh, there were common findings, uh, and uh, there are uh, things that probably needed to be looked at uh, 
further as well. And uh, again, uh, as EMSA, we will, uh, of course, uh, see what we can do also to, to, to continue looking into the different issues that uh, um, emerge. As I said, uh, we don't have the answers to all the questions. But what we can do, we can uh, offer a platform where knowledge is, is shared, and this is uh, the purpose of this uh, exercise. Um, so it's, uh, it's uh, clear that at this stage we have no questions following this uh, ACID uh, presentation. And then we move to the uh, other sharing of experience. This time it will be the ship owner perspective. Uh, we have with us uh, Victor Gibbon from uh, GIFMAR Offshore Services. He will as well uh, uh, provide uh, a different angle. You see, we tried to, to, to put forward the different points of view and different perspectives so that at the end all the pieces of the puzzle uh, uh, fall in place. So I, I give the, uh, the floor now to Victor with his presentation from a different perspective of wind assisting the profession. Now it's working, okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk a bit about our experience feedback. We had on board uh, very recently with our Roro vessel Canopy. Um, just a few introductions uh, about myself. Uh, I got a background of uh, naval architecture. Uh, then business development and project management uh, in uh, Louis Dreyfus Armateur in France. Then I moved in 2021 as a project manager for Canopy Shipbuilding for GIFMAR Offshore Services. And since uh, 2023, since the delivery of the vessel, I'm the, the manager of the subsidiary, so-called GIFMAR Guyane, that is the owner and manager of the vessel. So this vessel is uh, committed to uh, our client, Ariane Group, that is the, the, the builder of the European Space Launcher Ariane 6. So the, 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 the goal of the vessel is to carry the different part of the rocket from European port from Bremen, Rotterdam, Le Havre and Bordeaux until uh, the French spaceport in uh, French Guiana in Kourou. So the vessel is committed on a 15 years contract with uh, its client uh, Arian Group. And uh, we have the chance and the opportunity to have a typical trade wind pattern for, uh, that is very well suited for wind assisted propulsion. The vessel is hybrid, it's not a fully sailed vessel. Uh, it is hybrid for just a simple reason. Uh, basically, we have a, a big industrial client with uh, in excess of 10,000 people in Europe and in uh, South America. And they want to achieve a goal in terms of reduction of uh, greenhouse gas, but they also want to have their goods in uh, due time uh, on each side of the Atlantic. That's uh, something very important for their organization. So when there is not sufficient wind, we also use our diesel engine. <clears throat> a few words about the vessel. So it's a Roro vessel with a length of uh, 121 meters and a beam of 22 meters. The main propulsion is ensured by uh, two main engine, two main diesel engine of uh, 3,400 kilowatts. We have a wind-assisted propulsion made of four ocean wings made by IRO. Each of them uh, have a surface of uh, 363 uh, square meter. Uh, the vessel integrates as well a routing and monitoring device uh, provided by DIS, uh, also a French company. And the vessel is designed for uh, a speed of 16.5 knots. Uh, something to, to notice as well is that the integration of the wind-assisted propulsion 
has been done since the very early stage of the design. Um, I will uh, continue this introduction with a, a short video that has been done during the, the, the first seat reel uh, we have made uh, this summer in France. So uh, a, a few dates, a few information about the planning of this project. So November 2020, shipbuilding contract uh, with our uh, partner uh, shipyard Neptune uh, Marine Project in the Netherlands. In December 2022, delivery without the wings. In between uh, January to July 2023, we've made a couple of uh, trips uh, to Guyana without the wings. And by July 2023, we have installed our wings uh, in Caen, in France. By October 2023, uh, we had the final christening ceremony and the maiden voyage to Guyana with the wings. We just ended uh, this trip uh, just a few days ago, and I'm here to give you some uh, insight and some uh, feedback from this trip. So, a um, few considerations. If I uh, would give some advice to uh, someone else doing the same job, I would say, uh, first of all, take some consideration uh, at the very, very early stage of the design. What is your trade route? What is the wind distribution? What is the vessel service speed? You have to think about that very carefully. There is the design speed on one side, and there is the actual speed. Most of the time, I, I would say 99% of the time in the world, vessels are designed for a speed they will never achieve because it's most of the time too quick, too fast. Um, then there is the acceptance and capability of the shipyard to manage integration of wind-assisted propulsion. It's something very important to work and in end with two different people, the ship, yard on one side and the wind manufacturer on the other side. Uh, the expected return on invest, of course, and uh, the cargo operation compa compatibility in all the ports the vessel will go. <clears throat> um, we've made the choice of uh, Aero Ocean Wings uh, for four different reasons. Uh, the first one is uh, safety and automation. Uh, we have a, a good level of, sa of safety with this kind of equipment, and there is no additional crew required um, to, 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 to maneuver these uh, wings. There is instantaneous deep power uh, for safety. It's an important uh, feature for us. Uh, the performance versus size uh, with that kind of uh, hard wings we have twice the power uh, compared to classic sails, so there is less footprint occupied on the vessel. We have a passive running, and there is no significant power requirement to maneuver the wings. And we have a quite large operational range as uh, there is some trust available since uh, a very low uh, apparent wing angle. The, the, the functioning principle uh, is, is quite simple. Actually, we, we prefer to say wing rather than sails because the, there is a complete analogy with uh, wings from an aircraft. Uh, we have one main element. Uh, we have a secondary element that is, uh, could be compared to a flap on an aircraft. 
and uh, both those elements are uh, can move um, around the vertical axis uh, to to adjust uh, wing orientation and camber adjustment. And at the end, the the, the membrane that is a uh, doing the, the wing is, uh, can be f uh, is foldable when we go back to port. So the automation of the system is as followed. We have some uh, sensors uh, monitoring wind speed and wind direction in the mast. We have inside the wheelhouse uh, an integrated computer that calculates the best wing orientation. And finally, we have built-in uh, actuators uh, that are just below the, the boom that uh, will adjust uh, the wing incidence and the camber. So a few experience feedback uh, from operation and maintenance now. Um, so on the, the ship building and wind integration, I would emphasize this again, but uh, uh, that kind of uh, project is a three-party project. Uh, shipyard, ship owner, and uh, wind manufacturer. It's impossible to, 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 to work without a, a full commitment of each party to, to share the risk. You need to have, as well, a clear interface, uh, an interface in the scope in between a shipyard and a wind-assisted propulsion provider. And, uh, and I will emphasize on that, you have uh, to have a clear vision of when, where, and how you will install the wind-assisted propulsion very early in the, the design phase. On our side, uh, we've made the choice to install those wings in, uh, in Caen, in Normandy, in France, uh, for a few reasons. Uh, local logistics, uh, once the, the wing is assembly, uh, it's a, a pretty big structure, it's difficult to transport. Uh, the best is to bring the vessel very close to the, the wing factory. On our case, it was just uh, one kilometer uh, away and it was already uh, exceptional logistic to bring the, the wings from the factory to the key side. Uh, you need available key, you need available key strength, uh, you need to find uh, the right crane-edge company with the suitable assets. Uh, we are not talking about uh, cherry pickers, we are talking about uh, uh, 800 tons mobile crane, so it begins to be a quite big crane, so it's not so easy to find everywhere in, uh, in Europe. Uh, then uh, you have to prepare your operation, you have to prepare the methodology, uh, the procedure a long time in advance, and finally, like all operations at sea, you have to find the, the right weather condition as the wing cannot be lifted with, uh, when there is some wind. Uh, then about the choice of the, the seat reel uh, after wing installation, it's not so easy actually. Uh, first of all, you need to agree on a seat reel program and performance target, uh, I would say before contract signing. Then uh, the seat reel area and period of the year is quite important. When you go at sea with that kind of vessel, uh, the, the, the cost for the ship owner are quite important. Uh, just in terms of fuel, you are already at uh, 10K per, per day, and then you add the, 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 the price of the vessel, so you are, you are quickly to 20, 30, uh, kilo euro per day of uh, seat reel. So you, you cannot do seat reel for years, but for sure you need to do them. Uh, for the seat reel area, you need to find a place where there's some wind, of course, uh, but also where it's possible to, to sail without obstacle, without, um, uh, without any uh, fishing or laser boat uh, close by you. So uh, it's something to, to, to watch carefully and you have to, to watch as well the, the period of the year you will do that. Then talking about the, the performances during c trials. Um, actually during the c trial we've made all the tests uh, with beam wind and we have very quickly uh, demonstrated good performances in line with the contract 
basically, each time we hold the wing, uh, we have a gain of approximately two knots. Uh, the ship speed is increasing quite quick, quickly. It's quite impressive, but I'm talking about something like uh, less than 10 minutes to achieve the, these two knots uh, increment. And when you so once you have gained two knots, uh, you can decrease uh, um, your shad burn position and come back to your uh, previous ship speed. And there you achieve a significant uh, fuel saving at constant speed, I would say approximately 30%. We try as well to do uh, free sailing speed. Uh, I mean by that we switch off both main engine and we turn uh, our blade propellers in their feathering um, mode, meaning the, the, the blades are, uh, are aligned with the, the, the streamline of the, of the water. And doing that, we have achieved uh, just below 10 knots stabilizer uh, for more than 10 minutes with uh, 20 knots of true wind speed. So, uh, saving and demonstrating during sea trial is one thing, and real saving in day-to-day -day sailing is something different. Um, the real saving depends on the weather condition you will find all along your journey. Uh, to have a good uh, idea of the saving, you need a huge statistical sample in order to, to have a good track record and to, 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 to have the, the, the right ideas. Uh, on our side, we have just one trip and one trip back to Guyana, so it's quite small. And uh, so after this trip, nevertheless, we've tried to um, estimate uh, the saving we had. It's not so easy, actually. Uh, first of all, we, we've decided to measure, to measure our consumption only with our day tanks. For one reason, uh, the day tank measurement uh, cannot lie. Uh, with flow meter, sometimes it's the, the, the readings are uh, a bit complicated to interpret. Then, uh, to compare the, 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 the fuel consumption, to us, there is three ways. Uh, the first one is theoretical consumption, so derived from the tank tank, sorry, the tank test result with no wing and no routing. The second one is to compare with uh, the trip we've made without the wings, so from January to July. And the, 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 the third approach uh, is uh, to do a simulation or replay of the sailing uh, with a um, uh, numerical trink with no wink, no routing, but integrating reanalysis weather data set. It's what we are doing at the moment. Uh, so far, so only one month's experience, so it's pretty short. On the westbound trip, uh, it was supposed to be our best trip, our best uh, leg, uh, because the, the, we have there the, the, the perfect trade wind. But uh, when we left uh, Europe in, uh, in October, the high pressure was unusually south, and we have no wind at all during uh, 15 days. So unluckily, it's very difficult to, to interpret a result on that one. Uh, this being said, on the East Boone trip, uh, we have demonstrated uh, savings around 25%. Uh, with a few days, uh, so we were selling at approximately 10 knots, and during a few days, we have a consumption below 5 uh, cubic a day. Uh, and some days, uh, the wind was uh, sufficient to achieve targeted speed uh, without main engines, and then new challenges appear for us. <clears throat> uh, another uh, experience was the, the weather routing. Um, the, 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 the weather routing was something very new for us. Uh, um, so we, we've made some training with the, the crew. Uh, and the crew, uh, day to day, was downloading um, weather statistics, weather uh, forecast. Uh, and made some uh, strategic decision uh, on the way to take. Uh, 
Uh, another point is the ill management uh, to be implemented for comfort uh, on board. Uh, so using that kind of wings, uh, you have uh, most of the time two or three degrees of, uh, of ill. It's not a surprise uh, during sea trials, it's perfectly uh, tolerable, but during a, a full trip, uh, it's better to, to, to compensate this ill uh, by ballasting uh, in order to, to come back to, to neutral ill. Um, and then, uh, due to the, the weather routing, uh, the last time we have decided to, to increment our weather routing every two hours. And so, uh, every two hours, we have a change of load on the main engine due to the, the, the wings action. So, it was pretty complicated for the, the, the people inside the engine room. So, it's something to that we will manage, most probably not on two hours time frame, but most, most probably on six hours now. So as a conclusion, uh, the system have uh, demonstrated a significant capacity to, to reduce fuel consumption during sea trials and even during the, the, the first uh, run trip. We need now a long track record uh, to definitely uh, validate those savings. Um, we expect to have better performances the next time during the westbound trip, most probably in February 2024. Uh, we think as well we have a, a, a broad way to enhance performances by fine-tuning uh, the wing settings. It's like on any sailing ships, uh, from the day it is delivered to uh, the day you are going to, 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 to sell at uh, America's Cup, there is a, a, large, uh, a large way to increase the performances. Um, then uh, there is a big question for us is when we are selling at a super echo speed like 10 knots like we did the last time, is there a way to uh, use only the wings and switch off uh, the, the, the managing? It's something that we are going to investigate with a flag and BV. Uh, and to me, the, uh, now the, the, the main challenges is uh, how to maintain the, the system during the, the, the vessel lifetime. So uh, thank you very much for your patience and uh, I'm now ready for your questions. Thank you very much. And uh, again, uh, here uh, there is clearly another success story where it comes out uh, again the engagement of all parties involved because only through cooperation and collaboration, I noted that, that, that you said that you needed the cooperation and collaboration to share the risks. Because as all first movers, of course, uh, you need to identify the risks and then uh, being able to, to manage with any mitigating measure you need in place. So um, very, very interesting indeed. And I have a question from the chat for you. They ask if the uh, Bureau Veritas state of the art uh, mooring program uh, is uh, in use for this vessel. So, so, sorry, can you repeat uh, which program from the Bureau of Vitas? They ask if, on the side of the vessel, the BV, the Bureau of Veritas, state-of-the-art mooring program. I, I've seen in the meantime, it's, it's a software that they have developed as Bureau of Veritas. I'm not aware about this software, but uh, I, I will... Uh investigate uh, deeply. The, the, the vessel is classed by BV, the, the wings have been uh, uh, designed uh, under supervision of BV as well, integration of BV uh, with BV as well on board, but I'm not aware about uh, this uh, typical software. I, I, I will ask. Thank you very much. Uh, no, I, as I said yesterday, of course, the role uh, of, uh, of class and recognized organizations with all these projects that uh, involve first movers uh, is crucial together with the, with the flag state that has to, to, to really play a substantial role for, for the fact that, that uh, yet we don't have uh, uh, agreed standards uh, in, in, in place. So that's clear that there is a lot of learning by doing uh, in, in this phase. Uh, but as I said, 
It's quite reassuring that there are success stories uh, that demonstrate that there are business cases. Of course, each case is different, needs to be thoroughly analyzed, but uh, there are uh, solutions uh, that can uh, be implemented clearly. So, uh, do we have any questions for this other uh, uh, very interesting presentation that was shared with us? Yes, please, Frédéric. Yes, I have a question because you mentioned during your presentation that uh, uh, you have to take into account the cargo operations. But uh, when you see the, the location of the various uh, wings, uh, are they foldable or uh, you can operate in between the, the frames? No, actually, the, 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 the membrane of the wings is uh, foldable, so once uh, the, the wings are lowered, there is only uh, two masts uh, surrounded by one corner, and uh, this structure is, uh, it is still possible to rotate this uh, structure. So at the end, uh, the obstacle for cargo operation is just the, 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 the section, the size of the mast. Um, so basically, on our case, uh, we load the vessel uh, in one port in Europe using our raw ramp, and the uh, rest of the time we are doing low low operation, and uh, so far we have absolutely no issues with um, uh, port terminals and dockers uh, that are uh, using their cranes and uh, going in between. Uh, the, 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 the mast to, to load the, the, the goods we take on board. Thank you very much. Very, uh, very clear. Then I think there was a bit of a misunderstanding on, on the name Ariane, because Ariane is also the name of the software or BV, and they saw Ariane on, on the vessel, while your Ariane is Ariane 6, which is the, the mission of ESA. So there was a bit of, of confusion there. Uh, okay, let's see uh, uh, where we stand, if there are any questions in this case uh, for uh, our presenter. It's... Uh, uh, It's uh, not there. There is a comment uh, from ABS uh, where they say that um, in, in the report that has been published, uh, there is a useful methodology for predicting the propulsion fuel consumption savings from WAPS in the appendix of the report. So there is also this uh, small tool that, 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 that you could use uh, in, in your uh, assessments. Um, I don't see any more questions, so I think we are moving to the uh, summary presentation of what has happened today and what, uh, what were the, the, the highlights, uh, let's say, of the day in relation to wind-assisted propulsion in the perspective of uh, of the study, of course, and I have uh, Mercedes Garcia Orillo from uh, our team that will uh, deliver this uh, last uh, presentation. Mercedes, the floor is yours. Thank you, Manuela, and good morning to everyone. Okay, as we have uh, heard during the morning, a uh, win is. Uh, Wind is not new for the shipping building industry. We, we have uh, sailing ships, but this is a different concept. We are using uh, wind to supplement the main engine, so not as a main propulsion system, but as a supplement for the main engine. So the conclusions that we gather from the study regarding sustainability is that the wind is uh, sustainable and renewable energy, so they can be used uh, to reduce the greenhouse gases emission for the ship and also other uh, emissions as the noise emissions. No? But if the system, as I mentioned, is used to reduce the main engine power, we mean that we will keep the same speed of the ship, but uh, we reduce the engine load and use the wind uh, propulsion to supplement and to 
obtain the speed that we need. However, the amount of greenhouse gases that we can uh, reduce from using this type of uh, system, these WOPs, depend on many, many factors. Depends on, on the ships themselves and also the roofs, the, the, the different equipment. So it's not easy to give a number of the, about the amount of uh, reductions that we are going to obtain using this. However, there are options to obtain the maximum efficiency from both. And one is the optimization of the routes. But here we have to take into account that we cannot increase too much the, the length of the route because then we are uh, doing the contrary. So we need to uh, get a balance between the route more beneficial in terms of wind, but not to uh, make this route too, too long. So we, can, uh, we have to consume more. Again, we have uh, different uh, technologies and there are uh, different tools that uh, the manufacturers provide to calculate these uh, routes uh, optimizations. So the final, let's say, conclusions or recommendation is uh, that a specific analysis is required considering the different aspects, uh, the ships and the, the roofs and, and the equipment they fix on board. And uh, there is also another aspect that's very important regarding sustainability to, to obtain the maximum beneficial for the use of the EWAS. We need uh, training uh, very well, uh, people very well trained. The crew, it's uh, training of the crew is crucial, um, especially when the was is not uh, fully automatized. We have seen that the efficiency of the system depends on the angle of the, of the wind impacted in the equipment. So it's important that the, the people, the crew, know how to uh, manage these uh, things and, um, and train. It's crucial in that sense. If the system is not fully automatized, if it is automated, then it's not so important, but uh, it's an important element. Regarding sustainability, we have seen that not all type of uh, was uh, are um, suitable for all type of ships. But we have, uh, again, we have uh, concluded that at least for each type of ship, we have one type of was that can be found suitable. It is because we need the deck space and uh, for fix the, the equipment. And uh, not all ships have sufficient uh, container ships uh, they have problems with the deck space. Uh, small ships are also, um, they have also problems with the deck, so perhaps the type of ships need a special uh, uh, study on the best uh, type of was to be uh, suitable for them. Another uh, issue related with the sustainability, suitability is the weight. But in this case, uh, if you remember in our previous studies in, in ammonia and hydrogen, we saw that we need to increase the weight of the bunker. Here, this increase in, in the weight of the, of the wast, of the equipment, is not so big. So the impact on the cargo capacity of the ship is not going to be crucial. However, it has an impact in the reinforcement of the deck and uh, could be that affect also to the cargo capacity. Another problem regarding the suitability is um, are the problems regarding to visibility, you know, the interaction with other elements in, in deck, the cargo operations. Um, that if the okay, it could be a problem uh, regarding the some types of, of ships that they are not uh, suitable for some kind of equipment. However, we saw that most installation of what are retrofits and we have not seen in the study major uh, barriers to that. Regarding availability, okay, here is not only the availability of the wind, but it's also the availability of the equipment itself. In this moment, we don't see any problem with the, the non-availability in a short term for taking this uh, solution on board. Regarding the availability of wind, as we saw in the previous presentation, 
it depends on the route. So again, here to gain the maximum uh, benefits of the work, there is a need to, to have a budget optimization. And in this case, um, we perhaps um, it's recommended to um, to have a chat with the chapter or between chapter and ship owners when we they are deciding uh, the the type of uh, equipment to be installed. The cost analysis. This was a chapter very very complicated because as uh, Julius was mentioning this morning, it was very very difficult to make a comparison in or uh, an estimation of the savings be between uh, because of the between the different ships and system and because of the uncertainty of the data. You know, the results are very sensitive of the initial cap capes, uh, the assumptions that we make for the different type of ships. So uh, this um, has an impact on the results. And uh, so our recommendation here is to do an, an an analysis uh, case by case. We try to present as much as data as possible in the in the study, making comparison entre different type of uh, systems, uh, new buildings and retrofits, and to present you an an idea, let's say, an estimation. It's only an indication because there are not uh, fully percent data available. They are very few ships equipped with this technology, so the cost analysis has been, been very difficult. However, we have uh, some conclusions for this cost analysis, and we see that ships with, um, with high share of uh, auxiliary engines for consumption, they, are more to, they have less uh, savings, let's say, because they are using the fuel for, uh, not for the main engine. And uh, as I mentioned, the difficulties are um, because of the type of system, the number of, uh, because for one, even for one type of ship, we, you can decide to go for one, two, or three, four different number of equip equipment. So it's, it's not uh, easy to make uh, an estimation. Again, if you have clear idea of the routes, you can uh, do a better uh, estimation of the cost, uh, the cost that you are going to, to say. But if you don't have this uh, route, then it will be difficult because you don't know how, if you are going to face some winds, certain winds or, or no wind at all. So this is something that it's also considered as um, something uh, it cannot be um, predicted, let's say. So uh, it's, uh, yeah, there are incertainties. Uh, it's so it makes it very difficult to analyze real the cost, uh, the savings of the installation of the equipment. However, the, the savings or the, the cost, we we'll expect that the, regarding the savings, we expect that the return on the investment will be shorted with the time because the systems will be less uh, co less uh, cost, uh, cost less and uh, also uh, as the, in the increase of because of the increase of new fuels alternative fuels will be more expensive than the conventional fuels so we expect that with the time they they will be a shortened in the uh, recovery period for the investment so finally, the recommendation in the cost analysis is that uh, it's needed to do an assessment case by, by case because it's, uh, it depends on so many factors that it's not possible to give you a clear indication on the savings. Regarding rules and regulations, we have seen that the, the installations uh, of, uh, of what can introduce additional considerations for safety and performance of the things, and these, uh, con these considerations are not under the current uh, regulations. So, however, all the major classification societies have published rules and guides for this type of uh, ships or installations on board ships. Uh, there is a need on a common uh, approach between flag administration and class society. And there is some recommendations that we uh, we explain in the in the in the in the study. 
related to the regulations. One is that uh, there is a need to develop specific guidelines for the navigation, safety navigation of the WAS. There is a need also to work on the IMO code on impact stability and damage stability criteria, because uh, it's important to adapt this kind of, these this codes to the use of uh, WAS on board ships. It's important also to investigate uh, if the IMO standards for maneuverability are applicable to this uh, to the WAST. And as we discussed this morning, it's also need to develop a standardization methodology uh, for a full scale evaluation and verification of the energy efficiency index on board the ships and uh, clarify the categorization of the WAST if they are under no conventional, conventional or hybrid propulsion and uh, all the implications that they have. Regarding six, six rigs and safety, I think that Edwin more or less uh, go through all the, all the problems that we face, but the main concerns are uh, stability, maneuverability that need to be carefully evaluated, but there are another concerns uh, regarding the interaction between the WAPs and other uh, uh, structures on board the, on board the ships. No, the bridge visibility, uh, the helicopter landing areas, cargo operation and handling system. So there is a need to evaluate carefully this. And in case of any doubt, our recommendation, or the recommendation is to contact the flag administration. More things that are considered in the study uh, are, but the, this is not a full list. Uh, if you want to go through all the recommendations regarding risk access and safety, you can go and read the, the report, the study. But we have also concerned fire safety, as uh, it was explained by Edwin. You have to reconsider the, the, the fire load system in deck, because you can have uh, fires on the systems that uh, you need to be sure that you can cover. Dropping of uh, elements from WASP is also another uh, risk, not only for the system that can be foldable, but also for uh, normal uh, systems or uh, normal functioning of the system. If something is dropping, it can uh, impact in the deck on some equipment or even in the crew. So it's also another uh, aspect uh, to take into account regarding safety. Maintenance is also something to take into account and uh, all most of all, regarding the, for the crew, because they have to work at height, so it will be also another uh, uh, issue to take into account. Icing on was uh, can increase the the weight, the, the yes, the weight of the of the system, and can also drop on the deck. So it's also important to prevent icing. Here uh, we say that the, we know that there are special coatings to, to be applied or other solutions are to keep the system in function to avoid ice. But ice is something that could be perhaps be important to analyze in ships in routes with uh, ice. Vibra vibration service also, it's important as it was mentioned to avoid any interference between the equipment and the main engine. But at the end, as conclusions, we see that uh, wind assistant propulsion uh, has a potential for the shipping industry. However, we see that the, this potential use depends on the different uh, ship segments and the uh, WASP technologies. However, we see that uh, as wind is free you know, it's, and is uh, suitable as a sort of sustainable energy, a wind assistant has the potential to reduce greenhouse gases emission. However, there is a limitation nowadays in the availability of uh, these systems, but uh, we cannot consider that as a sort of barrier for the wider adoption. The saving can be, as I mentioned, um, determined based on the numerical or uh, actual measurements, but this exact uh, reduction potential is difficult to estimate. 
It depends on the, yes, as we already mentioned, the ship, the type of uh, was the number, the route, uh, and many factors. So it's not, uh, it's not easy to make an estimation, and it's not easy to compare results from the different segments. Even for the same ship, in a, because we see also here the, um, the sustainability of the winds, let's say. So sometimes you have, as we saw in the previous presentation, in one way you have no savings and the other way you have more savings because of the wind. Because depending on the season, you can have more or less. And uh, also, finally, well, one of the final crew, as I already mentioned, is important. The risk analysis. Uh, well, we conclude that the, the mo may, main concern are related to stability, maneuverability, and the interference with the deck operations and uh, other equipment on deck uh, for the ship uh, current operation. However, and we also see that to facilitate uh, the incorporation of the worst into the market or in the shipping business, there is a need to review the current uh, regulatory framework. However, at the end, overall, no major risks has been identified that cannot be resolved. So we can conclude that this type of equipment are uh, ready or are suitable and have a potential to be used on board ships. However, if you want to have more info on, on the different type of uh, was and, and the results of the, our study, go to our web page and you can have here all the information. Thank you. Thank you, Mercedes, for this exhaustive summary that in a way allowed us to focus again a bit on what is the outcome of the study. Um, it's now time, I would say, for some uh, final remarks. Uh, I don't know if uh, the consortium would like to, to add a few, few words uh, at the end of this uh, presentation of these two new studies. René? Yeah, first of all, I would say uh, thank you for, for a well arranged uh, uh, conference here by, by EMSA. It has been a pleasure to participate from, from our side. We have enjoyed it uh, very much. And I think uh, we have, uh, the last two days, we have seen uh, two attractive solutions now being uh, put forward to the shipping market. And there's uh, an, a good overview of all the risks associated with the use of these technologies. And good inspiration for, for ship owners to, to look into when they have new projects where they're going to to consider those uh, those technologies there. Um, so I think uh, I will also thank also our cooperation partners here for, for participating, all those who have uh, contributed to to the risk assessment. Uh, without those, uh, we will not be able to, to do this kind of uh, study here and put so much uh, value into it. So thank you from my side. And I turn to the participants uh, then. Anybody who would like uh, to, 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 to provide uh, any kind of, of, of feedback to us uh, is welcome. And now it's the moment uh, on this uh, first part of the workshop on the two studies. Yes, please. Please. Thank you. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, very, very well done, of course, and a very comprehensive report, uh, also ABS. Um, you mentioned the cameras uh, could be allowed to overcome the visibility, and then that there should be a common approach by, by flag. How does that work in terms of EMSA, flag states, uh, IMO? How, how, how is that organized? Because we are facing with the same issues, and some flag states say, yeah, sure, do not whatever you want, but we are a little bit more flexible for these kind of innovations, and the others, they are a little bit more restrictive on that. How, how does EMSA see that? How, how do you move around in that field? Our role, uh, it's uh, a role of a facilitator. Uh, so you know that uh, the standards are uh, developed at IMO. It's uh, where uh, today we don't have our IMO representative, but there is a lot ongoing there. So uh, until you don't have rules and regulations, 
Our role is to act as facilitator. That's why we are at the side of the member states and we offer platforms where they can discuss and share their experience. And uh, we have also the role uh, to harmonize uh, through guidance. Guidance are not compulsory. That's a bit the, the, the let's say, it's, uh, it, they are recommendations. And that's where uh, our role is. And normally we also follow a bottom-up approach where we associate where the experience is. So all our guidances normally have a, a table that supports where also the industry sits, the class sits. It's a very complicated game. As I said at the beginning, in this moment, uh, we have uh, a lot also of different contexts where also the flag states are trying to share the experience that they are having with the first movers. Because as long as you have full control, as it happened, for instance, with Norway, when you are flag state and port state that coincide, in a way, it's easier. But shipping has uh, no borders. So these cases are not always uh, the ones that happen in real life. And that's why you have also this approach of green corridors now, exactly to make sure that all the different parties involved that have uh, a, a role in it can really agree a, a way forward. But it's, uh, there is a lot ongoing, and I think all of us are learning by doing in this moment. But probably, Santiago, you can also provide a bit of perspective because there is the issue of uh, SOLAS and so on. Please. Thank you, Manolo. I think you have, you have presented it very well and very clearly. I think we, as, as apologies for my voice, as you can see, I'm a bit cold. Um, but I think our role is, is to provide technical guidance whenever we see that there are gaps or when we receive requests from the European Commission mainly, but also sometimes uh, from the member states through our administrative board. As you can imagine, there are a lot of uh, potential issues no, that could be standardized and, and could be studied. We have, for example, in the past made the studies um, when, when actually Manuela was the head of safety on the fires of rural passenger ships that actually ended up in uh, modifying and upgrading the standards for fire safety on rural passenger ships at the IMO, similar things with the damage stability for passenger ships. But in principle, um, these are initiatives that have to, must have some sort of request because we, have, we don't have unlimited resources, of course, as, as you can imagine. In any case, uh, with the guidance uh, which are not let's say, hard law, which is soft law. Uh, we meet with uh, our counterparts, experts in member states, in the industry, and we try to fill a gap where we see that, you know, that the industry and the authorities can benefit from it. And I take advantage now to make publicity for this afternoon, where we are going to present our guidance on the, on the battery systems on, on ships. So I hope you can all stay here with us this afternoon to, to see this, this new guidance from EMSA. And, and, and this is what we can do. And this is, this is the way we are trying to support the development of the, of the greenhouse gases uh, efforts from a safety perspective, which is the, not the only, the only one, of course. But as you said, it's, it's, it's essential, it's sine qua non. No? So it is essential to have. Thank you, Santiago, thank you. for complimenting. I have Edwin. Edwin, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. And, and I will speak here not as the consortium or the contractor, but just as a long-term observer at the IMO. Um, normally, when you make <clears throat> when you make an exception to the rules uh, at the IMO for anything that covers SOLA, so in this case, visibility, so um, SOLA Chapter 5, um, the flag state involved has to submit uh, some information to uh, the IMO system, to GSIS. And all this information is recorded uh, and for people to then look at it if they want to refer to it. The problem is this IT solution that we have at the IMO uh, makes searching for stuff very difficult. So you, it takes quite a lot of effort to find if anyone else has 
given an exemption to the same sort of thing that you're looking for. Uh, so it's not very user friendly, and therefore, and and flag states traditionally have been very reluctant to give, uh, let's say, exemptions, particularly for something like bridge visibility. Of course, now you have autonomous ships, which where <laughs> there is no lookout, uh, and it's it becomes everything is is sort of uh, digitalized and and based on cameras. So maybe. Uh, um, a government, in this case, potentially the Netherlands, because that's where you're located, Rens, um, could highlight the fact that this is needed or being done. So I think there is, as when I did a search, there's at least one example of one flag state giving exemption for, uh, for on the bridge visibility with uh, using cameras, for example, and, and the process that was followed. Just so other flag states are more aware then this is happening. It doesn't mean that they will immediately say yes or that they will kind of, um, you know, kind of follow the same process, but it does get them thinking. So that's maybe what I could offer for consideration. Thank you. Santiago. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Edwin, for this clarification. I think it was, it was very good. I think the, the in principle, the for exemptions, the basic way forward to, to avoid lack of harmonization is actually if there is an exemption that is being generally provided for a certain topic, uh, it, be, it should become a standard as such. So in a, in a certain moment, it should stop becoming an exemption that each flag state is applying by default, mm -hmm. and, and it should give the step to become an amendment as, as it's happening with some other projects where we are involved, for example, with the oversized light boats you know, that actually most of the big passenger ships are carrying lifeboats, which are not solas. No, they are using this uh, uh, this exemption. Well, in this case, is the is the alternative design, but actually the exemption became the stand became the standard. So, at a certain moment, the the exemption should not go through. Should become a standard as such officially to be more transparent, as Edwin said, to the to the full shipping community. As I had already uh, the opportunity to say on different occasions, in different fora, in different contexts, uh, knowledge sharing at this phase is crucial. If you don't share the knowledge that you have acquired because you think that you are protecting your business, you are creating a damage to the industry. We need to share as much as possible because it's the only way to kick off and learn the lessons that are there to be learned, especially in this first phase. Uh, so uh, I think we are at the end of this uh, first uh, part of the workshop, also because we are going to reconvene at two with uh, the uh, last module of this workshop where I will leave you in the capable hands of Lender Ball and Santiago in Cabo for the more safety related issues that are as important as the sustainability issues that have been the focus uh, uh, in this uh, first part of the workshop. I want only to, to give you my final take of this workshop. Uh, it is uh, essential that uh, we listen to each other with an open mind because we are at uh, uh, a crossroad where uh, sharing information, digesting and exchanging openly questions and answers is the only way that can support informed decision making that it's needed now. Uh, you know that uh, we are here, we apply an open door policy, so knock on our door if you need us as flag, as port, as operator, as industry, as class, and uh, we will see you with the, the 
last two studies that are about to kick off with our consortium on um, nuclear power for shipping and synthetic fuels in one year time. Again, to share. Thank you again for having been with us. Have a nice uh, lunch and see you at two o'clock with the last module on the uh, batteries guidance, uh, on the two studies on biofuel bunkering and the safety of ammonia as a fuel. Thank you again for having been with us. For the once year lunch upstairs uh, as yesterday, so uh, enjoy these 50 minutes of break and see you again at 2. Ja, Matthias, ja, hi. Warte, ich habe mal eine Frage. Oh. Ja, ich höre dich noch. Gut. Ich würde gerne einmal ähm, eine Frage loswerden bezüglich Planerprobe von 
ähm, Lithium-Batteriesystem. Wir haben in den Rules ähm, in der Regel, dass die Lithium. Ja. Ja. Ich war jetzt die letzten zehn Minuten da, weil ich dachte, um zwei Uhr geht das mit dem Batteriesystem weiter. Aber das ist erst um drei Uhr. Ach so. Ach, okay. Dann will ich da mal rausgehen. Warte mal.
Good afternoon. Um, let me break the silence in the room. Uh, thank you very much for uh, being with us uh, for the uh, last module uh, of the workshop on alternative fuels and uh, uh, solutions for uh, power for shipping. <coughs> Um, I am uh, Leonard Ball. I am the head of department at EMSA for uh, safety, security uh, and surveillance. Uh, why is there a change of guard uh, halfway or towards the end of the, the workshop? Uh, because also from the uh, safety perspective, uh, we looked very uh, closely at the um, alternative fuels that are being developed. You know that um, from an environmental point of view, uh, uh, for example, ammonia and hydrogen are very uh, clean and promising fuels, uh, but they, they are also the fuels with the highest uh, safety concerns. Uh, and I think it's good to, to look at alternative fuels from an environmental perspective, but it's also our duty to facilitate a uh, safe, and positive uptake of alternative fuels by the shipping industry. So we cannot neglect the safety challenges that uh, alternative fuels uh, have. And that's why also our department is involved uh, to look particularly uh, at uh, safety challenges of the alternative fuels and what this uh, entails for using them uh, on board vessels. And this is also one of the reasons why uh, we are very much involved in, in alternative fuels. Uh, another topic, which is also part of the agenda this afternoon, is about electrification. Uh, so far, uh, we have already developed uh, different guidance documents on electrification. Uh, one on onshore power supply. Uh, the other one, that's more actually for the, uh, for the cargo side, the uh, transportation of uh, electrical vehicles. And uh, this time, uh, we just recently published the uh, guidance on the battery energy storage systems. So using electricity uh, for propulsion of, uh, of ships. This is not uh, new uh, in the sense that, okay, there is, uh, let's say, a, still a regulatory gap uh, how to deal uh, with uh, electrical uh, propulsion. But already uh, 800 ships are sailing around uh, with a different uh, degree of uh, electricity being used as propulsion. And of those 800 ships, 60% uh, are sailing in European waters. So in that sense, it is timely also to look at the safety of uh, energy, mainly, of course, the batteries uh, on board of ships, and how to deal with them uh, also from a reg regulatory point of view. As a starting point, uh, we developed guidance which have been recently published, and this is also part of our agenda this afternoon uh, to present them uh, to, to you. So again, uh, welcome very much. Uh, thank you for being here in the room and being online uh, with us. Uh, so uh, let's then dive into the topics. Uh, we have uh, our um, guidance on the battery storage systems that we are going to present. Uh, and furthermore, we will mainly this time look at ammonia, uh, what we do as EMSA. Uh, but also, uh, we are very fortunate uh, to have uh, two presentations from uh, EU-funded projects uh, also with us to tell their work on ammonia, which of course is a very important and, and promising alternative fuel uh, for shipping. Having said that, uh, I'm very happy to pass the floor to my colleague Monica Romalju, who will uh, introduce uh, us uh, to the uh, guidance document on uh, battery energy uh, storage systems. Monica. Thank you, Landert, and uh, good afternoon to all. It is my pleasure to present to you today our newly published EMSA guidance on the safety of battery energy storage systems on board of ships. In this business card of the project, uh, you can see it summarized and uh, also a summary of my presentation today, where I will go through the um, why we have been working on this topic, on this topic uh, how we did it, what are the content, uh, uh, contents of the guidance, and how do we see the future work uh, here at EMSA in relation to this topic. Um, as the battery electric market uh, uh, is growing, uh, and already grew, uh, we uh, specifically uh, or particularly focused on uh, lithium-ion uh, battery technology, 
we also saw a growing number of maritime applications, so a growing number of ship designs that included batteries on board uh, to fulfill a certain uh, task in the ship, being for, being for uh, propulsion or for uh, fulfilling other electrical uh, power needs on board. Um, our our uh, flag states were obviously uh, aware of this and contacted uh, uh, the Commission for guidance because uh, at the time and still today there is no uh, international regulatory framework for this uh, type of equipment and designs. The European Commission then tasked EMSA uh, to develop such guidance. Can you still hear me, right? <laughs> yes. Develop such guidance that would uh, harmonize existing classification society rules, list all the relevant industry standards, and at the end provide for a set of uh, harmonized recommendations for the safety of batteries on board ships. Uh, how we... Uh, I forgot one bullet point. Um, uh, from uh, the start, we uh, approached uh, this uh, task with a goal-based uh, mindset. And this means that if you look at the guidance document, you can clearly link each recommendation with one goal to address, uh, so to, to eliminate or mitigate the consequences of a battery-specific hazard. And this is clear when you look at the, at the document. To do so, we gathered a group of experts. Uh, we contacted more than 80 experts from different businesses, uh, from administrations, classification societies, from the main operators and the battery manufacturers, and also uh, fire research institutes. And during the past year, our, and during our seven meetings and the five written consultation rounds, uh, we had more than, 50, than 40 of these experts always active, and I take the opportunity to thank, again, everyone who was involved, uh, if you are here or online, for your time and contributions to this document. Looking at this content, the structure of the guidance, in part one, we are addressing the system as such before it goes into the ship. We reviewed the, make, the main components of, the, of a battery, um, cells, the modules, the packs, all the sensors that are within, uh, how is it managed by the battery management system, how, how does it monitor the condition of the battery. The, we address the need for a, a specific UPS that will ensure that the battery safety systems are uh, connected and ready to operate at all times. And of course, uh, we looked at all this, uh, looking for any specific, specific requirements that we might need to add uh, for maritime applications when compared with the land-based applications. So this is part one of the guidance. Then in part two, we look at the integration of the batteries on, in, on ships. We have recommendations for the spaces that are containing the batteries. We look at um, the objectives of the fire safety strategy, how it should, or not, <laughs> but how it should be dependent of uh, the size of the battery, of the operational profile of the ship. This is all. Uh, these are all considerations that we take into account uh, in the guidance. How it should be coordinated with the ventilation strategy to prevent the accumulation of uh, toxic and explosive gases. Um, the, the monitoring of the co overall conditions of the room um, with alarms, indicators, sensors. All of this is covered in part two. Then on part three, we are looking at uh, the relevant testing standards that uh, for, for the design of the battery, first for the design of the battery, we look at the relevant testing standards that exist today, although 
we still don't have a standard published for marine battery systems in specific. Um, but, but for the batteries that exist, we do apply some, some existing standards. We go through the procedures for the propagation test for the gas and explosion analysis, explaining why these are important, uh, the requirements for organizations that are verifying the conformity that should be uh, uh, the same as for other um, marine equipment, and how we should report and uh, document the results of the test. In this testing part uh, three, we also list um, functional tests that uh, we would recommend that are performed after the installation or upon installation uh, of the battery on board. Um, very, uh, a very preliminary list. And uh, I will explain later why we think that this is one of the points we could be working on in the future. At last, in part four, uh, we lay down the procedures for normal and emergency scenarios, including uh, what to do during maintenance, the need to have uh, the battery monitored at all times, including uh, during maintenance, uh, short side battery charging, also based um, on the few uh, lines about the operation of the uh, short side connection that we have in our other guidance for, uh, for uh, 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 short side electricity. Uh, we include recommendations for training of the crew, specifically focused on battery fires and on uh, accident reporting, so we are able to uh, share knowledge of what can go wrong, what has gone wrong, and improve. So, coming, this, 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 this is then the main, the main the structure of the guidance and the main uh, points covered in each part, and uh, you are invited to download it from our website already and start looking into it. Um, future work. Throughout the guidance, we um, refer to cases where a validation of the design of the, uh, of the performance of the, for example, the fire uh, safety strategy uh, could be beneficial. But we don't say how this uh, validation should be performed. We don't lay down the procedure. As we also don't do for the functional tests that may be uh, recommended. So these are, two, these are two areas that, uh, that we could be working on in the future, if, that are how to see if, uh, if our design is really fulfilling all the functional requirements that we are, requirements, recommendations that we are laying down. Uh, and at the same time, also monitor the adequacy of the guidance, taking into account that uh, every day in this uh, field there are new technological developments, and that, that there may be other types of batteries coming uh, in front of, li of the lithium-ion-based technology uh, that we need to keep uh, an eye on. This is the last slide of my presentation. The guidance was published uh, to around two weeks ago, and we already had uh, more than 1,000 downloads. We will share this presentation with you after the workshop. There is the link to download it from our website. And you are, any feedback on the content is always welcomed. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for this uh, introduction. Um, are there any uh, questions or uh, remarks? I don't know if we have online any question. <clears throat> okay, maybe we are still warming up, or, or and or you have been extremely crystal clear. So thank you very much uh, for uh, giving this uh, this introduction. Uh, then I take the liberty just to to move on with the uh, agenda of this afternoon. Uh, we go and have a look at the battery fire safety ventilation. So then I will invite uh, the next speaker, uh, Vasudev Ramachandra, a safety research engineer of RISE, the Research Institute of uh, Sweden. Uh, to present uh, his presentation. Uh, 
Uh, thank you so much, and uh, hello everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, thank you, Emsa, for having us here. Uh, really happy to present some results from this project of ours. Um, so quickly getting on with it. Uh, so this project is basically about uh, exploring the ventilation needs uh, from a safety perspective for uh, big battery installations, uh, lithium ion installations on board ships. Uh, like we just heard, a lot of them have already been sailing. Uh, but from a safety perspective, a lot, uh, I think there is a big gap uh, which we have uh, tried to address uh, in this project. So uh, just to mention, this was funded by the Swedish uh, Transport Administration, uh, and uh, this is operated by Lighthouse. Uh, the aim of this uh, project was to take one step forward to develop a fully uh, electric uh, Rororopax uh, vessel. Uh, and to focus on the ventilation concepts and the post-fire strategies. Uh, although today I will mainly concentrate on the uh, ventilation concepts uh, only. Uh, this was done by Rice and Chalmers University uh, in collaboration with uh, Corvus, uh, ABB and Ishandia, which are uh, battery manufacturers or suppliers. Uh, then there was Trident and Concilium, which work mainly with uh, designing ventilation systems and um, uh, gas detection technologies. And then there was uh, Stena, Forsi, uh, Volenius, and Destination Gotland, which are all operators who have uh, different vessels that they have been operating, hybrid and otherwise. Uh, and of course, from the regulatory perspective, we have the Swedish Transport Agency and uh, DNB. So uh, as you see, we had a representation from, I think, all um, aspects of this, um, this whole uh, stakeholders from all of the, uh, yeah, and this whole process, I think. Uh, just to give a short background, uh, this electric light, or Letta Elfartig in Swedish, uh, was a project which was a predecessor to the, um, uh, the ventilation project, where we designed a fully electric ferry that would go between Gothenburg and Fredrikshamn, which is in Denmark and uh, Gothenburg in uh, Sweden. And uh, this is a concept ferry that was designed for uh, Stena, and uh, this has uh, only electric propulsion, of course, and a stored energy of uh, 60 megawatt hours, which is huge. And uh, once this project was done, uh, that is when we identified that, uh, that there are more specific needs, especially in terms of safety, that has to be looked into. And uh, we have used the design from this vessel as a reference for uh, developing the ventilation system or coming up with uh, recommendations for the ventilation system. Uh, just a short uh, summary of the outcome from the previous project because I think it is relevant for the design of the ventilation. Uh, one is we define something called a casualty unit and I will speak a little bit more about this because uh, uh, th th there is an importance of uh, saying if testing one single cell uh, is enough to make rules uh, which governs the safety of the entire battery pack. So uh, we sort of disagreed, and then we came up with the concept of a casualty unit, which I will, uh, yeah. And uh, we say that the ventilation system should then be uh, designed such that it is, it, the, the, or the ventilation capacity should be determined by the size of the casualty unit. So in the previous project, how we decided, defined the casualty unit was one of these, uh, either it can be the largest number of parallelly connected cells uh, within a module, uh, or it can be the largest unit without an external short circuit uh, protection, uh, or in, in some cases where uh, cell to cell propagation protection is not required within the modules, it can be the number of cells where uh, the thermal propagation protection has been verified by, uh, by test. Uh, ideally, whichever of this is the greatest would be the casualty unit, but uh, for, for this project, we take it as the number of parallelly connected cells for the ease of explanation. When it comes to the ventilation project itself, uh, we started with uh, identifying the shortfalls, and this was with dialogues uh, with the various stakeholders uh, that you uh, saw. And we categorized them in different uh, categories like this. So in, on, on, on a design level, uh, one of the main questions was for what level of a problem should we design the ventilation system for? Uh, and uh, it, it should be clear, for example, what should be inside the battery space, what is there, what can catch fire, what needs to be ventilated, uh, so on. 
from a regulation perspective, uh, of course, there is, a, there is a little bit of a gap between the industry and the regulations. Uh, and one prominent thing that kept coming up was the fact that the development of regulation should not hinder innovation because battery technology is something that's uh, drastically improving on a daily basis and uh, science and regulation is kind of always um, one is too dangerous or one is too advanced or uh, things like these. Uh, operationally, uh, we need strategies to know when to ventilate, how much to ventilate, when not to ventilate because uh, ventilating uh, flammable gases is not always the best choice. Sometimes you just have to wait. Uh, and also to include other scenarios than just a thermal runaway condition because whenever we talk about lithium ion batteries going bad, we only talk about thermal runaway conditions, but that's not necessarily the case. And from an organization perspective, uh, we also need strategies and guidelines for the crew, uh, a lot of which have also been uh, in, in the latest uh, um, um, the, the, the document that Monica just uh, spoke about. Uh, and also, I think it is very important to understand what happens inside the room uh, without having to actually go inside. So uh, these are some of the things, the shortfalls that we identified. Uh, narrowing down, uh, I think two of them that, is, that was really uh, necessary for us uh, for this project was one, uh, the lack of a proper definition of what a module is. Uh, different documents over different organizations have different definitions to define what a module is. It can be uh, something very vague, like how the IEC uh, 62619 standard defines it, which is um, either series or parallel, or it can be with the protective device or not, or things like those. Or it can be um, something very physical, uh, a definition like the shortest thing that you can actually move around without the cell or the battery manufacturer having to open it up or the smallest airtight compartment that has an off-cast duct connected to it. Uh, and so different definitions like these. And the second was um, what test criteria is enough to say that um, it, it, is, it is safe enough to be on a ship. Uh, so here we identified different, uh, for example, causes of failure. So very broadly put, we have uh, internal short circuits, which mainly happen because of manufacturing defects, uh, external short circuits, which happen because of either a mechanical damage from the outside or, uh, for example, coolant leaking into the battery or uh, some of the accident cases that we looked at, for example, uh, MS Brim or MS Yitroing uh, uh, These had water ingress from the outside through the ventilation ducts, which caused arcing uh, or external short circuits, and then uh, both ships were lost. Uh, and then uh, there can be electrical failure or system failure, which, uh, which is to talk about, uh, for example, failure of the BMS system or failure of safety systems that uh, prevent overcharging or deep discharge or uh, things like these. Uh, the test requirements as of today, uh, they may or may not need proof of uh, propagation protection between cells, which means both modules or batteries which have cell-to-cell uh, -cell propagation protection and which don't are allowed or uh, are okay to be used on, on board ships. Uh, and as of today, most of the testing, uh, I, I see that in the new document it was a bit more exhaustive, but uh, at least for, for a lot of the existing ships uh, so far, uh, most of the testing is done on a single cell, uh, be it uh, how much gases is released or uh, uh, for, to test the heat release rates or the propagation protection e example. And in, in a lot of cases, also the uh, cause of these um, uh, breakdown is from typical tests like nail penetration tests or external heating of one single cell, and then you uh, prove under laboratory conditions that, okay, it does not uh, pass on to the next cell or the temperature is below 80 degrees to the adjoining module and therefore it is safe enough to use. But uh, the question remains, are these single cell tests adequate? Because these tests have also been done on the batteries that are on the ships that had these fires. So uh, in this project, I think it was a resounding no. Uh, we believe that it is not enough because uh, the test criteria are not um, representative of all the real scenarios. For example, the electrical connections are not the way they are when they are connected on board. There is no loads connected to the batteries. Uh, it's always assumed that uh, the fault occurs in one cell and then the propagation is uh, tested, for example. Uh, so with this, a general introduction to the ventilation concept that we have. Uh, 
So the we we um, recommend that the ventilation concept is a combination of two things. One is the uh, module design, and this is to say if the module has an off-gas duct or not. I will uh, talk about that uh, in just a bit. Uh, and the objective also, the, the second part, is that uh, there should be different modes of operation, and the different modes of operation uh, of, the, of the ventilation system should be based on uh, whatever is happening in the battery room. Uh, Talking about the first point where uh, the ventilation system has to be designed uh, based on the design of the module itself. So from a physical perspective, there can be two kinds of um, uh, properties, let's say, for the lack of a better term, on, on a module. One is either it can or it cannot have cell-to-cell -cell propagation protection. It can be uh, physical firewall protection between the cells or uh, electrical protection or whatever it might be. But basically some test or some proof that says that uh, a fault in one cell will not uh, transfer to the adjoining one. The second factor is if the module itself has an off-gas duct connected to it or not. So it's either or for both of these cases. And when we draw up a simple two by two matrix, we have three conditions that are possible. In the best case scenario, which we recommend should be the case for all battery installations, the modules have cell-to-cell -cell propagation protection and they have an off-gas duct that is connected directly to the module of the battery which can handle gases from within the module or to evacuate these gases. And the worst case scenario, of course, is when the module has no cell-to-cell -cell propagation protection and it has no off-gas ducts, which means if a cell were to go into thermal runaway, it will propagate to the adjoining cells and these gases are going to be uh, expelled directly into the battery space and not outside through a dedicated vent. Uh, in between, of course, we have an okay-ish situation where it has one of these two, uh, but there is one condition which is not possible. Uh, so if, if there is no cell-to-cell -cell propagation protection, then it cannot have an off-gas duct uh, because there's just too much gas for one small duct to handle. So we recommend, highly recommend, that all cells or all modules that are used on electric ships uh, or hybrid ones uh, should have both cell-to-cell -cell propagation protection and they should have individual off-gas ducts from each of these modules. Uh, so from here on, uh, we will assume that that is the case and we assume that there is an off-gas duct for every module and uh, there are three different scenarios now that we can think of. So in the first case, we have a single cell or a couple of cells that have gone into a therm thermal runway and there is some sort of gases uh, that are flammable, that are toxic uh, within the module. Uh, the second case is uh, the off-gas ducts are not able to handle this for whatever reasons the propagation has increased and we have more uh, fire and uh, rather more smoke or uh, gases, off gases that uh, the duct can handle, therefore it has vented out into the battery space itself. And in the worst case, or the third scenario, we have ignition of these gases, so there is a full-blown fire uh, within the, excuse me, within the battery space. So a very oversimplified version of the battery room is uh, like what you see, it's a cross-section. The pipes in the dark gray, uh, I don't know where to point at, but, um, yeah, <laughs> the, the dark gray uh, pipes, uh, they are the off-gas ducts, which are basically connected to uh, each individual module within the entire rack. So you see two racks, and uh, the off-gas ducts are connected uh, to one small pipe, which eventually gets out of the battery space, which is irrespective of um, the uh, main ventilation system. And then the main primary ventilation system you see, uh, the inlet is on the bottom right and the uh, outlet is on the top left. So under normal conditions, uh, there would be nothing that evacuates out from the off-gas ducts. You just have uh, inlet and outlet as it is shown at a slower rate. And we want to call this basic ventilation. Uh, in this case, uh, the ventilation is mainly to maintain the operational conditions suitable for the battery based on what the manufacturer says. For example, it might be temperature requirements for the battery, it might be humidity, it might be uh, purity of, or air condition, for example. Um, so things like these. In the second case, uh, we assume that there is some sort of off-gas venting or a thermal runway in one cell within a module. 
uh, I mean to say. And in this case, since we have off-gas ducts that are connected to every module, uh, you have these vented off-gases are evacuated through the uh, off-gas duct that is connected to that particular module. In this case, there is still no off-gases that have leaked into the battery space itself. However, uh, we recommend that the ventilation rates within the room, not the off-gas ducts, but within the room, have to already be increased to what we call a preventive uh, level of ventilation system, where you calculate the rate of ventilation, let's say in terms of air changes per hour, in order to be prepared for what is to come next if it happens. So that is a preventive ventilation mode where at the first sign of detecting any sort of off gases, be it through uh, a BMS system which detects a failure in the cell or be it through gas detection systems, uh, as soon as an anomaly is detected, the basic ventilation is shifted to preventive ventilation. You increase the rate of ventilation. Uh, how to calculate them, I will soon talk about. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the um, independently connected uh, off-gas ducts start venting these gases out. In the next case, if uh, the cell-to-cell -cell propagation protection still fails and we have more off-gases than what the uh, off-gas ducts can handle, then each of these modules, they, uh, if they have off-gas ducts, which we have assumed, they also have pressure vents, which uh, basically lets out all of these off-gases into the battery room itself if the pressure is too much for these uh, smaller pipes to handle. So now is a case where uh, there is explosive gases or toxic gases within the battery space and not just within the module. So in, in this scenario, uh, as soon as this happens, uh, the preventive ventilation mode, which was the operational mode up until now, is uh, changed to what we call as casualty ventilation, which is the highest level of ventilation that this whole system should be designed for, which should be capable of evacuating uh, a gases of a much higher volume, which can be, again, calculated based on the module size, the number of cells in the module, the volume of the room, uh, etc. And in the last case is when uh, the most unfortunate situation occurs. You have some sort of ignition of these gases and there is uh, a fire of some sort. Then um, the best bet is to shut off the ventilation, especially the inlet, because you do not want to introduce uh, fresh air or more oxygen for this to help because lithium ions, they are notoriously known for creating their own. So we don't have to give in any more extra. And now is when the extinguishing system comes into play as well, which we have not uh, worked a lot on this project. But uh, the outlet, uh, the shutting down of the outlet completely depends on what kind of ventilation system you're using. So if it's a water-based ventilation system, it's still OK to shut off the uh, exit. But if it's, for example, an aerosol or a foam or a gaseous-based uh, extinguishing system, then there will be a pressure buildup within the room if the batteries are producing gases and uh, there is an extinguishing uh, element as well. So uh, we suggest that there are weighted flaps which are calculated based on the pressure differences within the room. So based on these, uh, just a quick summary of the different uh, ventilation levels. So you have the basic ventilation, which is what is to maintain a good operate, operating condition for the batteries under normal operation. And then you have preventive ventilation, which takes care of uh, when you first detect an anomaly of whatever sort, you let the off-gas ducts do their job, but you're increasing the rate of ventilation to be prepared for something uh, so that you can minimize the risk of um, uh, getting into the lower explosion limit uh, within the room. And then you have the casualty ventilation, which is when you know that, okay, there are off-gases within the space, and then you have to evacuate all of these gases before there is uh, an explosion or uh, a fire, uh, let's say. Uh, one of the outcomes uh, also that we, we, um, uh, we believe is that the battery chemistries are not always relevant uh, for the development of these uh, ventilation systems. But this does not mean to say that there is no effect of the chemistry on, on the production of these off-gases. There definitely is. Different chemistries behave differently. The propagation rates are different. The, the gas composition, the rates of release of gases are different. But we uh, recommend that these should be decoupled. Uh, and while doing so, we still depend on the chemistry by considering the rate of uh, the production of gases which, is, which goes into the uh, formula to calculate the rate of uh, ventilation. So 
Ventilation is dependent on chemistry, but it shouldn't be uh, a direct correlation. This chemistry sh should mean this ventilation is not what we uh, recommend. Uh, so like I mentioned, uh, a little bit of math. Um, to calculate these different uh, rates, or for example, what should be the rate of ventilation for basic ventilation in terms of air changes per hour, or what should it be for um, uh, casualty ventilation or whatever. So we, we uh, have this formula, a lot more of this, a detail of how we arrive at these expressions and what we have considered can be read on the report. I, I think I really have to skip through all of them, uh, for now at least. Uh, so um, as an example, like I said, we have taken the previous uh, project that we worked on, which is the electric light. So for six air changes per hour, for, for this example, uh, we have about 43 meter cube per minute as the rate of evacuation of gases. And we know that every module that is used in this particular uh, ship has 36 meter cube per minute, which is uh, evacuated. So now you can calculate, uh, for, for example, what uh, amount of air changes per hour corresponds to how much of these gases being uh, evacuated. So for example, uh, six corresponds to about a little more than one module, which can be a preventive uh, mode of uh, ventilation. And then uh, more than two modules, which is extremely unlikely with the cell-to-cell uh, -cell propagation protection, uh, to have more than two modules going off simultaneously into complete thermal runaway conditions. But the casualty ventilation is still capable of evacuating uh, that rate or that volume of gases. Uh, even if it were to happen. So these can be uh, changed based on the volume of the uh, battery spaces, the different module designs, uh, the gases released uh, based on what the battery manufacturer uh, provides uh, as information, etc. cetera. Uh, now from a more um, a physical perspective of the battery rooms and the battery space, uh, one limitation that we came across uh, in terms of regulation was uh, a limit of having only five megawatt hours as stored energy per battery room. And we believe that's a little bit of a constraint, uh, especially because uh, if, if it's a fully electric vessel with dimensions like these, then uh, splitting the whole battery of 60 megawatt hours into rooms that fit only five megawatt hours will mean uh, so much more of additional bulkheads, that is, so many more ventilation ducts and uh, so much more additional weight, etc., which uh, we believe is not necessary as long as the other safety systems are in place. Uh, this is just a quick uh, or a cross section of uh, the mid midship. Uh, the pipes in red are the room ventilation uh, from what you saw from the schematic earlier. And then we have the off-gas ducts as well, which uh, connect to the different modules and uh, go out. And this is, of course, in accordance with all the other regulations which say that uh, they should, th these ducts should be independent of the common ventilation in the ship. They should be evacuated directly outside of the ship which, uh, with no risk of uh, them mixing with, um, uh, let's say, the ventilation system where there are personnel on board, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, we also, uh, because of some previous incidents that we uh, studied, uh, we also, of course, recommend some uh, goosenecks and uh, some condensation low points in the system because uh, there's a difference in temperature and the water vapor condenses and then you have a backlash of this water that goes back into the battery, which has happened before. Uh, so those uh, kind of simple problems should definitely be addressed. Uh, just another profile view uh, of these uh, ventilation systems. And with that, I thank you. Uh, and of course, I would like to mention uh, Anna and Martin, uh, both of them who uh, worked as project engineers in this uh, project along with the entire consortium. Anna has been the project manager and Martin is a senior lecturer uh, at the Mechanics and Maritime Sciences at uh, Chalmers. And uh, this QR code is where you will find the reports. Uh, unfortunately, the report for this project is yet to be published, but it should be done sometime very soon uh, in the very near future. But the report for the uh, previous project, which is Letha El Fartig or Electric Light, can also be found on the same link. And uh, yeah, I welcome any questions and thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this is very interesting to see with this use case, uh, how it's being uh, applied, uh, the, the logic of uh, uh, battery uh, uh, ventilation. Uh, very good. Um, any uh, question or comments? 
To the speaker. <clears throat> yes, Santiago. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. I think it shows how complex, difficult the, the batteries, the large batteries on board ships are in respect to what we are used in the, in the, maritime, in the maritime world. Um, and we are just talking about one specific part of the strategy, which is ventilation. There are, some, there are so many other safety uh, things that we have to think about. But my question is about uh, the, the fire safety, the fire strategy uh, in conjunction with the ventilation. Because in some occasions it can be, can be used the inert, inert gases, no? for example, to, to try to stop the, the fire. And in that case, of course, you, you should stop, in principle, all the inlets and outlets for the ventilation. So is there any kind of strategy, timing, when, when to close, when to open, if you are using inert, inert systems? Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Uh, that, th this is something we definitely spoke about a lot uh, during the uh, course of this project, uh, because there have been many cases before where um, uh, uh, you purge the battery spaces with inert gases, so you know that uh, it is safe to open the hatches or uh, things like these. Unfortunately, uh, one of the hardest things about this project is to condense it in a 15-minute presentation. So um, uh, we, we do have some information about these in the, in, in the report. But uh, what we think is that um, inert gases are not good enough for um, extinguishing systems, uh, also because mainly they have no, um, their heat capacity is so less. You, you, you cannot remove heat. You can maybe prevent uh, fires for a while. But unlike, let's say, uh, fresh water, which, is, uh, which has a big thermal capacity so it can cool down uh, the batteries, uh, inert gases or any gas, for example, does not compare uh, anywhere close to such uh, other extinguishing uh, systems. So uh, they, they are definitely not the, they shouldn't be the go-to uh, mode for extinguishing uh, such fires. Uh, the fire should be contained um, rather than the focus being on being est extinguished because these, these batteries will somehow find a way to expel their energy once it's gone out of hand. They will continue to burn. But um, we, we, the, the the focus should be perhaps be on uh, once the fire is out or uh, once the ventilation systems can be opened, they have to be opened after they, the rooms have been purged with uh, inert gases. And then you know that uh, there are no more flammable gases. So when you open a hatch, uh, the oxygen will not just reignite uh, the fires. Some of these examples have, um, have been there, uh, which have uh, worked pretty well uh, beforehand. Uh, which also have been derived from uh, the fact that without purging, hatchets have been opened and then there has been an explosion or a re-ignition uh, uh, after a while. Okay, thank you very much for your reply. There, is a there seems to be a question, maybe you can read it. Yes, no, there is a question from the chat, and um, it's what about uh, seawater as extinguishing media? As fresh water is available uh, for a limited amount on board, uh, on board only, uh, but getting uh, the room cooled means extinguishing media might need to be used for many hours. So, of course, then uh, the fresh water will run out. <coughs> Uh, yes, uh, ab ab absolutely. Uh, but I think the priority should always be fresh water. Uh, there should be um, uh, calculations made on uh, how, how much fresh water can be stored, uh, how long fresh water can be used to contain these fires, and uh, salt water should be the last resort uh, to use to extinguish these uh, fires because salt water really does not go well. And uh, electrolysis is actually a secondary problem. The primary problem will be arcing. And uh, the batteries will be basically welding machines out of control. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, there is, uh, I think, only a limited amount of fresh water. But uh, extinguishing is a problem that uh, needs uh, to be looked into as a, 
a separate project itself. Uh, I think a big one and a very important one at that. Okay. Sorry. Um, uh, there is another question from the chat, so probably better if I read this one. Um, has there been any discussion or, or research around flame detection in these spaces? Um, f yes. Um, maybe I, 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 not any that I can uh, recollect at the top of my head. But uh, within our own project, we did have... Um, uh, a lot of discussion about uh, gas detection, uh, not flame detection, but there are uh, definitely uh, projects and implementations with uh, different um, camera systems and or different uh, sensors that can detect flame or outline the different uh, flames, uh, absolutely. Uh, yes, and I might, might even add on this specific point that uh, we have seen in a Danish uh, funded project, Elbas, uh, exactly this uh, angle uh, analyzed uh, through thermal cameras as a means to, to detect uh, uh, the fires. Of course, there are certain limitations of these thermal cameras that you need to have a line of sight uh, as much as possible free, uh, but still, depending how you position the camera, you can still, still achieve that. Help us, uh, help us, uh, yeah. And I would have a, um, a comment or a consideration also. Um, you might have seen that we have uh, taken the, the view uh, of not limiting the installed energy uh, in the battery space in our guidance because uh, we think that we have provided the requirements such as uh, structural integrity, fire integrity, smoke tightness, and so on and so forth, that have to be demonstrated. But we have seen that you have considered instead uh, the five megawatt uh, as a limiting uh, energy installed in a single space. Um, that was a consideration, but if you could elaborate uh, a little bit more on why this uh, requirement came up? <clears throat> uh, well, we, we, we say that there shouldn't be this requirement uh, and there shouldn't be this limit on, uh, or maybe th there, sh there can be a limit on how much energy you store in a battery space, but it definitely shouldn't be as low as five megawatt hours, uh, especially considering that uh, it is solely electric propulsion and you have so much of uh, energy stored on board. Uh, it, of course, depending on the um, on, on the extinguishing system, it would be uh, wise to have some sort of limit uh, to, to say how much of energy you can store. Uh, but uh, for the project that we had, for the design that we had, uh, 60 megawatt hours and each room, if they have to have airtight uh, or watertight doors and bulkheads and uh, evacuation plans and space for people to walk inside because they are not small containers, they are uh, there, there, there are more than one uh, battery racks in every room, uh, then five uh, megawatt hours per room becomes a problem. Okay. Uh, we have indeed another question in the chat. Uh, have uh, supercapacitors being considered for maritime applications? Uh, a very interesting question. Uh, none that I have uh, come across, uh, but maybe uh, there is some work going on, uh, something I really should look up, or somebody else, uh, if, if they know. <laughs> uh, yes, there are indeed applications uh, of supercapacitors uh, in maritime. There has been a uh, few years back, a uh, couple of, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, European funded projects that demonstrated uh, the use, at least on short uh, um, voyages, uh, um, for, of these technologies. However, I have to say that uh, while we started the work on the battery guidance, uh, we 
considered at the beginning uh, uh, also this technology, uh, if it was uh, worth to be analyzed as part of the electrification uh, challenge. Uh, but then um, there was the overwhelming uh, um, support for analyzing what is really the core business at the moment, that is the lithium-ion uh, technologies batteries. Um, and, and therefore, we kept these super capacitors uh, a little bit uh, in, uh, in the background. Uh, we do not exclude that if uh, uh, something changes in terms of uh, uptake uh, of this technology, we could consider a comeback and uh, revise the, a little bit. <clears throat> Okay, and thank you very much for the questions and also for the uh, responses. Uh, then I think we have dealt enough with this topic. Um, I think we still have a bit of time, so I would propose to go to the next uh, topic. This is a very crowded presentation on the safety of ammonia as fuel. Uh, we are still uh, halfway uh, uh, the, the project. Uh, but uh, Lanfranco Benedetti will present it uh, together with uh, two re representatives from our contractor, uh, René uh, Lorsen and Konstantinos uh, uh, Futsulidis. Uh, but I think you will speak in uh, not all the three at the same time. So I guess we will start with uh, Lanfranco. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, I will... Uh, try to briefly, very briefly, introduce uh, the work that we have uh, started uh, um, on, on ammonia as a fuel under uh, the angle of uh, safety. Um, now, um, you have seen this business card of the, of the project uh, already uh, from my colleague Monica for the batteries. And uh, here uh, I am a little bit repeating uh, for the ammonia, uh, where probably the relevant uh, information are here, the keywords, uh, of course, uh, toxicity, uh, that is one of the main hazards. Uh, the way how we think uh, we could explore the safety uh, dimension under uh, functional safety and the reliability analysis. Uh, and then some information on uh, uh, when we started, uh, that actually was in September this year, uh, with our uh, um, group of contractors led by ABS, uh, together with uh, Foundation Valencia Port and the Technical University of Athens. Now, before uh, saying a uh, few words on this one, um, I would like to uh, touch briefly on other two um, projects that we are that are either ongoing or uh, being uh, called for tender for tenders um, that are part of the. Uh, a little program that we have put together that we call it, uh, and that we call uh, safety for uh, sustainability. So um, the next uh, uh, project that we are uh, undertaking uh, as we speak uh, address the bunkering of uh, uh, biofuels. Namely, uh, we are looking into five specific biofuels. Um, that came up uh, from the studies that you have seen presented here last year has the most uh, likely to have a sensible uptake uh, in the maritime sector. Uh, and uh, again, we will look into specific hazards uh, and procedures related to uh, bunkering. The third one 
uh, and that becomes uh, uh, maybe interesting for some of you here, uh, address hydrogen as a fuel. Uh, the coal is open until the 12th of January uh, for a value of uh, 550,000 uh, euro. Um, and we will again uh, like to undertake a, an analysis uh, uh, of the hazard uh, and a safety assessment uh, using uh, uh, methodologies and techniques such as functional safety and reliability analysis. Now, um, we, we have put together uh, these few uh, um, slides with projects that are ongoing. Um, <clears throat> mindful of what is happening at the international level. Uh, this is a sketch uh, that more or less should capture the status of the discussion at the IMO. Um, and we would like to try as much as uh, practicable uh, use uh, the results of uh, the work that we are doing also to inform uh, the international community uh, of the results that we will eventually uh, achieve during this work. Um, the effort to synchronize our studies with the IMO uh, work stream is just hopeless. So uh, we are, again, mindful of what's uh, going on there, uh, and we will try to do uh, the best we can to uh, provide information as they become available. Now, very, very briefly, uh, two words on the ammonia study that will be introduced uh, uh, by ABS just uh, after uh, the coffee break, I believe. Uh, these are two uh, screenshots taken from the uh, European Chemical Agency uh, that classifies uh, the chemical substances. And basically, this is all what uh, we need to know um, in respect to the risk profile of this chemical. Uh, causes uh, severe skin burns, eye damage, is toxic if inhaled, inhaled uh, very toxic to aquatic life and is flammable gas. Uh, in particular, toxicity to aquatic life has long lasting effects. Right, it seems pretty much discouraging, uh, but in fact, uh, um, we were not, we were never been. We will have never been. And these are the first two applications that I, at least I could trace back uh, to transport. 1935, uh, the first uh, patent of a, a ammonia engine and uh, more relevant even in 1942 a, an entire system uh, developed in Belgium uh, during the war for scarcity of other fuels of a coal fire ammonia, uh, ammonia engine. So uh, there are problems uh, that needs to be addressed uh, to bring this uh, to uh, maritime scale, um, but with persistence uh, we, will, uh, we will go through eventually. Um, finally, uh, the main three uh, steps uh, that uh, we will uh, undertake in our work, uh, you see here on the screen, uh, in particular, um, step number two, where we have the idea of running uh, quantitative risk analysis and uh, reliability uh, analytical uh, analysis uh, 
on subsystems or systems on board of the ship, fuel system, clearly, um, is uh, a little bit the cornerstone of the work that uh, we intend to do with, uh, with ABS. We are uh, at the very beginning where the yellow arrow is, um, and therefore you might expect to see results uh, uh, next year uh, during uh, this type of event, uh, if we will uh, repeat uh, once, once again. Um, and this concludes my short uh, introduction uh, to, uh, to, to the study, and I will leave uh, uh, to, to that. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm a bit in doubt because uh, we said that we would break 10 past uh, 3, which is more or less now. Uh, so maybe, I don't know, because uh, then you have also more time for your presentation. So my proposal would be to break now, uh, so that also for the people online we are not disturbing the agenda as was uh, circulated. And then after the break we will continue with the uh, presentation on the uh, work ongoing on this study. Yeah? Okay. So we will break uh, 50 minutes uh, for a coffee and then we will continue with the uh, agenda.
Okay, thank you very much for being back with us. Um, it's always very interesting with these type of hybrid meetings that uh, <coughs> people online are normally more disciplined than the people uh, that are present uh, at the meeting. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, of course, uh, I, I don't say that uh, in a negative way because I appreciate that the people that are with us in the room, of course. So thank you very much for, for being back. Uh, we started before the break with the uh, presentation of the uh, MSAR safety study on ammonia as fuel. Uh, we had the first introduction uh, from uh, Lanfranco Benedetti, who is working for the safety unit. And now we will go a bit more deeper into the work which is ongoing uh, by the uh, MSA contractor. Uh, here we have uh, René uh, Lorsen and Konstantinos uh, Voutselidis uh, with us. Uh, and René Lorsen will, uh, will start in uh, giving a bit more information about the ongoing work. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Yeah, I will do it uh, quite uh, brief and give you an introduction to uh, where we are with, with this uh, ammonia safety study. Uh, this, the study is lined up here and uh, we, we are at the moment working on, uh, on task, task one. And the, the goal for the whole study is to develop a, a guidance for ship using ammonia as fuel and, and present that uh, in the end. Uh, the partners in the project, uh, already explained by Lanfranco, is, uh, is uh, part of Valencia. It's a national technical university of, of Athens who is participating. Uh, and we have also two partners uh, or stakeholders. Uh, and this is ER, Clean Ammonia, and it's uh, part of Uelva who is uh, participating uh, and reviving what, what we are doing. Task, eight, task one. Is about ammonia, toxicity, uh, health, and, and the protection of life. And we have uh, just submitted the, the first draft here for, for the first review, and we are now uh, working on, on the comments there. Um, part of this is uh, also to line up uh, what, what is the state at the moment, and there is an overview of, uh, of orders of ammonia fuel ships already uh, taking place. And there's uh, actually quite a significant amount of uh, orders in, uh, announced. Um, if we're looking at uh, the next step here, then we are going to look at the safety assessment and, and especially reliability of, of the different uh, component in, involved in, in the system when building a, a ship which has been fueled by, by ammonia. And we are going to uh, review the system in, in terms of reliability in order to, to f sort out the, the weak spots and, and maybe introduce some ideas to in improving the systems there and then setting the, set the guidelines uh, later on. Uh, if you're looking at that the component that we are uh, expecting to look into, then it's uh, comprising both the, of course, the internal combustion engines, the fuel supply system, the ventilation system, the exhaust gas system to the extent there's a change to this system, and then of course uh, all the bunkering uh, system uh, that is needed in order to, to uh, uh, bunker the, the, the ship. If you look in, in the market and see what is available uh, of uh, new technologies there for burning ammonia on the Indian side, uh, then uh, both uh, VINGG and uh, MAN, they have uh, actually uh, uh, ongoing development uh, and this is uh, new compared to the previous study that we made on ammonia. Uh, we have seen that uh, VINGG have uh, tested uh, the engine on ammonia and the same with MAN for the two-stroke. And both of them, they have uh, orders in, in place uh, for delivery of ammonia engine in 2024 and 25. We have also seen the Vatsala uh, have completed their test and, and it now is available with a, a 25 bore engine. Uh, and they are offering that for, for delivery, I think already next year. And uh, the idea is to follow up with a 31 bore engine on, on ammonia. Hyundai have uh, done initial investigation on the use of ammonia and have uh, orders for the 22-bore engine for delivery already uh, beginning of uh, 2025. Um, and MAN 
is uh, has postponed the their development of ammonia in, in, until 2026 or 2027. But all those uh, is, is going to be reviewed in, in, uh, in the report. Uh, the technology is going to be uh, evaluated. Uh, one example here is a uh, recently announced uh, result there from, from burning ammonia on a, a vintage E2 stroke engine. Uh, and uh, with this result, which is listed up there, there's uh, literally no N2O emissions from, from combustion of ammonia. There's a uh, very small amount of uh, uh, ammonia slip. And uh, the NOx issues uh, seems not to be a, an issue uh, either. So all the issues that uh, we have discussed over the last uh, couple of uh, years seems to be solved with, with those testing. Uh, this is uh, done on a and a one cylinder engine. Uh, now we need to see it on, on, a, on a test engine uh, if they can repeat those uh, good results. But it certainly shows that it's a promising uh, fuel uh, for the future. Efficiency seems also to be similar to what we see on, on fuel oil, uh, but all this will be explained in, in the coming report. There's also a new development on the way from Alpha Laval. They're looking into developing a, a boiler that can run on ammonia, it can take the idea. It's not firm. Uh, uh, the, the concept is not yet firm, but the idea is to take uh, or make a system which is able to deal with the, with the remaining uh, ammonia from the engine uh, and burn that in a, in a boiler, or it can burn uh, the ammonia directly for production of, of steam. Uh, so this is also the target to include uh, include information about the uh, ammonia boilers in, in the concept. Uh, then we have also uh, gas turbine coming up uh, using ammonia as fuel uh, and the target for us is also to, to include uh, information about the uh, ammonia fuel gas turbines. Uh, this can, can be an interesting option uh, not only for LNG carriers as shown there but also for other types of uh, ships. Um, so this, I'm sure, if it uh, lives up to, to what uh, we so far have seen for, for burning ammonia in a gas turbine, that it only needs pilot fuel in the beginning in order to, to start the ignition, then there's no need for ongoing uh, uh, pilot fuel. So it basically runs more or less 100% on ammonia. If this uh, is shown to be the truth in the future, then it uh, opens up new potential for, for the use of gas turbine in, in shipping. The plan for, for the ammonia safety study is also to look at the three different uh, ship design and VLCC with a two-stock uh, uh, dual fuel engine on ammonia and four-stock uh, gensets, and then also a bulk carrier or perhaps a container ship step and uh, a row row passenger ships. Uh, and then in the end, we will conclude in, uh, in a guidance that we will develop. And, uh, and this is uh, the whole target for the project is to, to present that uh, when the project is, is, uh, is finished. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Now for the second part. Okay, hello, my name is Kostas Vuculidis. I'm uh, Head of Europe for Contractor Research and Development in ABS. And I'm a bit hijacking the agenda for presenting an EU-funded project we participate called NH3Craft, also known as Ammonia Craft. This is a project uh, funded by um, Horizon Europe. Um, it's co-funded by Horizon Europe. It has a total budget of uh, nearly 13 million euros, out of which 8.5 is the contribution of the European Commission. We have 13 partners in the consortium out of uh, six uh, countries in Europe. The project has a duration of 36 months and uh, started uh, last year in June, June 22. The project is coordinated by Hydros Engineering, um, ARENA, 
Services and Luna Consulting, uh, our partners, uh, ABS, uh, Technical University of Dresden, uh, National Technical University of Athens, Konova Deutschland, ECME, Columbia Ship Management, uh, Wegemd Foundation, Enisolv, TWI, and University of Strathclyde. We have also um, established an external advisory board uh, for reaching out uh, to specific um, feedback that we want from the industry. And we have uh, within the advisory board uh, Danao Shipping, Fundacion Valencia Port, Astander Shipyard, the Maltese Flag Administration, MIN, All Stars Engineering Group, and Amogee. The objectives of the project are mainly to cover uh, the safe and efficient use of ammonia as a fuel uh, on board um, a vessel. It um, covers uh, the uh, use of ammonia from practically bunkering on board the vessel up to the interface with the engine, but not the engine uh, itself. So we're developing uh, solutions uh, for retrofit and new design uh, of ships. The solution will be uh, ready to burn uh, through uh, modular on deck and hull integrated fuel tanks. Um, and as part of that, we are executing and have already done um, a big part of that for um, the safety risk and acceptance analysis. And we will be developing um, solutions for a demonstration of uh, quantities of uh, approximately 900 uh, to 1,000 cubic meters of ammonia which is equivalent uh, to uh, 300 tons of uh, heavy fuel oil on a vessel that is going to be retrofitted. And I'm going to show you uh, shortly uh, what vessel this will be. Along with that, uh, we are um, uh, developing proposals for technical um, class rules and also um, proposals for um, regulatory updates. And we are also developing a digital simulation platform for the fuel storage, fuel supply, the piping, and vetting sump systems. The role of ABS in, uh, in this project is, um, first of all, to develop or update uh, technical uh, class requirements. We uh, are also developing proposals uh, on the regulatory side evaluating the current regulatory framework and what is missing, what needs to be done, taking into consideration what is being done also in an IMO level. Then uh, we're performing the plan review and witnessing the testing of the solutions that are being developed by the consortium. We are supporting in the simulation activities and we provide uh, technical advice from a classification and regulatory standpoint to the consortium so we are aligned uh, in the developments with uh, what is the current state of the art and what is, uh, is the future in terms of, of the regulations. And in, in this context, I think this also aligns really well with what we are doing uh, for EMSA in the ammonia study. Uh, and I think we will have a close interaction between the projects, with this project and the safety uh, study we are performing for EMSA. So what has been done in the project so far? We have a um, 3D laser scanned uh, on board two vessels and selected the most suitable vessel for retrofitting and demonstrating these technologies. We have uh, performed a preliminary assessment of the existing regulatory framework on the safety aspects. We have identified uh, technical and operational boundaries and limitations. We have developed uh, feasibility scenarios on arrangement and uh, including the basic uh, safety aspects that have to be considered. And we have um, selected five uh, desktop study candidate vessels for um, exploring, besides the demo vessel, how these technologies can be installed in other vessels as well and how this can be scalable in the future. Then we proceeded with um, design of, uh, of the concept of the uh, ammonia fuel containment system for the demo vessel, and also the concept design of the fuel auxiliary systems for the demo vessel. And we have uh, completed the feasibility assessment for all five desktop studies. So we know that for the vessel we selected, we can uh, 
install these technologies, at least it's feasible to, to proceed with uh, the assessment on that. We have uh, performed um, uh, regulatory gap um, identification, and we have um, already completed a, a hazard and a hazard uh, assessment for the demo vessel and the desktop studies. We have also um, drawn on paper the system requirements and the architecture for the digital platform, which we are going to build upon for the simulation aspects. So the demonstrator, you can see here we have um, the photo of the actual vessel and the 3D scanned version of it with a point cloud. And it is a 31K uh, deadweight multipurpose heavy lift vessel. It's from AAL, uh, managed by Columbia. And uh, on board uh, this vessel, we are going to, to, to install um, these um, tanks that are listed in this table. Uh, I think we can share the presentation uh, for the audience to, to look at it uh, later. It's not worth going to the details, but you can see we have uh, practically uh, metallic and composite tanks, and we're going to retrofit auxiliary systems for the uh, fuel supply and fuel service. On the desktop study level, we are going to, to examine five cases, which uh, include a, a bulk carrier, a tanker, um, a Ropax, an inland waterways uh, double-ended ferry, and a container ship. Uh, for, the, um, for the four cases, it will be mainly on, on a retrofitting, and for the um, uh, container ship is for, for new building. So the following steps. We need to finalize the actual uh, designs of the container system for the ammonia for the demo vessel, conclude with the final uh, designs for the auxiliary systems, and then these are going to be reviewed by ABS as, as, uh, as class, and we're going to issue a new technology qualification statement for these technologies, validating that uh, they have reached a specific maturity level. Uh, as part of the, that process, an FMEA workshop is already scheduled that is going to assess uh, the uh, risks through um, a failure mode analysis of the um, systems that are developed and then proceed through the, the class review process. In addition, we have the uh, preparation of the proposals for the technical regulations and class requirements through which we are going to, do, uh, to consider the gap analysis and the regulations that has already been performed and also the, the risk assessments, the hazard, the hazard, and the FMEA, and then finalize uh, the uh, risk assessment through the QRA studies and analysis for the ship dangerous areas. So this is my short presentation of NS3 Craft, and thank you for listening. Very good, thank you very much. Uh, any question regarding this project or the previous one? They are both just presented. Of course, the EMSA study is still work in progress, as has been demonstrated. Uh, yes, please. Yes, I have actually uh, two questions. Uh, one is in the last uh, presentation, you mentioned the auxiliary engines. They're also running on uh, ammonia. I think I mentioned the auxiliary systems, not engines. So uh, we are feeding the main engine with uh, ammonia. And we have the auxiliary systems, meaning the systems that are supplying uh, fuel to the engine, but not the engine itself. And another question, sorry. Um, we have uh, recently uh, discovered uh, with the evaluation of the NECA zone in uh, the North Sea that um, yeah, the NOx reduction at this moment for conventional engines is not really working properly on uh, low speeds and low loads of the engines. Is it different with the, uh, the ammonia-powered uh, engines, or is it uh, similar to the conventional fuels? Can you repeat the, the question? Because I, I didn't get that. Uh, so 
we have uh, seen that in the Necker zone in North Sea um, that the, uh, the C is SCR um, installations on board of these ships that are actually not working properly because of the working on low speeds and low engine loads. Uh, this is happening for conventional fuels, but is it also happening for the, the um, ammonia fuels, or is it something you haven't seen yet? Your, your question is to the, to the SCR, uh, if, if they can operate on, on ammonia, using ammonia. Um, so, um, in, in the SCR system, you, you need to... Uh, you need either urea or ammonia uh, to be injected. Uh, uh, so if there is actually, uh, the, the idea from some, from some of the engine makers is to use this uh, ammonia that potentially is in the exhaust gas uh, and uh, to add to the, to the SCR system and then uh, compensate by adding up more, more ammonia. Uh, ammonia is, is required in order to operate in SCR, so, so uh, it, works, it works fine. Uh, together with, with, with the SCR system. But also on the uh, lower loads, because then the engine is not that, uh, yeah, working that hard and it's not uh, producing uh, as much heating, for example? Uh, I think uh, SCR can operate down to 10% engine load uh, without any issues on, on, on two-stroke engines. Um, I'm not aware about uh, if there's any additional uh, issues with, uh, with four-stroke engine at low load, but the two-stroke engine can operate down to, to uh, 10%. Uh, it's, it's tested to uh, 20, at 25% engine load. That's uh, according to, to uh, uh, the technical file. Yeah, uh, but, but in reality, it can operate at, at lower load also. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, we have one question in the chat. Have there been any consideration of the allowable ammonia slip from such engines? Given that currently there is no regulatory limitation on the ammonia slips from selective catalytic reduction equipment. Uh, uh, we cannot hear you. Yeah, it's, uh... ah, okay. Sorry from this microphone. Yeah. So the question is, is also in relation to the SCR equipment. Yeah. And the question is, have there been any consideration of the allowable ammonia slip from such, from such engines, given that currently there is no regulatory limitation on the ammonia slips from selective catalytic reduction yeah. equipment? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this, this, I think uh, each, each of uh, the classification society now have, have their own guideline for, for the use of uh, ammonia. And each of them have uh, diff different uh, PPM requirements uh, after, uh, after the SCR or in the exhaust gas for ammonia. I think there is uh, some initiative in order to align this requirement so uh, it's, it's more uh, common, common standard. At ABS, we have our own, own requirement. We, we started out actually with 10 ppm, which is also the requirement there is uh, for, for SCR. You can also generate ammonia slip from using SCR in a normal, normal engine, and there is a, PP, a 10 ppm requirement. Um, we have relaxed a little because it's, uh, uh, it's challenging to, to design an engine where you do not have any ammonia slip, basically. Uh, so uh, we have increased it uh, a little. I think it's uh, 30 ppm uh, is my memory. But there's different ppm levels depending on classification society. Okay, that's why we have EMSA, is to harmonize. Uh, we have another question. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you for the, for the good presentations. I'm uh, just wondering uh, the bunkering part. Is that something that you, you are including, or is that because ammonia is already being used as a cargo that you don't have to look at it so much? 
uh, in, in the study or in, in general, I would say in, in the bunkering is not described in the, in the class rules. Uh, there is a bunkering requirement has been developed in, uh, in other societies. Uh, we have uh, we have SICTO, which have been developing for, for natural gas, and, and they will also be doing uh, similar on, on ammonia, is, is uh, what we hear. We has SDMF, who is also participating in, in developing of, of uh, safe bunkering procedures. We will include it also in the study here uh, for ammonia safety and be looking at that in, in the risk assessment. Yeah. Thank you. And in the Horizon project, is that something? In the Horizon project, we we do not examine the bunkering site. It's practically the interface to the bunkering uh, vessel, but not the bunkering site. We cover from from the interface to the bunkering to the engine on board the vessel door. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any other question or remark? Okay, that's good. Then uh, we will move on to the next uh, presentation. Uh, it's about an EU-funded project. Uh, okay. You see, as soon as I threaten to go to the next topic, we get a question. Okay, please. So the question is the following. To what extent has the risk to the nitrogen cycle from ammonia slip and leaks or other forms of reactive nitrogen that might be emitted from using ammonia as a fuel? Have you considered the papers by, well, this is very specific, Wolfram et others from 2022 and Berta Glingi from 2023? Maybe the papers maybe are too specific for the question, of course, but is basically to understand the, the, the risks you know, to have the, the, the nitrogen you know, uh, emitting using, using ammonia fuel, if this is considered as a, as a risk in our studies for us, I remember. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we don't consider that. You know, the, should, should I reply to this? Or? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Um, of course, it is a, it's a huge risk if you have uh, just one, one gram of... Uh, uh, laughter gas in, in the exhaust gas, uh, then you have uh, eliminated the benefit, uh, basically, because then you are on the same greenhouse gas level as you are on, on using a normal fuel. So this has to be eliminated from the combustion, either in the combustion itself or in the after treatment. There's, a, there's no doubt. Otherwise, uh, uh, there's no benefit in, in going towards ammonia. So that's mandatory to have that uh, completely almost completely eliminated. But I would say, if, if you're comparing to, to other types of fuel, then all fuels, when you burn that, they are emitting a little bit of, uh, of laughter gas. Uh, it, it's not completely eliminated when you burn fuel oil or LNG or, or LPG. It's, it's also present uh, in small quantities. Uh, the test result we saw announced from, from VNGT, uh says that they are on the same level they, that they are with, with fuel oil. So they do not see any increase of, of uh, laughter gas in, in the exhaust gas. So this is very positive result. Yeah, yeah I hardly dare to go to the next topic. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you very much uh, for these explanations and additional information that was uh, very useful. Uh, so the next presentation is about uh, Engimonia, probably I pronounce it uh, not correct, uh, by Martina Vagnoni. Uh, she is uh, Innovation for Energy Efficiency Project Manager at uh, RINA Consulting. So Martina, you have the floor. So, good afternoon to everyone. I'm Martina Vagnoni and I work for RINA Consulting. I'm the project manager and coordinator of the EU-funded project Engimonia, Sustainable Technology for Future Long Distance Shipping Towards Complete Decarbonization. 
So the Ingemonia vision is developed through three research and development streams. The first one is about uh, the study of uh, the ammonia combustion, considering it a very clean and promising fuel for the shipping sector, and also studying uh, uh, the exhaust after treatment systems of the um, emitted gases. The second stream is about the demonstrating of three clean energy technologies um, already proved for terrestrial application, but that still need improvement uh, for um, issues in terms of uh, technical and um, regulatory challenges. The third part is about the replicability of these technologies uh, from a um, business, uh, regulatory and policy point of view. So in Gimonia, innovation stands in a holistic point of view for, in, for the introduction of uh, energy efficiency measures on board. And in this project, uh, ammonia is considered as a fuel, not uh, to be integrated on board at this stage of the project, but studied at uh, lab scale and in some pilot engines with the aim to use it for the operational practices of the vessels, while for what concerns the uh, three uh, clean energy technologies developed in the Ingemonia, uh, which are the PV panels uh, for electrici electricity production and the other two systems for the waste heat recovery, like the organic ranking cycle and the absorption shielder for, for cooling. Uh, these three clean technologies uh, is here developed to be also installed uh, on board. These three technologies uh, um, in the project are also uh, managed and monitored through um, digital tools uh, developed by Matis and the Sistema for the Engimonia project. The project can be divided into five main objectives. The first one is about the modeling, simulation, and testing of low emission ammonia combustion, with also study of a dedicated exhaust after treatment system. This objective is implemented in three work packages. The second objective is about the development of the clean energy solution. Uh, and this objective is studied in the work package five. This objective is strictly connected to the uh, next one, the number three, about the demonstration of these three clean energy solutions on board uh, for which uh, work package six is dedicated. The next objective, number four, is about the impact uh, evaluation of this uh, technology introduction on board and uh, the potential repl replication, while the objective number five is about the dissemination, communication, and the business plan of the outcomes of this project. But uh, what the industry is saying about the introduction of ammonia as the fuel? Well, first of all, we, uh, as you well know, we can underline how uh, ammonia is an intrinsic carbon neutral fuel since in the molecule is not present carbon. Anyway, the main issue is obviously its production. But it's now well known that uh, now the production of uh, zero, um, zero carbon, so green ammonia, is uh, possible through the use for its synthesis of renewable uh, electricity. Uh, so, uh, Ingemonia is considered a very promising uh, fuel with several advantages, but uh, there are still many challenges from many points of view that mm, must be faced. And these challenges are about both a commercial and a technological point of view. From a commercial point of view, we know that uh, green ammonia production is still available, but not on the real market. And so many investments are still necessary for the large scale production of green ammonia. And this uh, obviously represents uh, an hen and egg problem, uh, since from one side, uh, the ship owners, the operators, uh, the fuel producers uh, um, require um, uh, the ship propulsion. So many engines to be produced uh, to effectively use ammonia as fuel. 
But on the other side, the engine builders, uh, since they have to make many investments and research about this topic, uh, they have to be sure that there is a market for them. So uh, the demonstration of the technology for the market implementation at the, is crucial at this point. From a technological point of view, uh, as, you, as you well know, ammonia can be considered a poor engine fuel, differently from the carbon-based fuel, and the emission characteristics, uh, for now, it's still uh, an unknown territory. And uh, as also said in the previous presentation, there is a clear problem of uh, toxicity, because uh, ammonia is toxic, uh, is um, um, very corrosive, uh, and uh, there is uh, a problem of its uh, handling on board, uh, and so also this problem uh, in the safety, uh, from the safety point of view, must be faced. The engine methodology comprises different uh, phases. Uh, the first one phase is uh, the, the first phase uh, um, can be divided into two parts. The first one is about uh, the vessel and the technical assessment phase, uh, um, which comprise uh, the definition of the technologies uh, with the strictly connection with uh, the onboard integration. And uh, for what concerns the ammonia part of the project, uh, the, there is the modeling of the ammonia combustion process. The next part of the project is about, is considered a pre-demo phase uh, part with the first lab test and uh, in-depth study about uh, the exhaust after treatment system and uh, the technologies uh, uh, manufacturing. Then there is a part of test campaign of both uh, um, uh, ad ammonia part, uh, still in uh, lab phase uh, and in, with pilot engines, and the test campaign comprising the um, onboard integration of the three technologies uh, um, described. Then the last part of the project is about uh, the replication, while the promotion phase uh, is uh, part of the project that stands um, uh, within all uh, the project. Engimonia Consortium can be described as a, a pretty industry-driven consortium that gives to the project a strong commitment to prototype realization um, so there is the presence in the consortium of 22 partners from eight countries uh, um, in Europe. Uh, apart from the industry part of the consortium, there is uh, also the presence of many um, universities and uh, um, research centers, as well as uh, the um, very important actions by uh, authority like the ports of Genoa, uh, which is pretty important for the um, regulatory and the replicability and feasibility studies. So, as uh, I said, uh, there is a very important onboard campaign foreseen for this project. Uh, here we have three different vessels, uh, a ferry, an oil tanker, and a container ship, and the three vessels host the uh, three uh, clean technologies developed and uh, in-depth studied in the project. The ferry, an egg ferry, uh, will have on board an absorption chiller together with 40 square meters of PV panels, uh, walkable PV panels. The oil tanker will have uh, to um, improve their energy production and organic ranking cycle units together with 21 square meters of PV panels, while the container ship that, as we well know, must um, optimize the space, um, will have 10 square meters of uh, PV, PV panels. These technologies uh, will be uh, monitored on board and managed uh, through the uh, digital tool and system developed by METIS and Sistema. 
Uh, in Gimonia, the Gimonia project uh, has a clear road to market. Uh, in fact, uh, at the beginning of the project in 2021, most of the technologies started from a TRL of three, four, five, maximum six. While at the end of the project in 2025, uh, we expect to obtain TRL starting from five to reach eight. But the real aim of uh, Engimonia uh, will begin actually at the end of the project through the implementation of the demo sites uh, and the study of these technologies in uh, high potential sites all over the Europe. So to reach the TRL9 at 2030. So here are some updates about the latest achievements um, going through all the work packages of the project. In the work package two, in which um, ammonia combustion and emission modeling um, are performed, um, Lund, University of Lund and DTU developed a kinetic model for the ammonia combustion with a specific focus on marine engines. Uh, and also, uh, there are some interesting ex experimental results uh, about the characterization of non-reacting ammonia uh, sprays, uh, varying many conditions in two strokes uh, uh, marine engine conditions. In the work package three, there is a sort of uh, an upscale and a real operation of um, uh, of, this, uh, of this topic, uh, since uh, um, there, are, there is the study of the emissions uh, for uh, four-stroke and two-stroke uh, ammonia engines, uh, varying many different operational conditions, uh, like uh, the excess ratio, the compression, the pressure, and these results uh, um, have been carried out uh, by MAN and DTU. Here we want to underline how the results are obtained non studying a new engine dedicated to ammonia, but testing ammonia um, together with um, uh, co-combustion fuel in a pilot engine already present in MAN and DTU facilities. So we are not developing a new engine in this project. Uh, here we um, obtained results about the um, emission patterns of uh, ammonia in terms of uh, um, and, um, nitrogen oxide and OX and uncombusted ammonia. These results are very important for the studies conducted in work package four about the development of the exhaust after treatment system developed mainly by the University of Thessaloniki. Um, the first part of this work package uh, dealt with uh, uh, the model of a catalytic process to abate uh, the gas emitted in ammonia combustion. And uh, um, so, studies the possible model to cal catalytically um, abate these gases. In this part of the project, in this, in this month, um, the University of Thessaloniki is developing the synthesis of many different uh, catalysts for the um, catalytic reduction of uh, um, oxidation produ products. And uh, there are many candidate materials uh, to be tested. And of course, uh, also, um, there is a study on the particle uh, um, emissions uh, that are in progress by DTU. So here, developed the, the, uh, the other part of the project, uh, no more about uh, uh, the um, ammonia study, but the onboard of integration of the clean technologies. Um, so in work package five, there have been the design and material identification and studies at lab scale of the three technologies. So the organic ranking cycle, the absorption chiller, and the PV panels. And all the features of these um, prototypes have been set in order to have uh, prototypes uh, still at uh, lab scale and the other prototypes uh, uh, putting on board. 
Um, so the onboard integration is uh, studied and evaluated considering the outcomes of uh, lab experiments. Uh, in the same work package, uh, we, uh, Systema and Metis, developed a decision support system to check how these three technologies on board can be optimized um, in order to collect data and uh, monitoring and optimizing the um, energy saving. And uh, obviously they are uh, crucial tools to optimize the uh, integration on board and an efficient utilization of these clean uh, technologies. In the work package five, um, a KPI panel were defined to properly monitor the onboard uh, campaign with a specific focus on uh, health and safety aspects and uh, regulatory uh, aspects. Uh, here, the onboard campaign is ongoing in these months. The organic ranking cycle is still uh, on board, while the absorption chiller and the PV panels um, are in the, um, they, they have been shipped in the last, uh, in the last weeks. Uh, so the piping part uh, and the last engineer part uh, are being defining in, this, uh, in these days. Um, in the work package seven, there is the uh, evaluation of the technologies and the impact assessment. So the project foreseen uh, techno-economic evaluation, LCA, LCC analysis, uh, and social and market uh, uh, assessment. For what concerns with the regulatory policy, infrastructure, and safety aspects studied in, uh, in Engimonia, uh, we can divide the ob observations into two parts. The first part is about the ammonia. We know that uh, uh, through the person of uh, Alessandro Maccari, uh, which is, um, um, that works in RENA services, we follow the guidelines defined by IMO about uh, ammonia, that we know that still needs some more definitions and that will have uh, uh, improvement also in the, during the next uh, year um, um, consortium. And while, uh, for what concerns the integration on board of the technologies, we studying the, um, the features of the, of the technologies and their possible issues on the integration on board, we um, define that there is no need for updating any IMO rules. And uh, um, there is uh, the completion, we obtain the completion of the plan approval for the organic ranking cycle and the absorption chiller, while the plan approval for the PV panels integration on board is still on progress. So uh, here there is this survey, uh, which is pretty interesting for, for this audience. So we would like to gain some uh, insights and some opinions about the integration of these uh, technologies, about the, the implementation of these technologies in the shipping sector. And this would help us in the last part of the project and also to continue uh, the Engimonia uh, development technologies also after the project. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Are there any uh, questions? Yes, please. Uh, th thank you very much for a very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, this N2O uh, measurement you show, was that the result from, from testing ammonia on, on the test engine in Copenhagen? Sorry, I missed the first part of the question. Uh, you showed uh, some test result of uh, N2O, or laughter gas. Uh, mm -hmm. Was that from uh, testing ammonia on the test engine in Copenhagen? 
Yeah, it's the, the results obtained at lab scale about the co-combustion of uh, ammonia with uh, diesel um, at lab scale in a two-stroke engine by um, NQA. And uh, yeah, the um, results about the um, pilot engines uh, two stroke, both two strokes and four stroke uh, engines, uh, the, the results uh, are still to be defined at, uh, in the pilot engines. All right. Thank you. Okay, yes, Santiago. Thank you for the presentation. Um, my question is, is simple, but maybe not so easy to answer. What are, in your, in your view, the main obstacles that exist now to have a fully-fledged uh, pure ammonia engine on the market? Are there, in terms of the emissions, are there technical, technological, uh, commercial emissions? What are the main obstacles? The lack of ammonia, lack of business model? Yeah, um, the business model definition uh, for um, ammonia integration is still ongoing in the Ammonia project, but from my perspective, I think that the safety aspects also for, for the outcomes of the studies about the regulatory aspects, I think that the safety aspect is the most concerning at this point. Um, yeah, the, the, the treatment of, of the gas it's, uh, it, it, it's a problem, obviously, but also the, the bunkering and the hang, handling of the gas on board, it's, uh, it's, a, crucial, it's a crucial point to, to define for the implementation of this technology. Okay, thank you. So, still many aspects uh, to clarify and to solve in a certain way. Very good. Uh, does ABS share the same opinion as terms of risks or uh, challenging uh, challenges that still need to be overcome? Yeah, we. we uh I will say that uh, if you compare ammonia with the use of uh, LPG. Uh, which is today being used on, I think, uh, 50 LPG carrier. The difference is the toxicity. Uh, and then the, the, the consumption is, is different because uh, cal the calorific value of ammonia is, is only in the half of LPG. Uh, but besides from that, uh, then there's only the toxicity in difference. And, and this has been dealt with with the uh, ammonia cast system and other system to, to deal with uh, with ammonia, uh, and this is the main concern for for, for the use of ammonia. Uh, I think on the on the supply side, as you also mentioned, uh, supply of ammonia in the future, we see uh, there's uh, quite a lot of uh, plants actually being uh, materialized uh, at the moment. Uh, financing is is uh, is coming for production of ammonia, and it seems that uh, ammonia, green ammonia, is, is going to be available in the future. As, as we see it now, um, so that's that's the positive, and and, and this is pro probably also underlining the drive we see towards uh, the use of ammonia as, as a ship fuel. Okay, uh, thank you very much for this additional information and your views. Very good. Okay, uh, thank you very much again for your presentation. Then we move on to the next one. This is uh, another EU-funded project. Uh, Ivan Finnerijding, senior engineer at DNV, uh, will uh, guide us through the next presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you, and um, thank you for inviting me here. And not least, thank you for many good presentations today and yesterday. So, um, my name is Ivan Riley. I work in DNV Maritime class in the alternative, to alternative fuels and piping uh, section. But today I'm uh, talking on behalf of the Ammonia 2.4 uh, project, which is an engine development project uh, funded by the um, European Union. So, I think we all uh, know the, the background um, for developing ammonia fuel, fuel engines. Um, 
fuel efficiency measures has done so much, but, um, but uh, CO2 emissions are ever increasing due to increase of cargo transported, uh, the development of uh, internal combustion engines for uh, utilization with ammonia uh, can be a very important enabler in reaching the 2050 goals. Um, this consortium in this project believes that 30, uh, as much as 30 to 80 percent of the total energy use in uh, shipping uh, could be ammonia. Um, but in order for that to make real life impacts by the 2050s, this um, has to happen soon and to enter into the market in the next uh, seven to ten years. And that's precisely what the uh, Ammonia 2.4 project is um, aiming at. So the goal of the uh, Ammonia 2.4 project is to demonstrate at full scale two types of engines uh, for dual fuel marine engines running on ammonia as main fuel. Um, one part is the development and demonstration of a four-stroke engine in lab conditions, closely mimicking real-life operations in uh, ambient conditions, and also uh, demonstration development of a two-stroke retrofit fuel injection platform. And this will be, in addition to demonstration in uh, lab condition, be demonstrated on an uh, uh, existing vessel and retrofitted. And the goal here is, of course, to significantly uh, contribute to the possibility of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, all the while fulfilling IMO tier 3 regulations and doing, doing it all in a safe manner. The project uh, consists of uh, Vatsila as the engine uh, developers, MSC for the, uh, the ship owner operator side. Um, STEMS is a research facility in uh, Italy uh, working on uh, combustion characteristics. DNV are involved on the safety and, uh, and uh, regulatory side, and CJOB are uh, naval architects based in, uh, in, in the, the Netherlands. So, um, this project is divided into a number of work uh, packages. In this presentation, I will focus primarily on the regulatory aspects and the existing gaps that we have. I'll talk a little bit about fuel availability and uh, not on the engine development scope of this project, even though I'm sure you would have been very interested in hearing about that as well. Um, so I will, I will try to provide an overview of our current regulatory status for ammonia fuel, uh, an overview of the most important initiatives that uh, have taken place or are undergoing to, to further the development of regulations for ammonia fuel, and try to have a discussion on topics where the largest, largest uh, discrepancies between requirements exist today. Um, I will reference a number of uh, reports without going in too deep detail. My, uh, my intention will not, to, will not be to go deeply into these documents, but to provide an overview so that whoever in this, uh, this um, crowd here uh, can find, find a good uh, overview of our projects that are taking place today. On the... Um, Foresight uh, part of the equation um, for fuel availability. We have published a report in June 2023. It uh, takes a look into the, the global uh, published ammonia uh, projects um, that has been published until 2022. Um, and we see that the planned um, ammonia projects today are Similar in scale to the, pro uh, the green and monochrome projects, I mean, are similar in scale to the, the gray and brown production that we have today. So it's quite a significant uh, amount of green ammonia that is planned. Um, and the, if you look at the, the um, prospects for how many ships we will have in 2030, it is likely that in 2030 uh, we will have sufficient green ammonia for these ships. This picture may, of course, change quite a lot in the years beyond 2030 if the, the uh, ambitious uh, uptakes uh, of ammonia as a fuel do, do happen. There will have to be a significant increase in, uh, in, in fuel as well, which is an immense amount of energy needed. In the following, I will uh, talk about the framework, framework that we have 
for uh, risks, health and safety aspects. Uh, this is obviously very important for the Ammonia 2.4 project that we, um, we have. If we do develop uh, an engine, we need to be able to, uh, to place it on board. So, um, in general, uh, it can be stated that the, uh, the IGF code applies to most uh, ship types using ammonia as fuel. It should be pointed out that there is no formal link in the SOLAS to the IGF code for uh, toxic ga gaseous fuels, only to fuels with a low flash point. Ammonia has a flash point higher than the, the definition of low flash point uh, fuels, but it seems clear that most major flags uh, that we have been in, in discussion with, that IMO has the intention to consider ammonia under the IGF code. But uh, there, it's important that initiatives happen to create a formal link between SOLAS and the IGF code to this regard, to, um, yeah, to make sure that, that SOLAS is actually being followed while using the IGF code. Um, but in the... In the ongoing discussion, I will assume that the IGF code is the, is the proper tool to use. Um, and if you look at the IGF, IGF code, there is no uh, prescriptive uh, rules for, for ammonia. It uh, references the alternative design approach. This is a complex uh, process, as we all know. We got a good presentation from, um, from uh, um, <laughs> Uh, uh, hydrogen project yesterday. Uh, also, a good talk uh, from from IMO about about this. Um, it is possible to utilize utilize a simplified process to the alternative design process uh, if the flag accepts uh, IMO interim guidelines or class rules to to provide an equivalent safety level to the functional requirements of the IGF code. But this is would be on a case-by-case -case basis, and it is important to remember that class rules and the future interim guidelines will be uh, simply guidelines uh, for the time being. They are not mature, they have not been tested yet, and it is, it is to be expected that some risk assessment will be necessary. At the minimum per the 1455 process, process it mean, this means a hazard, but it is very likely that also further risk assessment tools will need to be uh, to be used. Um, I should also note, note that for gas carriers, it is the IGC code that applies. Uh, the IGC code in its current form does not uh, allow the use of toxic fuels. It's, it's possible to, to uh, circumvent this, but this uh, makes the picture more complicated. Um, uh, but there is, together with work on the IGF code, work being done in the IMO towards uh, the IGC code as well, and this sentence about toxic fuels. The, um, on to the developments for uh, safety requirements for uh, ammonia in the IMO. Uh, it first started in uh, 2022 when the correspondence group collected information on the safe use of ammonia as fuel and submitted their report to the CCT. Eight. This took place in September 2022. Uh, the CCC 8 agreed on issues to be considered for the regulatory, regulatory development of guidelines for the safety of ammonia as fuel. Uh, and it was agreed that the structure should be that of the uh, IGF code. Work on the interim guidelines uh, continued in the con correspondence group until CCC 9. Uh, that took place in September uh, this year. And there it was stated the target finalization at CCC 10 in September 2024 to be accepted in MSC um, in December 2024. So that's the timeline uh, we have now where we hopefully can, uh, can uh, see, see um, interim guidelines uh, coming along. There has happened quite a lot of um, interesting work uh, towards CCC9 this year. Numerous IMO docs have been submitted from many parties uh, on the development of rules for, uh, for, um, for ammonia as fuel. I will hi highlight two of them. Um, there has been submitted draft interim guidelines from uh, two, two uh, countries, and that is draft rule proposals based on IGF code requirements uh, that are submitted to, uh, to help accelerate development of regulations on the use of ammonia as a ship fuel. 
One is coming from uh, the, Nor the so-called Nordic Roadmap uh, project, uh, which has been commissioned by uh, the Nordic Council of uh, Ministers. This uh, project um, ended up in one submittal of draft, in draft interim guidelines for ammonia as fuel. Um, this project took uh, LNG as a benchmark fuel and, uh, and uh, did an evaluation of the physical properties of ammonia versus uh, LNG. This formed a tool to assess whether uh, existing safety barriers in the IGF code are, would be suitable towards ammonia and, and if not, the physical properties together with the associated risks would then be used to uh, suggest additional safety barriers that could be included in a modified IGF code requirement scheme. I have a link to that report uh, in this slide and um, it is a good read to understand um, the dangers of ammonia and what you could do to mitigate that. In addition to this submission uh, submitted by the Nordic uh, flag states, Japan also submitted a working document for the draft interim guidelines to the IMO. And both are based uh, in the IGF code structure, but there are some, uh, some differences in the requirements that you, uh, you see. Now I will move over to class rules. So, since uh, 2021, uh, most major classification societies have published rules or guidelines uh, towards the topic of ammonia as fuel. Um, there are, including but not limited to DNV, ABS, Lloyds, Bureau of Veritas, Class NK, Korean registers, I should also say Rina, uh, who also have rules for ammonia. So these rules and guidelines vary in maturity and content in, uh, in, in terms of technical requirements. Some utilize prescriptive uh, requirements to a large extent, others refer more to functional requirements of the IGF code with some tailoring to account for the toxic properties of ammonia. Some rules and uh, guidelines to a large degree uh, state that topics have to be covered in a risk assessment, while others are trying to provide more pres prescriptive requirements uh, towards managing the risk of ammonia fueled vessels. Um, but as I said, it is clear, even though we have class rules, that some degree of risk uh, assessment will be necessary for flag approval of ammonia projects. And in particular, I think uh, gas dispersion analysis will be uh, very important to understand the consequences of large um, ammonia releases in relation to leaks or tank overpressure scenarios and so on. In the project, we have done uh, a gap analysis between uh, most major cl class rules and their requirements, and also compared them with the requirements uh, that uh, Japan has submitted and uh, Norway with the other Nordic countries have submitted. And I think this is a very interesting and important, important topic because there are quite a few areas where the various class requirements differ. Uh, for example, as, as noted by ABS in, uh, a bit earlier today, about uh, exhaust releases. But I will, I will take you through the most, uh, what I found to be the most important topics where there are discrepancies. One is uh, operational releases uh, in normal operations. You see some classification societies requiring a maximum emission concentration. Um, which then results in a requirement of having a treatment system on board. Uh, in DNV, we call it an arm system. VV uses the expression of a vapor processing system. There are different ways of talking about this. Um, is this necessary, or can the safety be demonstrated based on the gas dispersion analysis alone? And I'm talking about normal operation releases, such as uh, releases from double block and bleed valve systems and fuel changeover procedures. Uh, it could be opening of, of pressure relief valves on the, on the fuel system and so on. This is an important question because uh, obviously if you need a treatment system to, to uh, mitigate the, the releases to atmosphere, this is uh, associated with a, a cost. On the other hand, is it, is it really acceptable to, to, uh, to emit uh, toxic gas to the atmosphere? Um, yes. 
Another topic is uh, hazardous zones. We are well, know, uh, well uh, known with them um, in relation to LNG and, and other flammable gases. Some, um, uh, some class rules uh, prescribe that, that there should be hazardous zones in open air, also for ammonia, while others do not, based on the, based on the fact that uh, ammonia is hardly flammable, something that we know from, from uh, at least in open air something that we know from its properties. More important is the, is the toxic zones that are the, there to manage uh, the toxic risk. Toxic zones is normally considered as, as distance requirements from vent masts, from ventilation outlets, from bunkering stations and so on, to openings to enclosed spaces on the vessel, uh, gas safe ventilation systems, to uh, life-saving appliances and, um, and so on. Um, Again, is prescriptive requirements appropriate to, to define these toxic zones or should it be, should it be based on uh, gas dispersion analysis? Maybe both. We see a lot of class societies base the toxic zone sizes on IGC code requirements while also in addition requiring gas dispersion analysis to, to prove the validity of, of the zones. Another topic is the fuel storage tank holding time for uh, LNG, the, the time that the vessel is required to be able to maintain the fuel storage uh, condition is 15 uh, days. Um, some classes maintain this requirement, some uh, classes have increased it to perhaps 21 days, and other classes uh, and also some flags are requiring the holding time to be indefinitely long. This has a large uh, effect on the type of boil of gas uh, or the arrangement of, uh, of the boil of gas management method you use. If you are allowed to rely on pressure accumulation, that, that makes the boil of management uh, question much simpler. If, if you are required to ma maintain it for all time, that would mean that you, you would have to have redundancy in the boil of gas management uh, system uh, without rely relying on pressure accumulation. This adds costs and uh, complexity, and it also, of course, begs the question, can bull of gas management be combined with the requirement for vapor processing systems or arm systems that I discussed earlier? Um, another topic where we see quite a lot of different requirements is the utilization of water safety systems. Water-based systems used to, to uh, improve the safety of um, of uh, ammonia fuel chips. Ammonia is highly soluble in uh, water. This can be used for benefits because you can bind the to uh, any released toxic gas to, to this. And Class Rules and IMO has a wide range of different ways of doing it, uh, doing this. We have proposals for eye washes and uh, decon decontamination showers. We have um, water spraying systems as access to rooms in which ammonia may leak. We have uh, water mist systems inside compartments where ammonia may leak. We have water spraying systems outside ventilation systems and outside vent masts. We have uh, water spraying systems at accommodation accesses or, or at ventilation systems to uh, accommodation. These are all uh, good ideas, but uh, we should find one common, common route. Bilge systems is important. Uh, as pointed out earlier, ammonia is uh, toxic to uh, marine uh, life. I think most agree that norm in normal operations, effluents from water-based treatment systems should not be discharged overboard, but there is more a question about emergency scenarios. Some classification societies uh, uh, imply that, that it's, it's okay to discharge this water overboard in an emergency scenario while others do not open up that possibility and require you to have a dedicated drain uh, where you're leading this, uh, this water uh, for then sending on board to, to shore or if accepted by, if accepted by a flag uh, and port states to dilute it and send it overboard. Safe havens is another concept which is uh, known from the land-based uh, industry. It's basically a place of safe uh, refuge that you can use during emergency scenarios. Uh, we see different things about, uh, about this. Some clusters require reasonably gas-tight accommodation ventilated at overpressure. 
uh, other classes or flags require, go further in requiring an actual dedicated area where you have uh, air supply or air supply from a safe location, perhaps water systems included, where you can have a safe refuge. Lifeboats is another area where you see differing requirements on the chemical tankers for toxic cargo and gas tankers for ammonia. It's required to have totally enclosed lifeboats with a self-sufficient air supply. Some classes include this requirement, others do not. Again, uh, such questions can have a large effect on, on cost and arrangement of a vessel. Yes. Um, some other minor topics, fire safety and life-saving. Um, for fire safety, the FSF's code does not really have uh, approved means of uh, fire detection and extinguishing for ammonia. So what type to, of fire detection and, and extinguishing to apply should be demonstrated by probably by alternative design approach. There's varying requirements in how much double wall piping you are required to use compared to, uh, to LNG. Um, yeah. To sum it up, there are quite there is um, a lot of alignment on ammonia rules, but there are um, also quite a lot of topics that that needs to where we need to find a, a common approach and a common agreement on what is an appropriate safety level. So, my last slide will be on other major international initiatives that. Uh, are being done or have been done to to benefit the safety of ammonia as fuel. The, fir the first one, I probably don't need to say too much about in this room. It is a very good study by by EMSA, uh, potential of ammonia as fuel in uh, shipping that was published uh, last year. Like this report that I'm making, it considers the regulatory status uh, and framework and state of play. It does a thorough, in, thorough investigation on properties, production, suitability, and sustainability of ammonia fuel. And it does a detailed risk-based risk uh, case study for uh, VLCCs, a bulk carrier, and Aeropax uh, vessel to recommend further regulatory developments. And uh, thankfully, a lot of the recommendations they, they bring forward are coinciding with what classes and flags are already saying. But again, it is, it is still uh, the need for more clarity on what appropriate requirements to, to uh, put in. Um, the GCMD and DNV pioneering ammonia bunkering safety in Singapore is perhaps uh, uh, not as known in this, uh, in this room. It builds on uh, work, um, piloting studies being done in Rotterdam and, and Oslo for uh, safe ammonia bunkering, um, and it, it's intended to identify and make a recommendation to address regulatory gaps. Uh, and by, um, they do this by choosing uh, a selection of bunkering modes uh, to demonstrate in a pilot uh, for the transfer of ammonia as marine fuels. Uh, these operating mod um, modes include transfers from ships supplying liquid ammonia to ammonia bunkering vessels at the jet base locations and at anch anchorages transfers from smaller ammonia bunkering vessels to ships that are powered by ammonia, and transfers from shore-based ammonia storage facilities to ships powered by ammonia. Um, a selection of sites in Singapore has been made, and has had uh, workshops and course curates carried out in Singapore, resulting in safety requirements and, and uh, recommendations. Um, Still, again, quite, very much is overlapping with the class rules uh, that we are seeing. But in addition, they are, uh, have, have additional recommendations for less ship-specific measures, such as uh, development of a traffic separation scheme and safety zones. Sizes of these uh, safety zones uh, are in the region of 150 to 320 uh, meters. But uh, the study clearly states that uh, these, are, uh, these are safety zones intended for a pilot study, and uh, it does not necessarily reflect the hazards of a full-scale commercial operation. 
And uh, finally, this uh, GCMD study has resulted in a guidebook for ammonia bunkering applicable for vessels that are conducting ammonia transfers and bunkering pilots. So um, this report outlines the properties of ammonia again, gives requirements for custody transfer, the, measure, the measuring of ammonia quantity and quality, and contains recommendations for pilot bunkering procedures and safety and competency requirements for personnel operating in the marine fuel and on the fuel e ecosystem. Finally, I will mention the green shipping program. This is a collaboration between uh, authorities and business companies predominantly in the Nordic region to support the increase of environmentally friendly solutions for ships. There has been quite a number of ammonia pilot studies performed in, um, in uh, this, this uh, project. It has completed the studies on uh, a bulker, uh, which was actually a, a retrofit study, uh, and also new build tankers, fishing wells, vessels, and uh, Rupax. There's also on, uh, other studies ongoing with, uh, with a with wind farm installation vessel. Um, this program is not only about ammonia as fuel, but has had many pilots on it. It has resulted in a safety handbook that was first published in 2021. It was uh, um, revised uh, this year with uh, additional findings. Uh, and this is quite a good and easy read for uh, getting a, uh, quite a basic graft, uh, basic grasp on uh, the challenges and potential uh, mitigating measures you, you have with, uh, with ammonia. So that is uh, what I have included in my presentation. I am uh, sure after her hearing about other initiatives today that uh, in the, my revision of this report in one year, I will have several others in interesting studies to include as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And indeed, it is more uh, a, a well, good overview of the existing uh, materials so far and also the state of regulatory development. Um, any questions or remarks regarding the state of play that was just presented? Uh, yes, Belgium, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the, uh, for the very interesting presentation. Um, the, uh, uh, on the work that is currently ongoing in the, in the IMO, so they are working very hard on the guidelines for ammonia, which will um, at least uh, at first only be applicable to ships currently sailing under the, um, under the IGF code. And then we come to this issue of the uh, prohibition in the IGC code. Uh, now, of course, and, and this is the analysis that we have done in Belgium, um, is that the, uh, specifically ammonia carriers are very much, um, in our view, the, the first movers or the, 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 the best candidates as first movers uh, in this space. And, and we still have this, um, let's say, discrepancy within the IMO regulations. So I, I, I'm wondering what your view is on that and, and uh, how this is best resolved. So um, it, it uh, seems quite unfair that uh, gas carriers have this, uh, this text in the IGC code uh, since um, gas carriers have a highly trained crew uh, to transport ammonia. And, uh, and I think it is quite certain that the intention when writing this requirement uh, in the IGC code was, was not to hinder progress, but I think at the time nobody thought of ammonia as a potential fuel in, um, in shipping. I know that there, ha I was not at the IMO this year, but I know that there, uh, there were good discussions taking place. Um, they have drafted uh, texts that could, could circumvent this, but it has been chosen not to do these modifications to the IGC code uh, as long as the interim guidelines are not present for, for ammonia as fuel uh, in general. So I think the initi initiatives are taking place, but uh, we still need some time. Yes, uh, thank you, and maybe just a quick follow-up question. Um, uh, because the interim guidelines, uh, as you said, so in, in the current amendment, 
um, the, the amendment is, is, is implicitly linked to the development of the interim guidelines, and then the interim guidelines themselves uh, for IGC codes are currently not in the work plan. Um, how, how, how I think um, if we look back at the way this was done for um, LPG as a fuel, um, the, the interim guidelines for IGF or the IGF codes were developed first, and then uh, based on that work, uh, within uh, a relatively short time, we immediately continued with uh, with work for the IGC code. Do you think this is a similar path that we can take for the uh, for ammonia as well? Yeah, I think that the working plan, and, and I'm always quite clear that that based on the draft interim guidelines that we have, uh, and or the working documents that we have from from. Uh, Nordic countries and Japanese countries, these, these should be used as a basis for the further discussion towards CCC 10 and, I mean, and inter, uh, intermittent, uh, intermittent uh, working group will take place before CCC 10, as of, at least if this is approved in MSC uh, this year. And, um, and um, the goal is currently to have then interim guidelines approved by 2024. 20, uh, and the intention with these uh, with issuing guidelines uh, rather than code requirements uh, in the beginning is to have a document which is is easy to to mod modify based on on, uh, on experience that is being made while when it is being used. So I believe that is the same way that has has been done for LPG. Okay, anything else? Very good. I think um, this is it for this topic. So thank you very much for your uh, presentation and for your contribution. Um, again, from my side, I would like to thank all the speakers of this afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, I think we are a bit at the end of two very intensive days, uh, so uh, I think uh, a lot has uh, passed here, uh, different topics, different interesting issues, of course one of the crucial topics for the greening of shipping, which is very high on the agenda and will remain on the agenda for the years to come, so I think it's very good that we also devote this time to discuss the different angles that there are to, uh, let's say, uh, development of alternative fuels and electrification. Uh, so this is certainly not the end of it, and we will certainly uh, continue to, to have these type of meetings to discuss the latest state of play. Because as we, you could have seen, there are still many uh, issues to, to be resolved and many guidance still to be developed. Uh, so in that sense, it's an ongoing process also in the, in the years to come. Uh, for the wrap-up, I will give the floor to my colleague Santiago Encabo, who is the head of unit for safety and security here at EMSA, uh, to wrap up the uh, afternoon session. Santiago. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lendart. Um, well, so indeed, first of all, I would like to, as, as Lendart said, to thank all of those who have endured uh, to be here until, until the end of the, of the workshop. So all these 45 people we have still lying, and the around 20 that are here in an attitude that I would say is closely to heroism, no? because we have received really a lot of information, a lot of input. Uh, and sometimes it's not easy to digest it all. So we have started in our, in our agenda with very interesting issues about the sustainability. Um, well, it's, it's not a uh, secret for anybody that now, obviously, the sustainability is in the top of the political agenda and, and safety is more or less uh, sometimes considered as, as, a, as a given, as something that should be there um, uh, as a commodity. No? But actually we have seen this afternoon that there are still many concerns that should be addressed. And, and, and I would say that maybe the, the risk or the, well, the risk, the temptation that we can have is maybe uh, with all this pressure that we have is maybe to put the, the safety stamp too quickly in some technologies, in some of the alternative fuels because we are, we are not talking, of course, about putting orange juice on, on board ships. Of fuel. We are talking about very toxic substances, sometimes highly explosive substances. So when the, the, if, if there is no safety, if accidents start to happen, uh, of course, we are putting lives at risk. 
I don't want to sound too dramatic, but at the end of the day, that's, uh, that's what happens. And so at the end, it's, it's very important that we do things well, that we should not rush to put very quickly things, uh, safety stamp on things that we are not sure about. I don't say we have to stay sleeping and see what happens, not we have to be active, but we have to go at the right pace no, to ensure to know what we are doing with, with the elements that we have on no, the table. So I would say that from, from a perspective, our aim is always with the guidances that we have published until now. Today we have presented the batteries. Uh, last year we presented that of, of the carriage of the alternative fuel vehicles and, and the source of electricity. What we want is not just to put a tick on our work program and to say, hey, we did it, uh, put it in the shelf on the website and work done. No, I think what we want, of course, is that these documents are useful. This is a first version. Um, we try to put all the stakeholders into work when we develop this guidance to ensure that it's not only the authorities or not only the industry views, but to have a holistic approach to all the possible issues from the safety perspective. But uh, obviously, once we finish our work, as EMSA, we, we don't build ships. We don't operate ships, we don't certify ships. So we don't really know what is happening with this guidance, if it's being used or not, if they are useful, if they have mistakes. So please uh, report to us, give us feedback. I see some, some uh, ICS that has many, many ship owners organizations, but maybe some other institutions, the flags, the authorities. Please give us feedback. Uh, look, this is wrong, we, we, we think that this is not the right approach. Obviously, you can give us positive feedback as well, but, but I would prefer really to have this, um, this potential things that we can improve in our guidance to, be, to improve step by step, because we are not there in the, in, the, in the operational part of it. We are then at the end in the actual investigation again, but I wouldn't like to receive too many reports of accidents with alternative fuels. So, it's always better to keep the, the things in the prevention side. Um, so um, next year we'll have more, so I, I suppose we'll be able to present a bit on the safety side, the, a bit more on the, our ammonia study that has been presented today, and, and also more on the biofuels uh, bunkering guidance. Also from our colleagues from Department 1, so thanks, thanks to them as well for their cooperation. They will present next year as well another two studies as they indicated. So the, old, the last thing to say is have a safe trip home and I hope to see you next year. Uh, thank you very much for being today here. Thank you.